Hello everyone and welcome to this session on Azure DevOps full course. DevOps has paved the way for faster and more agile software development processes by unifying teams, processes and technologies to create an ever evolving software development life cycle. Azure DevOps is a service offered by Microsoft based on the Azure cloud computing platform that provides a complete set of tools to manage software development projects. In this session you will learn all about Azure DevOps. So let's check the agenda for the session. First, we'll be talking about the different DevOps tools. Then we'll be talking about access level subscriptions and licenses. After that, we'll be doing a hands-on on Azure DevOps account creation. Then we'll be talking about what is Azure Boards. After that, we'll be talking about process and process template. Then we'll be discussing about different types of deployment models. After that, we'll be talking about process template differences. Then we'll be discussing about what is Kanban. And then we'll be talking about GitHub connections. Post that we'll be talking about Git in Azure. And after that we'll be covering Azure Active Directory. Post that we'll be talking about Windows Active Directory versus Azure Active Directory. And at last we'll be covering Azure DevOps interview questions which will help you to ace your interviews. So that's all with the agenda. Now let's start the session. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon to get latest updates from IntelliBad. Okay, so now what Azure DevOps is basically. We have learned DevOps. DevOps is a culture which organization used to adopt in order to release the software faster so that you'll have a good timeline with your management and everything. Everything will be in place. That's why we are using Azure DevOps. Okay. So now let us understand by the definition. Azure DevOps provides developer services for support teams to plan, work, collaborate on code development and build, deploy the applications. So that's what I said. It is like with if you use Azure DevOps, you can, you, your all team can collaborate. Every team can collaborate in Azure DevOps. There is a space for each and every technology in Azure DevOps. You have a QA, you can use Azure test plans you have a developer they're going to use azure repos to check in their code if you have a devops guy he's be he'll be managing the azure devops and developing the pipelines okay you and uh, like uh, fine so these are the things so basically azure devops help you to release the software in a much faster pace you can create even uh, the work items the tasks the bugs okay that is it meant to plan work. You can plan the work. If you're working in agile organization, what agile is, you plan, there, there will be a PSI planning will be held in your, uh, every, after, every, after every PSI, like after every demos you give, okay? After like a couple of sprints, maybe four, five sprints, the PSI will start. In the PSI, we will be discussing what work we're gonna do. So everything you can keep a track when Azure DevOps. Okay, that's how useful it is. Earlier Azure DevOps was known as VSTS, that is Visual Studio Team Services back in 2018. In 2018, it rebranded to Azure DevOps. DevOps is obviously hosted in Azure and named as Azure DevOps on the cloud. So, okay. Developer can work in the cloud using Azure DevOps services or on premises using Azure DevOps server. There's a very small difference. If we call it as Azure DevOps services, it means cloud. If you call it as Azure DevOps server, it is on premises. So there is a two softwares. If you want to host Azure DevOps on the cloud, you will go for Azure DevOps services. But if you would like to host it on your on premises, your data center, you should have the code because banks, governments will not going to share their code to any third party, whether it should be Microsoft or Amazon AWS. So they're gonna keep the code themselves and use Azure DevOps server. That's why the difference between Azure DevOps services and Azure DevOps server, okay? Like this is how Azure DevOps page looks like. I have already showed you a bigger thing in Azure DevOps. So, so uh, we're gonna create the Azure DevOps account sooner. Okay. Let us talk about the benefits of Azure DevOps now. With Azure DevOps, you can easily automate things. Like 
you want to do things like just now I said CI CD. I showed you any small example of CI CD, right? So that's kind of easy automation you can do. You have some PowerShell script. Okay, put it in a pipeline and run it. It will do automatically. Everything will be automatically. Orchestration. See what orchestration means that to just collaborate with each other. That's what orchestration means that basically if you know about Kubernetes, Kubernetes is an orchestration tool of Docker images like when the Docker sorry Docker containers is up and running. It's the duty of Kubernetes to orchestrate between these containers. Likewise, Azure DevOps will be uh, managing and helping us to orchestrate between each and every team to collaborate to interlink so as to deliver the software faster effective monitoring you will get a timely alert if a pipeline got failed if pipeline got succeeded if any outages occur in your application everything you can set it up the monitoring part so azure devops can easily integrate with the azure monitoring if you are using the azure your, your infrastructure is an azure but if you are using on on premises we can use Splunk and Nagus also for monitoring and that can easily integrate with the DevOps H DevOps the rapid deployment. Yes, it's it's a very uh, very fast deployment with the CI CD tools. If you enable CI CD both the triggers the deployment will be in a much faster pace, right? So that's the very little benefits of DevOps H DevOps. Okay, and why we use it so uh, like let us talk about the differences between Azure DevOps services and Azure DevOps server. The Azure DevOps services is a cloud offering with from Microsoft and it provides uh, it, like it's it's a sh it's a public cloud basically. It, it's not a sh it's not a shared or private one. Azure DevOps is a Azure DevOps services is a public cloud. Like if you are using Azure, Azure is also a public cloud. So. It's not uh, your private thing. It's it's a globally available thing. The other thing is the Azure DevOps server is your on premises offering. You will install it on your org. Let me show you one very small thing. OK, I have uh, installed that on my environment. So I just wanted to show you some picture of it. So if you see the screen. So if you see the screen, see this is my Azure DevOps server on the top. You see this is something which I have installed on my machine and this is how your when you install this software. This is how your Azure DevOps server will look like. OK, on your organization, it will has its own URL. OK, this is the server name 2019 update 1.1 1 .1. like Windows Windows server versions you have right operating system versions like that. It will be installing on your machine. And you are the sole admin of this. You can do anything. So that's the difference between server and services. Okay, so it is backed Azure DevOps services backed by 99.9 .9 SLA. Okay, so basically SLA means that if if the Azure DevOps services, if there's an outage in Azure DevOps services, then Microsoft Azure will be responsible for it. Okay, they will provide you a 99% of service level agreement that it will be up by 99.9% .9 whole year. Okay, and if 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 SLA is not met, like if it is less than this, the uh, outage is more than 0.10%, then you can claim for refunds and all. So that's how uh, prominent it is. Okay, see with Azure DevOps server, you are responsible for applying the patches on Windows on applying the patches on Azure DevOps server. You have you are responsible for security data protection everything because you are you are having the data on your environment on your computer, but not the case of Azure DevOps services. Everything is in the cloud, but with server you are responsible for each and everything. Okay. So uh, the third point is you can either authenticate with Microsoft account credential or with Azure AD. You can easily connect with active Azure Active Directory and authenticate with Azure DevOps and use it. Okay, even if you don't have a subscription of Azure, okay, we have one question come up that if you have an Azure subscription, then you can you you need an Azure subscription to use Azure DevOps, yes or no. You don't need an Azure subscription to use Azure DevOps. Okay, but 
if you have an Azure AD, okay, AAD, then you can easily integrate to the Azure DevOps, okay. We're gonna discuss that too. Let me just show you, okay, uh, because we are here. So if any, uh, like, uh, if if things are coming up, so I'm gonna give you more visualization that will help you to understand more. So now you, this my Azure DevOps, you clicked on organization settings. Under the organization settings, you have Azure Active Directory. It means that I am connected to my directory. This is my tenant name. This is my uh, Active Directory name. So I am connected already. I can disconnect to this directory, this AAD. This is default directory. So what I'm trying to say here, if you have an AAD, you can authenticate with Azure DevOps. But with Azure DevOps server, you cannot do that. Like you cannot do that because you your Active Directory is not linked with Azure. It's Windows or Active Directory. It's not Azure Active Directory. So if you have an Azure Active Directory, you cannot link that with the uh, Active Directory uh, with your though there is a lot of things you can do, but directly it's not possible. So, so you need to have your Active Directory in order to link with Azure DevOps Server. Okay, so now I'm talking about some more about the services which we have. We now have a glimpse of what Azure DevOps services, what Azure DevOps Server is. Now, uh, let us understand more on Azure DevOps, Azure boards, pipelines, artifacts, repos, test plans. So I will just give you a brief that continuous integration means that you we are continuously building the code without any intervention. Continuous delivery means that we are deploying the code continuously to the environment without any um, intervention. Everything is automated. And continuous deployment means that we are deploying the application to the dev or a test environment. Okay, so as a DevOps engineer, we should know these tools. Okay, uh, like to have if you would like to work as a full fledged DevOps engineer, and these these things. So all these things which you are seeing in, the, in my screen can be implemented or used using Azure DevOps because Azure DevOps helps us to release the software in a much faster pace. So we can integrate with any of the DevOps tool which is available in the uh, in the environment in the industry. First, we're going to talk about version control. Version control means that to have a track of every version of my code. So for that, we have a git version control TFS version TFVC that is team foundation version control. So Azure DevOps supports two version control git and TFVC. So TFVC version control is based on from the TFS that is team foundation server. Now you can ask that what is TFS? We're going to discuss that too. But for now, team foundation server, you can say it's a previous name of on premises version of Azure DevOps. The difference between Azure DevOps, VSTS, um, TFS, and Azure DevOps server. Okay. I will also discuss today. We'll give you in, in quickly. I will also discuss that. But for now, Git like Azure DevOps supports two version control: Git and TFVC. TFVC that is Team Foundation version control. Now, what is version control? So as to have a complete track of your code. I gave an example. Uh, you are using Android or iOS apps, and those apps having the versions, right? Let's suppose someone, some of the app provider released some buggy product, some buggy version. So what they do, they want to remove back to the previous version, right? So that's what version control means in the uh, coding also, like in the in the environment also. Everything is tracked, traced. Git is a distributed version control. TFS is a centralized version control. Now let me just give you example what what we mean by distributed and what we mean by centralized. See TFS that is team foundation server is a product by Microsoft and uh, it can be only used on the on premises like I can install on my server. It supports TFVC team foundation version control which means that it is a centralized. It means that everything which you are doing check ins check everything is stored in a centralized server. That is a SQL structured query language in that SQL in that SQL all the data will be storing up. 
so it's a centralized thing that is let's say i have a hundred uh, developer company everyone is doing the check-in that check-in will be store check-in means that i'm uh, updating my source code that is i'm uh, updating my code so that code will be uh, checked in in like updated in the central repository that is the sql but if we talk about git git is a distributed version control it means that every developer or every uh, like the engineer who is working that is a hundred engineer in my company they're working so everyone have their own repository in their laptop in their machines it means that it has a distributed version uh, distributed system everyone has its own version control in their environment and when they push it they will go to the github right so that's what we mean by uh, distributed and the centralized you can have more um, more uh, you can grab more knowledge on the complete differences between git and tfs tf tfvc tfvc is an uh, is not an open source it's a paid one git is an open source so likewise there are uh, multiple differences between these two version control next was svn subversion control now the like only the legacy only the companies which are using previously svn they only use that no one use svn these days only git people uses and tfvc okay the other thing the devops engineer should know is a cloud azure aws uh, global cloud that i'm not going to discuss because you already know that what is cloud computing and all and we should know the scripting shell powershell python so in the pipelines we can add a shell task a powershell task python task node.js task anything okay we can add that then we're gonna have the cic rule today we like we, we in this in this demo of like 18 20 hours we are only gonna discuss about azure devops so these are the various devops tools that are presented in the market jenkins azure devops and gitlab all perform the same things okay so all perform the same things and the other other thing is we have containerization docker and kubernetes so containerization means that uh, we are um, okay co containerization concept we're going to discuss when i'm teaching you azure pipelines so this slide is only just to show you that these things we should know and all these things are presented in the azure devops you can integrate easily okay then configuration for the configuration tool that is software configuration management tool we use ansible and chef uh, what what we mean by ansible and chef i'll give you an example so let's say you want to uh, you want to spin up 100 machines okay 100 machines so how to do that either you can do manually or you can use this configuration management tools with the help of ansible within a single uh, like the command the playbook okay the you can say a script in the ansible I can create 100 machines within a single go. Okay, so that's how a configuration management tool meant. For testing, we, we can use Selenium and JUnit testing. Monitoring, for monitoring your application, uh, we can use NagUS and Splunk, so as to monitor that, how many disk space in, left in that, like if, if your application is reaching the like bandwidth, okay, like it is like very slow performance issue. Uh, like it's not loading sometime you open the flip card and anything amazon so that loads very slow so that monitoring thing will be captured in the nagus and splunk tool the other important tool we should know is the ms build maven and ant we need compilers so as to compile the code for dotnet we have a java uh, for, for dotnet we have uh, like dot cs proj files and for java we have dot java files so compiler will made the binaries they will make a uh, dot cs proj to dls and they will uh, and the other for the maven the, it will make java files to the uh, jar or war files that files we can push or deploy using the azure devops to any of the environment now you can write a powershell script in the azure devops task or even you can write some custom tasks that we're going to discuss so this is how we can use it okay for monitoring we will use we will be using azure um, monitoring tool uh, azure monitoring which is included in the az400 uh, syllabus for configuration see there are a couple of things for configuration we can use a lot of things 
PowerShell also like, but hey, in this course, we're gonna use ARM templates. Okay, we're gonna, for configuration, we're gonna use ARM templates. Okay, for monitoring, we'll use Azure Monitor and Azure Monitor is presented in the syllabus too. Earlier, for Azure DevOps services, which you are learning now in this session, was known as Visual Studio Team Services. Okay, so there is a name change happened. That's all. Nothing. If you say, if you if you find anything in the question that okay, we we are using VSTS, so it's same as Azure DevOps Services. And when we say Azure DevOps Server, which is same to the Azure DevOps Services, but only difference is Azure DevOps Server is hosted on my on-premises environment, but Azure DevOps Services is hosted on the Azure Cloud. So TFS, that is Team Foundation Server is a old name for Azure DevOps Server. Now we only call Azure DevOps Server, which is on-premise, and we all call we all call VSTS as Azure DevOps Services, which is a cloud version. Okay, so you will see no differences in the functionality, in the look-wise, everything you will find exactly similar. It's hard to uh, differentiate. The only difference I told you that Azure DevOps Server is an on-premises. If you see the name server, server, when it comes as server, it means a on-premise. When we see services, it's a cloud thing, right? So the banks, the banks, they don't want to share the data to the any any third party thing or the government's organization. They, they will not share. They will store on their environment. So that's why for those uh, users, there is the Azure DevOps server. They can store on the cloud. This is the picture of my Azure DevOps server. If you see, I have installed this on my uh, on my laptop. Okay, so you will uh, it will look like this, and uh, we're gonna I'm gonna show you that too. But for now, for your visualization, for your understanding, I kept this. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the subscription and licensing required for Azure DevOps because it's not an open source. It is open source up to some extent. Okay, if you are learning then it will be always open source. So I'll tell you first. So Azure DevOps services, if you create an account, it will be free for first five users. Okay. If in your organization, there is less than five or less than or e <clears throat> equal to five employees, then you don't need to purchase anything. It's free always for you. There are some things uh, that is not free uh, means that if you exceed that limit, Let's say I'm I want to store some more data. So there is a limit of that. You can purchase that. That's a separate thing. But if you would like to use, you can use freely. Now, if you if you have a company which is have more than five users, then there are certain licenses you need to purchase. That I'm gonna discuss. First license is a stakeholder license. It gives a partial access and can be used for unlimited users for free assigned to those users with no license or subscription who need access to limited set of feature. So stakeholder, if 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 let's say um, stakeholder is always a free. OK, now you can say that I told that only five users are free. Then what is stakeholder? So I'll tell you. Stakeholder, as it's mentioned that you can assign unlimited, but it will have a limited set of features. If you are giving a stakeholder license, to a user, he will not be able to perform any of the activities. He can only perform the activities like creating a work items, like assigning the user task, maybe comment, comment in the description, that short. If he wants to perform the work in the pipelines, maybe do a check-in in the code or do the stuff, he, he don't have access to do that. So we assign the stakeholder license to the managers or a product owners who just need to see the reports, who just need to see the reports. They don't want to do, they, they will not do the work. They will only rely on the work and they will only do the comments that what is the progress in that. So for those, we will assign a stakeholder license because they're not actually working. They are just keeping a track of it. I'm gonna show you uh, that too. <clears throat> now, the most important license, we have a basic license. That's like a six dollar a month. So this license will provide you an access for your Azure DevOps services each and everything. Okay, you need to purchase for a six dollar per month per user. 
by this you can have access to azure pipelines azure boards azure artifacts everywhere you will have access but with a stakeholder, you will not have access to Azure pipelines, Azure artifact, Azure test plans. You will only have access to the Azure boards to comment and you will have access to the dashboards to view the reports. That's all. You cannot do anything. Next is basic and test plans. So if you are a developer, you will assign if let's say you are an Azure DevOps administrator and a developer join the organization then you will assign a basic license only because if a tester joins the uh, organization then and in that case you need to assign basic and test plan license because with basic license test plans that is azure test plans okay i'll show you what test these test plans are like i was showing you see this is a test plan if you see if you are a basic user you will not see that this one okay there is a trial limit of 30 days after 30 days you will not see this see but but for first five users you can use it okay but if let's say uh, after 30 days also you will not be able to use this for the sixth user okay so what i was saying here that uh, if a qa joins then he needs an access to the test plan to so perform the testing create the test cases create the reports and there are a lot of other activities that a test user or like the test plan should have but basic will not have that access on the test plans this azure test plans okay this test plans so we will need to provide an additional license that is space basic plus test plan it's a complete license basic plus test okay so there, there's a difference between these now the other license we have is visual studio subscription so you must be aware that we have a visual studio ide right in that visual studio ide we can do the development and all so for those users who already have the visual studio subscription if your organization purchases a visual studio uh, professional or a visual studio enterprise then you don't need to purchase any of these okay it's free for you as a benefit as a benefit of Visual Studio subscription, you will get Azure DevOps to use freely without any uh, ex any more access because you are already purchasing the Visual Studio licenses. And as a benefit, as an add-on, Azure DevOps is part of a Visual Studio product. So you don't need to uh, worry about purchasing any basic license. So if you don't have Visual Studio subscriptions, then you need to purchase a basic or a basic test plan. If you're um, if you are doing assigning um, to the managers or anything, then you're gonna use stakeholders. For developer, we're gonna use basic. For uh, QA, we're gonna use basic test. For uh, for like testers and all, like for 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 um, for those users who have Visual Studio, then you don't need to purchase any of these. And remember, the questions can be very tricky with this part. Okay, so we're gonna discuss that too. But the concept is this five users is always free so you will get a basic users you will get five basic users free okay so uh, five users will be free for you always it will not be charged okay the sixth user you have to pay for six dollar five users is always free okay then now we're going to proceed so you can say that you are giving your data to the azure to the cloud to the azure devops so how it is secure and all because this is a very hot question that it's a security thing uh, you are uh, so to to answer this thing azure maintain the azure maintains the six copy of your data in different region in every region there will be three copies so it is everything is covered like disaster recovery management and everything the failover if it's happened then your data is completely protected okay so it, you have a six copies of your data in different different regions so if anything disaster anything happen it's completely you are covered so uh, like it has the ddos defensive system into uh, to prevent the like any uh, attacks from the uh, like you can say the hacking uh, if, if any hacking group attacks so it is always has a ddos attacks so what ddos means that uh, denial of distribution of system it means that whenever uh, multiple requests hit on your website it will go offline meaning if the same ip is hitting 
some of the URL again and again again and again. So the system will automatically block that IP. Okay, so it's completely that protected and it follows everything the GDPR and it has all the certification ISO HIPAA and everything is uh, presented uh, with the Azure DevOps. So data is completely secure in the Azure DevOps. Okay, so now let's create a DevOps account. If you if you don't have a DevOps account, now we can we'll create that. So and once you open that, you need to click on Start Free. Okay, when you click for on Start Free, you will be asked to provide the Gmail ID and the passwords or like any of that, right? So let me just do that for you. You will get to this page. Okay, you will get to this page. So it's like very easy to sign up. Just open this, click on start for free, provide the details. I'm giving you some time in order to create that. Once you do that, you will be redirected this page. Once you give that Gmail and all account, you'll be redirected to this page because I already gave my Gmail ID and password and I already created that. So once you do that, you need to click on continue. Okay. Then at this place, you need to choose your organization name again this is a very unique thing like your domain url okay if i gave any of that url that url i will be using as in my organization just a quick info guys test your knowledge of devops by answering this question which of the following are the popular tools for devops a jenkins b ansible c nagios D. All of the above. Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to IntelliPack to know the right answer. Now let's continue with the session. So I can use uh, my name as DevOrg. Okay. So that this will be my organization and in which region you would like to have it. So these are the uh, supported regions uh, available. So select any of it which you prefer and then hit continue. Then it will be redirecting to my organization. So remember I gave the name of my organization as dev or so it will be if you see on the top dev or it created this. So this is my unique uh, URL and this is my organization under which I will be working on. So it's pretty easy. Okay, so this is how I will create that my um, my account. Okay. So let me create my first project. I will name as first project only for demo purpose. So in this uh, you will be given an option like uh, a, you what visibility you want a public visibility or a private. So if you give a private by default, see it's a private only. It says that only people you give access to will be able to view this project. So if I am giving access to my users, then only they will be able to view if I uh, if let's say I give access uh, access uh, I don't give any access to you all and I just ask you to open this so then you will not be able to see that this project. But if I use a public one then if I give a URL to this. To you you can also access this. Yes, you cannot do any changes and all because you don't have access, but you can view that you can view the project and everything. Okay, you can view that this project. So everyone uses the private only. Then I will uh, click on uh, create project. So it will be it will be creating my first project like this. Okay. So this this is how easy it is. Okay, you can create the project. Remember one thing. This is a cloud version. If you see dev.azure.com and it's a dev org that is my organization name. But if you see in the cloud uh, on the on premises version. We call it as collections. Okay. There's a just some naming convention difference between the cloud and the on premises. On the cloud, we call it as organization. If you see here, uh, I'll go to here again. And if you see, it will it is asking me to create a new organization, right? But if you talk about the on premises, that is a on premise version, we call it as a collections, not an organization. Just naming conversion difference, but the page will look like this. Fine. So let me just talk about what is Azure Boards. With Azure Board Service, teams or users can manage their software projects. You will have a complete track of 
all the work which is going on in the project in a simple words you will create the tasks for your users as a pro product owner you will create some tasks okay by task i mean let's say a new feature let's say a bug okay those tasks you will create and assign those tasks to the users so as to they will they will perform that by this what will happen everything will be tracked what are the progress of that work and how long uh, they have been working how much hours they have worked on so th this is an um, this is a basic thing of the azure boards this these the this tool will help you that how your business is going on and how it will grow further right because you can create a chart we want to create those charts also okay other thing is you can i told you that we can easily track the work items the work the tasks which the users are doing how the progress is because that thing that progress report will determines how your project will be completing sooner or like it's on a right path or not okay the main part of azure boards is work items now i am going to show you little little demos okay what work items are so you remember that i have created this project let me open this project so if you see the url keep a note on the url also dev org that is under my organization i have this project under this boards okay under this boards if you see the work items we going to discuss in depth each tab each tab very in depth now the first thing is work item so now you should be aware of what is azure boards azure boards we will use to have a better tracking of the work which is going on in this project okay it's a bug tracking tool like jira all the function see i told you azure devops if you talk about each and every services okay every service has a different product in the market okay and azure devops is a house for these those kind of conception technology i'll give you an example azure boards is a jira azure repos is a github azure pipelines is you can say uh, ci cd jenkins test plans uh, we have a lot of uh, mtm if you uh, worked on mtm and all test plans are mtm the different product in the market azure artifacts azure artifact is similar to the maven central or a nuget repository so all these tools and concepts combined to a one technology named as azure devops so that's why it's a ocean that's why i said in the first lecture it's an ocean because all the concepts are combined in the one thing so if you learning azure boards then you will you have all the knowledge on jira if you are running azure repos then you will have all the knowledge on github also because everything is integrated you all know that github is owned by microsoft so everything is interlinked i'm going to show you if i do a check in in github how my pipeline will trigger in the azure repos or azure devops everything is interlinked so i am going to show you that too so yeah, i was talking about azure boards okay uh, azure boards in that i was talking about the work items so work item i told you that work items are the tracking the main goal of azure boards is to have a better tracking system right better tracking everything is like a tracked you can view it's a better visualization things work item means that you can track the work the requirements the features which your organization or a, like a scrum master or a manager is creating on correct so this is my work item page you should all now have a azure devops account you need to go to this page if you are not already what you need to do your organization page will look like this click on this project first project okay and then go to the azure boards click on the work item that's all you need to do so see in this boards click on the work items now i'm going to create the work items okay so let's say if a task if 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 there is a new task i want to assign a new task to my in, to my developer i will just click on task a new task will open this is how it will look like okay 
I will mention that. Okay, what will be that? Uh, what will be the new task? Okay, I will mention um, add uh, like uh, add a new tab in the login page. Something like that, right? It it can it can be anything. I wanted to add a new tab in the login page. That is my new task. Now I will assign to any of that user. Okay, I will uh, I will just assign to any of that user. Uh, okay, any of that user I can assign. Fine, I will assign to this guy. Okay, this guy will do that. So now this is how I will create that work item. You remember I was telling you uh, that stakeholder license. So you need to keep fo like track on everything because now the labs in the labs only I can only relate. So the stakeholder will only do the comments like this. Okay, uh, like dev dot devops. Please update something like that. How you will do that at the rate and the uh, engineer name, right? Please update. So the mass scrum master or anything they can just do these things. That's all they can view it. They can update it. They will not do anything in the repos and pipelines. Okay. Now, this is how you will create a work item. Don't worry, we will be discussing each and everything. Okay. When the time comes, we're going to discuss each and everything. So, this is a work item thing. I will click on save. And the comment is there. Please update the thing. Now, this is a work item being created. Let me go to the work items. So, this is my work item being created. Right now, I have created this. Add a new tab in the login page. Now, you can set the priority. Like, what is the priority? If it's an urgent, I will say a one. It's a pretty high priority thing. Okay. You can add the description. Okay. In the description, I mean to say that what the user has to do things step by step. Okay. Open um, the website. Like I will I will ask the user to open the website and like uh, just um, do the check in on uh, XYZ code and make sure that different build does not break something like that, right? So this is how you can uh, mention the description and this user when come he can see the description that this is the things he needs to do. Okay. Fine. So this is how your work item looks like in a in a first look. Fine. I was just giving a glimpse of what is work items. So you mentioned right bugs issue tasks. So it, these are all the work item types. I was just showing you the issues. So if you it's the task, if you see this is the task. If you see, I'll click here. This is my task. Now. Let me just move for, uh, forward. Now the main part comes the process and process templates. Okay, I'm going to explain you work item in very depth when the slides come. Okay, what is process? What is process templates? What is these process templates types? And it is pretty much important to have a knowledge for you. So the process is like a building blocks of the work items. Like how which inheritance process it supports. Okay, which process supports which inheritance process. So this uh, like fine. So a process uh, in a layman term, the process is the thing, the things which needs to do. Okay, in a, in, in a simple uh, layman term, if you see that process is a task or a thing which is going on, which is running or you need to do. So in here we say process is the building blocks of the work item tracking. Okay, so you need to understand that process have a different process template. By building block of work items, I mean to say these work items. And by template, I mean that there are certain templates in the process named as process templates. Okay. Process templates define the building blocks of the work item tracking system as well as subsystem you access through the Azure boards and the ETFS. So a process is the building blocks of the work items. Building block of the work items means that 
what are the types uh, different different types involved in the different different types of process template and process template is it's just like a template it's just a template in that template it is predefined it is predefined thing that these are the uh, mentioned work items which you need to perform or do or it is presented you may not understand by like this way uh, i will just show you the demo then you will understand so this is my project right this this is a project we created now now let me create a new project okay let me create a new project my project name is this in uh, github integration now when you click on advance okay when you click on advance you see two version control git and tfvc that is i told you in the past that azure devops supports two version control git and team foundation version control you can select any of it usually people uses git so we have one question let me just check that yeah uh, asim has the question can we update the template absolutely yes you can customize the template you can do anything you want absolutely you can do it i'm going to show you uh, in this demo yes today i'm going to show you no svn uh, pavan says that no svn absolutely no it don't use svn svn is only for like legacy uh, legacy things legacy software so if you would like to use svn no azure devops don't support that only it supports git and tfvc okay so uh, any of you can choose it okay usually all of we choose git only because it's a very legacy thing also again team foundation version but some use it the process template which i was telling you yeah if you click on the question select the right work item process to create a team project now we created a project named as first project that is based on a basic template so they, these are the templates by templates i mean that we have different different work item types in different different process templates so in the ppt just a quick info guys if you want to make a career in azure devops then intellipad provides a microsoft azure devops engineer certification training which is taught by industry experts with more than 10 years of experience this course is designed to upskill and land your dream job now let's continue with the session i was just telling you that process template is a building blocks right uh, uh, building blocks of the work items tracking system so by building blocks of work item tracking system means that this i meant these these things work items are different in each and every template and by template i mean that if i select a basic template or if i select a cmmi or a scrum or agile we're going to discuss what these are by template we mean that if you use any of the process template then it will follow certain set of work items that you need to do uh, you, that you will use that in just 5 minutes you will be understanding in the lab uh, that what it actually means uh, by visualizing okay just give me 5 or 10 minutes you will understand if you if you have doubts on in this part okay so seven pace is a third party tool okay uh, for tracking you can use in the extensions you can add in the um, extensions and you can use that seven page tracker extension which is not included in this course and that that is for a better because it's a paid one okay it's you don't uh, we we all have to pay that to use that so it's again a it it will it will give you the more in depth knowledge in depth uh, like you can say things which azure boards don't have it's you can say it's an extended version with the complete tracking okay third party extension you need to install that extension on azure devops in order to use that so it's uh, it's a different thing okay so in this you remember uh, i i was just creating a new project only okay so you just need to click on a new project click on new project just give it any name new project i will make it that simple new project select that any of the visibility then in the advance i was showing you the process template so by process template when you select a different different process template it only varies with the work item types if you remember in the first uh, in the first process template we have only three task issues and other one 
but let me select agile and that will clear your doubts okay so i am creating one more uh, project with a test project and that is based on agile so let me go to the boards work items again and let me duplicate this tab so if you see right the reason for this is this new project is based on the agile method agile template but if you see my first project this is based on the basic if you see um, if you click on the boards and the work item if you see this it has only three but if you see this this has so many the reason for this is this is my agile template and this is my basic template so the question is that can we update the temp custom template absolutely you can do it you can do it this is now supported you can update your process template if you want to move from agile to basic basic to agile and all those stuffs you can do it you can customize everything it's on your hand we can do it i'm going to show you okay that we have this thing okay yes we can add the new fields we can uh, update uh, anything you want to do we want i'm going to show you that okay we can add new fields and do anything so you now under have a uh, basic understanding of what is process template process templates are uh, are only uh, like the difference comes when there is a uh, work items uh, like different different types of work items in the basic i have only three work items in the agile i have so many work items okay so now how to check the process templates which you are using in this project just go to the project settings if you see on the left below you see project settings just click on that in that project settings you can see that on which thing on which uh, model your project is based on agile correct so uh, let me change this name because then uh, because then you will have a more understanding of it agile project fine let me just save it what is happening current name new project name agile oh oh ho oh. agile project there was space missing that's why it's not allowing me so fine now i change my project name to agile project now let me change this also go to the project settings in that project settings go to this uh, you can see the basic and let me just do that basic okay then save it and fine so you all know right in the boards i can all, all, again see that that my work item templates are different for agile we have these many and for basic we have three only so let me go back to the slide and now let me dig into that more so you now have an understanding of like what is process template we only defer pro the process templates only defer when we when the scenario come in the types of work items in different different pro uh, uh, process templates we have four process template every you will see if you can create on your end i will also show you you will see each and every template will have a different different work items so process template is like everything rest rest everything is similar it's just which methodology which terminology you want to use to build your project these are agile scrum cmmi basic these are the standard terminology these are the standard project uh, project terminology pro, uh, project methodology which organizations are following so which differs only at the types of work items okay so process templates is nothing but the differences in the work items in a simple words see for jira is a third party product you don't need to do anything you don't need to integrate jira with azure devops for azure boards okay you can happily use azure boards without using the jira jira is a different product that if you are using jira then um, like you can integrate those things okay you can integrate those things but you don't need you don't need to use explicitly that like once you perform the demo you will under uh, like on your end you will understand uh, like the better yeah we can integrate uh, we can uh, integrate but this is not a this is not a thing we should not integrate actually because we can upgrade we can migrate from on premises to the cloud the question is why we need that because on premises also has the same functionality cloud also has the same functionality so the best 
thing is we can upgrade or you can say migrate to the cloud from on premises to the to the uh, to the cloud but we cannot integrate and there, uh, this is uh, not a, i think i think it's not a valid thing also to integrate uh, like to but we can do that we can do that but uh, yeah we can do that uh, but uh, i don't think so it's a valid thing to do that because um, everything is um, like both things are similar but if you can if you want to do that then um, with using service connections we can do that like in the service connections you can provide your ips and uh, in the uh, project settings you can go to the azure pipelines and then to the service connection in the service connections you can give your on premises ips and then you can use that but other than that no we cannot use integrate that okay so yeah now i'm going to discuss the differences okay now i'm going to discuss the differences between all these basic uh, just a moment yeah so we have these process templates right okay so yeah so basic we we have four templates so basic is the most lightweight applications so now when to use basic people uses basic when they have a very less requirement okay less requirement i mean to say they want to develop a very si simple sign in page a login page a very basic project you can say a very basic project no much drama and all they don't want to have more work items nothing we'll use basic now if like uh, let's talk about uh, you want to uh, do some development and all the core development like a big development project in that case we have an option to use a scrum or agile methodology that will like organization uses for a development for a development purpose now it's up to the organization which template they select because the scrum and agile both like different template has a different different work items types so it's up to them like which work items uh, they would like to include in their project so but both scrum and agile is used for the like bigger developments hardcore development now in the cmmi cmmi stands for capability maturity model integration it means that it's like a um, you mean to say when uh, people are just improving or enhancing their applications their old legacy applications let's say i have a very old legacy application and i want to add some new features so for those kind of scenarios cmmi is a thing we'll use cmmi for development we can use scrum and agile which to choose based on the requirement that which work items types we would like to use basic is for very small project okay so um yeah now i'm gonna little explain you more on that and that what are the template types uh, and the work items uh what are the work item types so first is basic i already told you that basic is for the simplest model if you see it, it's like a very simplest model it only have three work items that's all I'm going to discuss portfolio backlog and product backlog. Okay, we have one question. That what is ARM template? So ARM template is totally different concept. ARM template is used for the deployment of the Azure resource. If you break that ARM, it means Azure Resource Manager template. So in that template, I will write my JSON file. You can say I will write my code in order to deploy the Azure VM. Azure storage account, Azure key vault, or any of the Azure resources. So that Azure ARM template is entirely different with these process templates. These are just the definition for your uh, the like the basic uh, the, the definition for your building a project for the building of the project. That's all. ARM template is for deploying the Azure resource. That's all. ARM template we're gonna discuss later. Not so. Now I was discussing the basic template. Basic we will use when we have a simplest model very basic. We have epic issue task So now let me just go back here. So if you see this is my basic project right in that I have epic issue task only three work items I have in my basic that's all So we have a portfolio backlog product backlog and under that we have task what it means product portfolio backlog if let me just talk over in a very simple terms we like Every company has its portfolio, right? I'll talk in that way. If, uh, every company has its portfolio, or even 
like the models and all they also have their portfolios what that portfolio means that the bigger picture of their uh, the bigger picture of their means that everything which which they have done or which they have uh, like the doing they are done right in the progress it is mentioned in the portfolio backlog similarly epic you can say it's a larger thing it's a, it's a it's a work item only if you see it's a work item only but it's a work item only but if you see i click on epic it's it's a work item which i to, which i explained you the issue right it's similar it's similar to that but uh, here uh, the ep epic means that like it's it's a, like a bigger story it's a bigger task under that only you will create issues and under that you will create a task. This is a hierarchy which basic process template follow. So see these are the hierarchies which is written over here. By hierarchy what I mean let me create a uh, like uh, my new epic. Let me name it as a new epic and under that. I can add my related work. So if you see. Uh, if you see that the issues and tasks will be under the epic. Like under the issue under the epic, I will have issues and under the issue I can have tasks. There is no hard and fast rule that you cannot have epic under the issue. You can have epic this one under the issue and under the task also, but that's not a right way to uh, to develop things. OK, so there is a hierarchy which uh, which uh, the templates or you need to follow. So under this epic, OK, under this epic only I will be adding one task let's say new new item under this i will it, see if it, you see it's a child but you can have uh, like a parent also it's up to you but as i need to follow the hierarchy i will uh, use the issue okay right create so this is my um, issue is also created and it will be reflecting here this is a child under this. So this is a hierarchy under epic. I will have issue and under issue. I can have my task. Just a quick info guys. Test your knowledge of Azure by answering this question. What are the different cloud deployment models in Azure? A private cloud B public cloud C hybrid cloud D all the above. Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to Intellipad to know the right answer. Now let's continue with the session. Right. If you see it, this the uh, like for this issue, this is a parent, but I can add his child also. Right. So for this, I will uh, not this one. I already have the task. Uh, yeah. I will just existing item and the task. I will add the task. That's all. So now if you see it's a proper hierarchy under this epic. I have this issue and for this issue the child is this task right it follows this hierarchy epic under that epic I have issue under that issue I have task so this is a hierarchy it follow portfolio backlog is the thing which everything like the bigger picture bigger thing you need to do and under that epic you can have n number of issues and under the issues you will have n number of tasks but epic will be one for one thing for one bigger uh, scenario or you can say for, for one bigger task. So OK, so these are the portfolio backlog and product backlog. So by product backlog, I mean that for this particular see epic can be uh, multiple. So let's say I want to develop a website e-commerce website for that. I will have a login page. I have a shopping cart, right? I have a let's say offers uh, page. So for for offers page, I will create uh, epic named as offers for shopping cart. I'll create an epic name as shopping cart for login. I'll create an uh, epic as login cart, right? A login. So these this will be my different different bigger tasks under that. I will create the issues and under that I will be creating some tasks. So these the, the, the bigger task is named as a portfolio backlog under that the under this product under this thing. I will be having the things the which is named as product backlogs. Backlogs are nothing but the things which you need to do. If you talk about the layman terms in the examination, we have some backlogs and all right. So that's the thing. Your the things, your logs, the things which you need to do. 
right? So this is named as product backlog. And under this, we have issue and task. Now I'm going to talk about agile. Same thing, I'm not going to uh, show you each and everything, uh, the flow which I showed for basic. You can follow yourself and you can do that. So agile, in like I'll, I'll explain you what agile methodology is. In the organization, the organization used to follow agile again to have a better streamlined flows. OK, so in that agile, we will have some uh, daily meetings. We have a sprints. OK, that sprints and all we gonna discuss in a very, very, very depth in this demo only. So there are certain methodology which we follow. I'll, I'll give you now example. Let's say I have a project coming up. OK. I have to complete that project in a month. So if you are following agile methodology, then you need to follow certain principles. By that we mean that in a month you need to deliver that, but you will not deliver all in a single go. You will create as you will divide a month into two, two weeks. Okay. In the, after the two weeks, you will be delivering some things and after another two weeks, you will de deliver the uh, hundred percent. So these are the terminology. These are the things which will come under the agile. Right? These are the agile methodologies. So this under this template. We will be developing our complete project. Again, agile is for um, again a different process template, which will have a different different work items type under the epic will have feature then user story then task and same like, like same way we have a product backlogs backlogs and then issues and bug, the third layer we have kanban boards and all which we're going to discuss uh, when i i'm going to show you the demo so okay this is this little presentation of agile now in the scrum again i told you that agile and scrum is somewhat very similar only difference is which which template you would like to use if you see the process temp, uh, the work items type, it's like similar only one or two uh, work items or more. OK, so uh, like you can choose the scrum and this process works great if you would like to track your product backlog items and bugs on the Kanban board. So uh, only difference is like if you want these bugs, tasks, impediment, it says that it works well if you want to track product backlog items, that is PBIs, product backlog items. If you see this PBI is not presented in agile, right? It's not presented in agile. So that's the difference types of the work items. In the next we have a CMMI. We only use CMMI framework or a CMMI template. In order to like when, whenever you are develop, uh, uh, making an enhancement in your legacy project legacy software, then it is always recommended to use CMMI process template. That's all you need to know, need to know for this. And now I'm going to show you the differences between these templates on the demo on the uh, the project that will give you more understanding. OK, now this is my agile. This is my basic. Now I'm going to create. My now I'm going to create the uh, uh, scrum. OK, so you you should also create that. Uh, then only you will have a better understanding of it. And remember, these are the default templates. I cannot do any changes in that. OK, I'm going to customize these later today. So for now, just understand this. That I'm now creating a scrum. OK, and then it will be created. Now I'll go to the work items. I just wanted to show you the differences between the templates. The only difference arises when we talk about the work item types. That's all. If you see the work items now, we have bug, epic, feature, impediment, product backlog items, task, and test cases. These are the things. But if you see the agile, oh uh, no, this is my this is my agile. When you see the agile, I don't have any impediment or a product backlogs item. Correct. I don't have anything. But if you see this, I have these so many. So only difference is when we talk about the um, when you talk about the uh, uh, work item types. That's all differences in the uh, uh, work items uh, in the process templates. OK, so now I will create one more project. Oops, oops, not here, not here. Okay. So I'll create one now CMMI. I will go there and select the 
PMMI project this time and create. So this see the concept wise, there are a lot of definitions. You can uh, you can learn that a lot of definition that what actual process template means. So if you want to just understand uh, what process template is exactly, it's only differences in the work items types. And I already discussed with you that when to use when basic is like when a very basic agile and scrum you, you want to do the hardcore development CMMI is for the improvements. That's all you need to do nothing more you need to do and learn. Yeah, so if you see my agile the, there are only six seven, but if you see my CMMI it has lot many risk review tasks, right? See why there is a need to add a risk or review because you are enhancing your project right your current legacy project so that's why uh, it is uh, added these things okay so due to this reason let me create one risk so yeah help me add that new work item new work so now one more thing i wanted to show you the difference between these templates one i already told you that these this these things are different Right, these things are different. Other thing I wanted to show you is the the state, the state of these. Now it is created. So if you click on here, you see the state new active result closed, right? But if you see in my this one, the CMMI, it is totally different. Proposed active closed. These two only differences are there between the process templates. That's all. Everything, repos, pipeline, and everything is same. It's up to you which process template you would like to use on which you are comfortable on so this is my cmmi and if you can see proposed active close but if you see in my agile i have new active it's totally different and if you see in the uh, scrum then it's totally different approved committed done removed it's okay so these are the things you need to just take uh, you just need to take care of note of that that's all okay so we were there yeah we were discussing this one Okay, so there are some state transition which I just showed you. For basic, we have these. For agile, we have new active this. For scrum, we have new approved committed done. I already showed you, right? This thing. For scrum, we have new approved committed done removed these stuff. And here it is same. So this this thing showed that thing only. That um, what are the states? So these are the states presented over here. Okay. Now. I'm going to discuss in brief of all these things under the boards. We see what is work items. Now we're going to look at boards, backlogs, prints, and queries. Okay. You all now must be familiar with work items. Work items are the tasks in which we create the task, track the activity. Now, how to track the activity? So, in um, let me just um, go to my here. Not here, sorry. sorry. So by track, I mean that when I create a user story or anything. So you can have some story points by story points mean that if you complete this, you will have like 10 points. You mean to say it's kind of hours or you can say whenever this this thing, OK, this thing is completed, you will get 10 story points. So. This is how you will track it or to better explain you. Let me just go back. And add some more thing that is a task. Yeah, I wanted to show you this thing. Yeah, here you can set the original estimate remaining and completed original estimate that OK, I'm I think that it will take a 10 hours. Today I completed two. Uh, today I completed uh, one hour. Okay, so this is how you need to track it. You can track like this way. And um, when you do everything, okay, when completed is ten, when completed is ten, and remaining is zero, so that will mark as a completed thing. Okay, and th that is how you will be tracing in the charts. We're gonna discuss charts also. So this is how tracking works. OK, this is how the logic behind it that uh, whenever you mark this close this work item and uh, then it will be under the chart it will be coming as a close thing. So 
that's how work item is used for the uh, tracking okay the next part is the boards okay before going to the boards let me just discuss the work items first okay yeah in depth thing okay first i am going to discuss this work items first okay so let me go back here if you open any of the work item that will be fine you will here mention the name you can assign it to the anyone state we already discussed that in which state it is active closed right here area path and iteration path i'm going to explain you la later uh, in the ppt it's a very big topic area and iteration path so other than that description you can add you can add disc discussion here when you click on this time icon all the history everything is tracked over here who did changes and everything okay in the history page you can see who added this who removed this every history will be there if you click here it will it is a link so you remember i created one uh, i created this thing right so if you click on the link you will see all the links you remember i created a linked work item right i created a linked work item and when i clicked on this link my link the work item which is attached to this epic was showing here under this link in this you can add the attachments if you have some screenshots or anything that okay you would want your feature to look like this so you can add the attachments so this is how these uh, things are if you click on follow anything happens to this work item you will get an email notification that okay this things is happening you can add a tag tag will help you later when we are working on queries that will help you to sort the uh, work items so i can add tasks for some particular team let's say one one of my team is not performing well so i'll add a tag and i mentioned that critical so now what what i can do um, i can just uh, save this and i can query my work items all the work items which is under critical tag it will be listing up right so these these are the tags under the settings you can mention that okay uh, what are the settings you need to do notification setting who who are the user should be getting notified so it is not subscribed i if i click on subscribe i will get all the emails on my email id other than that we have these things just a moment yeah when you click on the three dots you will have new linked work linked work item it means that you are adding a linked work item uh, like i did previously it's a different way of doing that's all okay change type if i click on the change type then yeah, i can like currently it is an epic i can change that type if you remember you, some of you have asked that how to change that work item types if it is already created so you can change the type let's say by mistake i created this epic but it was an issue so i can create that issue by changing the work item type so move to team project now if you would like to move to some different team okay some different project in this organization see currently it is in basic but i can move to the scrum i can move to the cmmi okay different different projects i can move that so other than that you can create a copy of this work item let me create that create a copy of work item i just did that and uh, okay let me just do that so now a new work item is created with all the details okay all the details mentioned in this previous work item okay everything is copied automatically it's just a feature for just to show you that it's just a like feature you can use it okay now you can delete you can email work item when i click on email you'll be getting an email like this that okay uh, let's say i created a work item and i want to send an email to the user i'll just type this username and uh, this will be getting the email okay so other than that delete and deleted templates if i click on capture i'll, I'll explain you what this mean okay let me just select that first and basic team and okay fine so what this template mean this is a work item template this is not a process template don't confuse with that work item template means i'll just copy this work item template means that 
let's say you have a requirement to create 100 work items which is similar okay which is similar everything is similar you just need to assign to a different different person that's all so instead of creating manually 100 work items what you can do you can create a template okay you can create a template based on the work item and this template will have all the details similar to this work item let me just open this i just copied this template okay uh, there is a you remember that when i created the work item um, it asked me to copy the link uh, yeah so if you see that it is exactly the same thing it's exactly the same uh, which is presented over here correct it's the same yeah these things will be not linked because it is specific to this uh, work item so yeah so everything is linked over there okay so this is how it meant by that uh, template you can create a new branch when we are discussing the uh, like the azure repos we're going to discuss that we can link any work items uh, like any work items with a uh, with a branch also right because branch we create branches based on the work assigned to us so we need to link the work that that is we need to link the work item which is assigned to us so that we'll create a new branch that we're going to discuss when we going through azure repos you can just request feedbacks and all that's very uh, not that much related only thing is left is area and iteration which is uh, like a big thing and that i'm gonna show you in a while uh, the boards uh, so by board we mean that you can quickly and easily track start tracking of the user story backlog items and all these stuffs okay uh, with the board so with the by board what i meant actually i'll just show you this thing um, i wanted to show you this thing the boards what board is so if you see the bigger organization how they work this is how they will work they will have some sticky note like this okay they will have a okay they will have a sticky note like this and if you see if you can see clearly yeah if you see this one they have this do next doing a uh, done right these are the things so it's a it's a like a sticky note they will write the thing okay that you need to do this you need to do this and they will mention the work items like this so in the boards also i will show you my working board okay so in the board this is a board you will have exact similar way okay the exact similar way i can move my board from here and there okay i can do that all the stuff i can do it so this is exactly similar these sticky notes and all this is exactly similar than this one so board is a place where you will have a better visualization of the work items if you are doing and if you're working on agile methodology and like you use so far uh, so far if you're using the agile methodology then we use this kanban board this board is known as kanban board how it will work in the sticky note we will write okay this thing you need to do and we'll mention in do do list when next meeting will happen we will just plug that sticky note and paste it in the done state that's all right that's how that's the thing which i'm doing in this let's say i have a board and it's in um, this board i'm going to show you okay just for a visualization i'm just showing you i'm going to show you how to create that so for this board I can move it to anywhere doing state done state like that sticky notes, right? But for you, if you are working in a simple project, your board will look like this. It's completely empty like this, right? So this is board Kanban board is I can move my sticky note from this place to then this place and then and then so on. Okay, so you can easily stack. This is how you will using the boards. You will track the uh, the uh, work items right now in the next part backlogs your product backlogs corresponding to the project plan the roadmap of your team plan so 
you create a product backlog by adding the user stories and all. So after when you define these after you do the prioritization and everything right then only you will move here and there the backlogs. Let me show you that. So if you look if you look this okay uh, if you look this page we have this page named as board under this board I have a lot of work items. Now what I'm trying to explain you the backlogs. Boards is only meant for a better visualization for better tracking. That's all it meant for. OK, now let me go to the backlogs. The same thing which I told you the same thing is applicable for backlogs also. This is my backlogs. These are the backlog things which I need to do. OK, so backlog is again for our visualization. The only difference is if you click on this view as board, it will go to this page. OK, this is my like this is my uh, Kanban board and when I click on view as backlog, it will go to my backlog page. So what I'm trying to explain here is. I can also move. This thing anywhere I can move that. I can move this print under this part. OK, now it will have like this one. I can move this to this. So what I'm trying to explain you here is. Both backlogs and board board represents the same thing. The only difference here is the. Visualization thing that's all with the boards and backlog. That's why if you see we have this option. Why this option is given. On this page because if you would like to view this page. As a board, then you'll click as board. This is your board, the Kanban board, which is this page, same page like this. This is the same Kanban board. And if you would like to view as a backlog page, under the same page, you will have a list of your backlogs that will be coming up here. Now, let me just create in freshly for you here in that. That was just for demonstration. Okay. So we have one question that uh, what is the use of work items? Uh, will DevOps users resolve those work items? Fine. So to answer this question. Work items see I create a work item. Let me create a let me create one work item again. Here I will just go here. Work item is only meant for telling my user telling my developer that this thing you need to do this work you need to do. For example, I have a task to add. Um, like say um, add a footer. In my website, right? Then I will assign my user to add this footer. When I click on save an email notification will send to this user that he need to perform these steps which is mentioned over here like add a footer or something right so the purpose of work item is to create is to inform or is to assign the task to my developer to my user okay that is what work item meant for okay so other question you have is uh, will devops user resolve those work items see devops user will yes they can resolve that by clicking on this currently it's in to do state you can you need to make it as a done state when you make it as a done state it is resolved it is completed yes you can mark it as a in a completed state you can do that okay so uh, it is also it is also for a monitoring purpose work items it is also that you can resolve it because i can uh, make it as a resolve and then uh, it's for monitoring also OK, so yeah, this is it meant for uh, for uh, you can also resolve it and uh, uh, and you can also complete it mark it as a complete and it's for monitoring also. I will show you I will show you like uh, you s I'll show you here. Um, I will show you the charts also. I'm not sure that if my chart is a see this kind of charts you will able to see with the dates. OK, so these are the charts the report review I have in my organization. So you will track. 
your work if you if you complete your work item then it, the graph will go like down or like some i will show you when when i'm going to talk about the charts but to just uh, to just show you an example that yes we can resolve this work items and for monitoring we will refer these charts under the dashboards okay so an another question we have from puja that can we customize azure boards as per our requirement absolutely yes so if you see if you see uh, my boards here if you see i just show you and i'm going to show you th those things okay so if you see and if you look at yours see how how can customization i have done i have added this customized field i have add uh, all these customized field and i have added these kind of stuffs so i did these customization from my end you can also do it so yeah i'm going to show you that too okay so this is my work item um i can create one more uh, quickly i'll create just one more okay so this is my work i bugs and uh, work item so you can make it as approved or like you can move it to anywhere now when when i click on a view as backlog so if you see both the things are showing up here both the things are showing up here what i meant here is that the uh, the all the work items which is you sh which you can see in the backlog can be up, like available in the board so only difference between boards and backlog are the visualization in backlog you will have a list in the board you will have the work item in this form in this form that's all else everything is same just a quick info guys if you want to make a career in azure devops then intellipad provides a microsoft azure devops engineer certification training which is taught by industry experts with more than 10 years of experience this course is designed to upskill and land your dream job now let's continue with the session for customization we're going to see the settings and all that we're going to check but first you should have the basic knowledge on everything uh, sprints and queries too then we're going to dig into that just a quick info guys test your knowledge of devops by answering this question which of the following are the popular tools for devops a jenkins b ansible c nagios d all of the above comment your answer in the comment section below subscribe to intellipack to know the right answer now let's continue with the session okay so backlogs you understood right uh, it's just for like um, which and yeah here this thing is th this this uh, work items belongs to this team if i have any other team right i will be i can as i can each team has a different board we going to look how to create different teams also right we going to look that so all the teams list will be listing up here like if you see here i have so many teams here so if you look look at my different team this team testing team it will have a very simple board right if you, it will have a very simple board but if you look at my very working board that is testing one two three team then it will have a board like this a very big board so what i meant to say here when you assign a work item it will go to some particular team and the board is different for different different team so you can view those work items over here now sprints that's a very important concept here is the sprint sprint provides a filtered view of your work item a team has assigned to a specific iteration or a sprint sprints are defined for a project then selected by teams so sprint is a more you can say granular view or a filtered view of the boards and the work items i was discussing with you that um, that i have a project i have a project which came and that needs to be completed in a month correct i was discussing this thing so we will not deliver everything in a single go we will filter those thing in a will divide that thing in two two weeks in first two weeks i will deliver 50% in next two weeks i will deliver 50% so the division of the like the time is known as sprints okay don't confuse with that sprint 
and iteration is similar thing. For now, just understand what sprint is. You see an option of here set dates. I told you that sprint is again a similar board. These things are little confusing, okay? But you don't need to confuse. The sprint page and the board page looks exactly similar. If you see right, it it's look exactly similar things. But uh, it's not. There is a little difference in here. You see a date, right? Set dates. Iteration we will look in later. But first understand what is sprint. Sprint is a filtered view. Filtered. Uh, we are putting a filter. Okay. In a momentum, we'll, we are putting a filter based on the dates. Let me create. Let me just set the dates here. Sprint one. I will. Let's say the project came in from January, right? First January, our project came and I have to deliver on 31st. So from 1st Jan to two weeks from 15th, 1 to 15th, I will making it a sprint one. I'll make it a save. So I have to cover, I have to deliver this thing from to do state to done state. Right? It says five days remaining. Okay. So I can create some more sprint. Let me create sprint two. It's a very uh, confusing topic. So yeah, you need to pay a little uh, attention here. So it's a confusing topic like sprints and iteration, but I will clear it out in a very easy way. Okay, so fine. Okay, fine. So I have to uh, what it says that this is already here. So I just need to go here and click on the sprint two, and then I can set the dates. You, you see that what I, I was doing. In the sprint one, I was just changing the dates for this, which I cannot because the sprint is created with these dates. So if you look the sprints, these sprints having the exactly the similar view as we can see in the boards. Boards have similar view, but in the boards you can you don't see any of the dates. Sprints is a filtered view based on the timings, and it will. You can see the work items on the boards. Okay. Sprint is a filtered view. Okay. Just you need to understand sprint is a filter view based on the dates. That's all. And it's the same as boards. Everything is same, but it's a minute, minute thing. Sprint one, I will cover this thing. In the sprint two, I will uh, do some uh, January from January 16th to um, January 16th to like 31st. That's all. Okay. So I have two sprints created. So fine. So it is a current sprint. Once it is done, I will have a future. Uh, like the, the future sprint will become my current sprint. Okay. The queries. Query is a very uh, useful way to sort, to list your queries, to list your, sorry, to list your work items based on your needs. So let me just create a new query and you will understand what I'm trying to say. Here, I have to mention the work item field, work item type, operator equals to, it's like, it's completely like a SQL query, SQL query, okay? That it's like a select query. I am running a select query, just assume that I am running a select query and all the work items will be listed based on my, this select query. Now in this, I would like to list all the work items of any like all the work item type it can be bug or anything i want to list all and the state should be uh, active or you can say the um, uh, accepted let me just run this query fine it's no, no nothing is there let me select any so see there are three work items presented in this so Let's say your manager came into the picture and uh, he see that uh, the teams are not doing well. So he needs to track that. So this thing stakeholder can also view that. Okay, this thing stakeholder can also view the queries. He can write the queries like this. So I can add like, like I can mention that. Okay, state should be um, like in progress. I would like to check that. Uh, oh, sorry, state no no. State should be in progress. Let me run this query. So he can see that all those work items, which is currently in progress state, and he can just open this work item. 
and just check with this developer which is assigned to this that what what things are happening why it is still in, in progress so queries are a very useful way in order to filter your queries filter by by uh, by filter i mean that you will have a list of your work items listed in the query so uh, i will give you a very big uh, like in the in this project i have a lot of work items okay let me go here and i will show you the example you'll have more because in this i in this project i have more data let me have this and let me add a new clause in that clause i can mention that okay the priority should be two i want to list all the work item which have priority two let me just run this query so here all the work items being listed which have priority two or uh, if not let me add some more queries like some more data field um which have some a uh, no no area path i haven't explained you so um okay which has been closed by some user let me just mention the username this user i i wanted the work item which have priority to and is being closed by this person so let me run that only this work item has the priority to and closed by this person is listed over here so this is how it's just a select query so we are running a select query so or uh, you can you can just if you wanted to check that all the work items which is in active state uh, active state so you will mention that okay list me all work item which is in active state so it will list all the work item which is in active state so this is how we will use the queries okay so this is how queries will be used in this uh, okay let me go here okay so this work item things i already explained you that what is this history attachments and all i have explained you the main thing left is area nitration path that i'm going to give you some like more in depth knowledge on that i already explained you that these are the board right i already explained you that you can put the board in a different uh, like different different places right i already showed you that you can drag and drop thing in the board i already did that so backlogs backlogs again it's a different view which i already explained it's a different view for uh, different different uh, teams right backlogs and the sprints oh sorry backlogs and the boards has a different views that's all if you see this is a different view but if i go to the and it also has the same team a different teams concept like board has right i go to the board and it will have the same thing right so uh, it's it's like similar thing only the view changes that's all for the backlogs sprints sprint i explained you sprint we define sprint as as a defined by date for proper definition let me read that out again sprint provide a filtered view of work items a team has assigned to specific iteration or sprint so iteration path is exactly similar thing with us like sprint you can say iteration path and sprint is a similar thing okay so only one difference is there only one small difference is there between iteration and sprint rest you can see you can say that iteration and sprint both are similar thing sprints are defined for a project and then selected by teams so sprint is a filtered view of work item that you are putting some set this like you are putting some criteria a week for a week for a two week and then you are listing that thing in the boards correct right? that all we see so um this is a sprint okay the query we already run we already see that in the editor we write that query and run that fine i will just give you some glimpse okay uh, i'll just give you some thing that i wanted that uh, i wanted to show you here see this these are my process template right i'll go to the project settings under that project setting i can see basic okay this is my default process template i cannot customize my default process template i can only 
customize my inherited process template. Now, what is inherited process template? I will show you. You need to go to the uh, Azure DevOps. OK, this organization go to the organization settings. Remember two difference organization settings and project settings. Organization settings is for complete your company. For project for 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 project settings, it's for the particular project, right? For changing or for adding a new process, we will go to the organization settings. Under this organization settings, we will go to the process. Under this process, we can see all the processes listed here. Okay, let it load. So you cannot do any changes for that. You will create the inherited process template. First, then you can do the edits and all over there okay so currently you see i have four you can also see in your organization setting you can also see the four but when you click on the three dots and click on create inherited process it means that i am creating a process which is based on agile okay which is based on agile and now I can do the changes in this. I can do customization, whatever I want. But for that, I need the project to be based on this agile and not on this. I cannot do any changes. I cannot add the field in this. Fine. OK, so that thing uh, like the complete and proper customization. Now I'm going to start the customization part now how we created the custom process template you see, we we saw that right so let me just start with that for that you just need to go to the organization settings which is your this uh, your organization you need to click on the organization settings once I, I, are you at this point then you know hit under the boards go to the process so as i told you that we cannot customize the default process templates these are my default process templates i cannot edit that but i can i can edit the inherited process template if you remember we how we created by clicking on three dots and create an inherited process See, understand with the name create inherited process you all know that inherited means that it is inherited from the parent so this agile is completely based on this the parent one this child is based on this agile uh, process template but in this the uh, ad advantage we got is we can edit this we can do anything customization which i wanted to do so let me show you uh, how to customize these uh, process templates okay so for that i just click on three dots create a new process template okay here i'll just mention the custom process template and i'll name it as agile fine so i'm i'm doing a customization on the this template so for that first i'm gonna create a project which is based on custom process template agile template because then only i will be able to show you that how the customization actually works so let me just quickly create a new project which will be based on the custom process template okay now in the advanced section i'm gonna select the custom process template agile which i selected and this is my inherited this is not a default i created so you can also create from your end so after this just click on create and now you will have a project based on your custom process template that template you can like you can add a new work items up uh, based on your needs like let's suppose you want to add some new work item type which is not mentioned in here so i'll show you here this is my board it's a new project so when you click on new work item we see these so the, these work items are already there by default okay these are already there by default now let's suppose i have a new requirement to add some custom work item which is based on my needs how we do that or let's suppose if i open a bug 
here I wanted to add some more field because of my need requirements. I want to add, let's say, uh, uh, named as like a critical thing, right? I wanted to add, let's suppose I wanted to add a, add a radio button. Uh, let's say, okay. I, I, I wanted to add a radio button which states that this work item is a critical. So how can you add a custom fields in this? Right? So I'm going to show you that now. So if you see, I am just creating a new work item. Uh, test okay so this is my new work item based uh, like bug now i am i am doing a customization i again go to the process template thing this is the page where you can do the customization you need to open this process template custom process template agile okay once this is opened you can add a new work item okay so let me just add a new work item. I'll make it as uh, let's say um, review. If you see here, if you see here, uh, I'll just go back and show you. If you see here, there is no review. There is no review work item, correct? There are no review in the agile custom template. But I wanted to, I wanted to have that thing. Review, uh, let's say okay just fine review that's all and if you want to add a new icon based on your need okay i'll add this the, the, i like this and the color i wanted to add i'll add a black color so i'll just create it so now what happened i created a new work item named as review okay so let me just show you let me just refresh this and this is the same project which is based on custom process template agile which i just now created now if i click on here you can see review is you can we can see now review and if you click here i can create a review work item so rest of the field okay rest of the field is taken as default field okay so this is how i can create a new uh, like the new work item upon my need now let me just add some more fields to it okay uh, to any of it so i go here okay let's do some customization in the bug so i'll just open a bug work item now let's suppose i you wanted to add a new field then click on the new field okay click on new field and here i will um so there are now two things the first thing is you wanted to use some existing field which is presented in entire Azure DevOps process templates. Okay, so there are a lot of things. If you click on the drop down, if you see n number of things are there because these are all the default, default, uh, default things, def default fields which you wanted to use. It's up to you. You wanted to add a default thing or you wanted to add a new, create a new field. So I'll create both. Okay, for that I'll just add new thing which is uh, not presented um, anywhere. Okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. I'll add this one. Okay, uh, I'll add this blocked or okay. Let me add this blocked. No, not blocked. It didn't sound that good changed by okay 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 let me add escalate okay so this is a new work item which you won't see in my process in my work items let me add this field and this will be now added escalate now i don't want to add i will add my custom field right my custom uh, thing new name completely new name so i'll just mention critical right i'll just add it as a critical and i'll select a type like which type it is it is a text field it's a text it's a boolean it's a date or time it's a identity it's an integer it's a quick list so these are the available thing which you can add it okay so uh, i'll i give you an added a boolean thing so boolean means that it's a critical yes or no thing correct so i'll add a boolean as this as a boolean so remember one thing i am doing a customization in bug so these new fields critical escalate will only be presented in the bug 
it will not be presented in any other work items right so now let me show you what i, I was saying so this is my test it's a bug okay it's a bug i created some time back let me go there and here let me just find that critical so if you see critical true or false which i was saying but if you see this this thing will not be available in your environment because this is a custom thing if it's a critical yes yes it's a critical and i need this escalate yes you you want to escalate yes or no that thing, correct so this is my this field is already presented in the azure devops templates in any of the work items maybe in cmmi scrum or anywhere it is it should be presented but i am i can use that field after adding in my process template and this you see critical this again a custom field which we can use in this process template so now let me just duplicate this tab i wanted to show you that these things escalate critical will not be presented in any of the work items because i only did a customization for my bug if i open a review i will not see these things if i scroll down i should not see see i don't have it but let me just customize this also review work item this is my uh, thing okay this is my place i added a new work item type review open this i'll add a new field here let me just add it okay add i can add anything solved solved or not something like that it's up to me of which which thing i wanted to use so i add solved or not and in the uh, thing i'll just add escalate again fine add a field just to show you just to have you give familiarity with it so review um login page something like that i'm just giving a dummy name okay so let me just refresh this so i added the uh, two custom fields in the review see if you see custom field escalate added here yes or no and uh, one more i had it right let me check where it 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 moved so escalate already ca came automatically right so it is not added here okay let me just again add it new field um okay sorry i i did it in one go so that's why sold or not i should do one by one then only it will be there sold or not boolean then add a field now if you see sold or not added now it should be presented in here also so if i refresh this i can see that custom fields so this is how you will add it okay you, you, this is how you will add it uh, the custom fields okay so um, if let's suppose you want to move up see if you see custom is below the description okay custom this thing is below the description custom is my custom fields now if you would like to move custom above the description it's up to you like it's just uh, just kind of um, things some customization thing you want to do right so now it's done okay so now let me just refresh this so now this time custom should be above the description let me just save it and just uh, refresh this page so this time see custom is above the description custom fields so this is how you can customize each and everything in your custom template but if you ask me that if you want to do a customization in your uh, default process template which is not inherited then you can't do these things you can do okay so other thing i would wanted to show you is some uh, th these are the layout things okay other than that you can customize the states also now if you look at here this is my review this is the default state of the agile new active closed okay something like that all these states are presented with the agile template but let's say you want to add a new field you want to add a new state you can do that so um, um, i'll add a new state proposed 
okay and just stay you need to uh, here i mentioned a proposed state and you need to mention what it means what this above category means it is mean a proposed thing in progress state a result completed or removed what this thing mean you need to tell that let's say okay proposed means proposed state so now if you see here i'll refresh this so now proposed should sorry not here i did see i in the bug i should not see this if you see i added a proposed state it will not be there why i'm doing a changes in review work item so i should only see the review thing if now i refresh this it should be there okay so uh, when i see this and uh, if you see proposed now came up okay uh, the question is that can we add the email id to assign task to a user yeah so um, so let's suppose uh, whenever we um, see whenever we adding uh, when whenever we assigning the user okay and when i whenever i saving this so a uh, email should be hitting to that user if you if you click on the settings these these are the notification settings i am currently not subscribed but if you do a subscribe then you will get all the notification on this email id which is assigned to this guy or it let's suppose you want to email some uh, email to some different guy you manager or something then click on the three dots and will give email work item here just add the user which is part of your anything okay add the user and you will be able to send that email but if you are in a subscribe list then always automatically when you do the assignment changes to this guy he will be getting that and if you want to send a custom email send from this email work item yep okay so this is how i can customize the uh, the pro, uh, the states okay so let's suppose i want i'll add some more i'll show you some uh, something okay uh, why it's not resolved something like that uh, we, which anything anything you want to do um uh, right anything you want to do that so just i wanted to show you that you can add any anything so when i click on here and uh, do that you can see that why it's not resolved state also so this is this level of customization you can do okay just a quick info guys test your knowledge of azure by answering this question what are the different cloud deployment models in azure a private cloud b public cloud c hybrid cloud d all the above comment your answer in the comment section below subscribe to intellipad to know the right answer now let's continue with the session in the state states are different than fields remember states are the transition of the work item transition by transition i mean that once first it should be new then proposed then active and then this and then closed so one by one transition means that from one state to another and fields are the things which you are mentioning here okay so now these are the states now let me just go to the rules so you can set the custom rules with with your work items that you wanted to set so let me just show you what custom rules means here let me just create a new rule for you my rules anything you can name it and um condition so these are the rules let's suppose when you are you filling a form right if you don't enter an email id if you don't enter the password it will it will give you the prompt that you should enter the email id okay so these are the rules you can set on the work items that you on some some things needs to be fulfilled okay you you are setting some rules if you are not fulfilling that rules on the work items on this work item review then you will not be able to do activities the maybe creation or all okay so i'll just show you what i'm trying to say so these are the custom uh, these are the predefined things you can use any of it so i'll just use it when a work item is created see i it's again like a select query only right uh, but i am implementing this on the process template when a work item is created 
what which thing you wanted to do okay when a work item is created and the value equals to select a field then uh, like okay okay so escalate so when a work item is created and the value equals to escalate equals to true like equals to yes then what should we need to do then action should be uh, uh, i will just remove i will just do some modification when a work item when a work item state changes from uh, new to proposed okay see i'm adding a logic here that if a new work item is created okay if a if a if a if a state if a state changes from new to proposed and you can if you see that it is escalated in the start in the start only whenever you you created a work item and it's in a proposed state and you see that it is an escalated state then what should happen so action should be what action should you uh, have what action should you need to uh, do that okay so i can um, i can just uh, have any of the action which is listed here so make required make required what the th uh, thing you wanted to um, um, wanted to have a description you should have a description on it if it's an escalated case escalated work item so uh, let me just do that uh, for you when the work item state uh, is uh, escalated is equal to yes and the state is from new to proposed then you should enter a description if you don't enter a description it will not allow you to save it so let me just show you what i am saying here so let me go this uh, discard changes i'll create a new work item it's kind of a um, uh, the rules uh, the 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 pre, uh, the rules to which you wanted to have it in your uh, have it in your uh, the work item so currently it's in new state okay so what our logic states will do like that when the state when the when the value when the value of this field when the value of the field escalate is yes okay we'll make it as yes okay sorry when the value of the escalated is yes okay let me just save it and there are two condition escalated is also yes and the state should be proposed right the state should be proposed then only then only the description is mandatory okay then only the description is mandatory so i will just make it as a proposed state now if you see field description cannot be empty correct because i added this custom thing i added a rule so i need to give a description here then only i will be able to save it but if you see the bug as there are no rules okay there are no rules i am changing the state from uh, currently it's a new state i am changing the state to any of it active i can easily save it no one will question me because i i don't uh, i i have these fields escalate and these things but the thing is i am putting the rules for the review okay here, here let me just show you again if it is a new it allow me to save there is no issues but the thing is it should fulfill the criteria uh, let me just let me just remove this so uh, fine uh, so let me just make it as a no so this was my active state currently it's in new state whenever i am making as a proposed state okay save it so this time it allowed me because i am escalating it's no but if i do escalate yes and then if i try to save it it is allowing me why because uh, because the I, it is already in proposed state but if it's a new state and if i try to now save it okay so the condition is condition is here in the start in the start when you are doing the stuff right in the start if the description is empty then only it will going to prompt us that uh, these rules you need these you are you, you are not fulfilling these rules 
okay okay so uh, the question is can we set rules if task is not completed within a time frame and then mail trigger to manager and new task generated automatically and assigned to another user no these kind of customization is not available because uh, see you can only do the rules okay you can i am just creating a new rule you can do all these stuff which is okay let me just do that okay stay okay so here if you see i can do only the things which is i can only create the rules which is mentioned here you cannot add the rules which you wanted to do that you cannot do that we can only that we can only add these things okay so the requirement which you told us that it is not feasible uh, from these because there is no option to uh, do that but only thing is like we can only achieve which is available here okay so fine so i think you understood that let me just create a very simple thing when a new work item is created uh, then the okay i'm uh, i'm doing one more thing okay make required very simple a very simple rule i'm creating this time okay so this rule states that whenever a work item is created okay whenever a work item is created then i need to required i want to make a required for a description like description should not be empty for review so now let me just go back and go here create a new review okay fine uh, i don't care about the name but i wanted to show you the thing so see currently it states this field description cannot be empty why because i created a rule right so this is how rules you can create this kind of customization you can do so these are the customization of the process templates you can add the fields on your own and do all the uh, stuff uh, which you would like to do okay but only and it can be done in the uh, custom process template if you want it to do in the in in the default process template which is if you see a lock it's a very uh, good thing if you see a lock right lock lock everywhere you see lock but for these you don't see a lock lock means that you cannot do any changes for this project you cannot do any change it's a locked thing so it's a very good thing you can uh, just you cannot add a new work item and you cannot add a new field over here see it is disabled new field is disabled you cannot add a rules if you see it's completely changed new state is also disabled because this process template is locked you cannot edit or change this okay so this is all about i wanted to show you regarding the um uh, process templates customization so now i'm moving forward to the um the uh, which one yeah uh, customization on the boards okay which was left so let me just go back to some project so i'll go to the boards okay so see you, you can create the work item from there so you can add one some more column options by column options i mean this id title assigned to stay currently if you see we don't have a priority you, we don't have a priority thing but let me add a priority from my column options okay so so let me click on okay now i can see a priority i should also see a priority here right in the columns if you see here so there's a column option thing you can do it so now go to we'll go to the boards that's an important thing so here this is how my uh, like work item looks like let me just add some more okay dummy thing i am adding okay i am not adding any any uh, meaningful name because i wanted to show the customization my only motive is to show the customization that's all that's why i am adding just dummy names so these are my uh, some work items okay so now let's suppose i would like to do some customization for customization these this is the team this is a one team i have correct so i am doing i am i am looking the board for this team now again this is a story board this we can have uh, the default we have a default boards for each and every process templates for agile process templates we have three boards i'll show you how to add the third board also but remember is it this is a story board if you if you see the feature it will be empty because i don't have any features fine 
so let me go to the storyboard i am doing changes in my storyboards okay so let me just click on the view option so you can enable or disable that live updates if i off the live updates then whenever i do the changes in the work items it will not do live things okay like uh, it will update where only when you refresh it if i if you disable that so let make it as enable only filter you can add those filter things and all i'm not explaining that much the main part is the settings the customization so this customization you can do in the default also in the custom process template also there is no hard and fast rule on that because it's just a board okay so here so fine uh, these are the my fields okay these are the fields uh, like which field which things you wanted to show currently if you see i can only see the state and the new user story correct if you wanted to show some more things i'll add a field field and i wanted to see the see the priority save and close so if you see the priority or came okay, automatically correct so these kind of customization you can do now let me again click on the settings in the field you can add any number of field and that will be displayed in that styles you can add some styling rules okay um, so by, by styling rules mean that you can select the card or the color of the card so let me just select a red color i li like red so like see fine uh, okay fine um okay okay so it is saying something let me just fulfill that an error is prevented in saving please review the error message before counting you may need to refresh the okay i need to have some here okay 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 let me add some field uh field field which field i wanted to add priority only okay so i'll add a priority anything okay so uh yeah i'll show you when i click on the settings so this this settings the only means for the change in the color okay that's all uh let me just edit that uh fine edit and whenever this is this and priority equals to two see color changes so this will help you to identify let's say it's a critical thing priority two for me it's a critical thing so automatically it will change that so let's say i wanted priority three right so color changes automatically if you see and if i off this live update then it will go away so red means that it's a okay it's a critical thing you need to do it white means that okay fine you if it's not that critical it's already in resolved state right but uh, priorities also matter so with the help of priority and the color you can be do that kind of customization fine with the uh, style tag colors okay so you can add some um, just a quick info guys, if you want to make a career in Azure DevOps, then IntelliPad provides a Microsoft Azure DevOps Engineer Certification Training which is taught by industry experts with more than 10 years of experience. This course is designed to upskill and land your dream job. Now let's continue with the session. Tagging, tag colors here. So, uh, okay, so if you are using a tags okay in the work items if you are adding a tag okay then the color of that tag will appear up here okay not that much important uh, which i think you need to look at so uh, annotation you can uh, see the annotation which you wanted to have it so if you see here annotation means the um, the uh, the icons so if i disable any of it okay if i disable any of it then you won't see the bug or a uh, task uh, here okay you don't see that if i disable that okay it's not that kind of important that's why i'm not pay paying much attention okay these tests so whenever if you if you uh, if you do that this kind of customization it means that whenever uh, whenever a work item is created you need to select a test plan this part i'm not explaining much more we are gonna discuss when we're gonna discuss about azure test plans so what are the columns new active 
resolved closed okay let me just show you new active resolved closed so let me just go to the settings again here if you look at the columns i wanted to add some my custom uh, uh custom uh, column okay uh, uh, this name is dev open and the other part is work in progress limit work in progress limit means that um, uh, you have some limit okay uh, you have some limit so like what kind of limit you wanted to set with the work item so that if i if you set a zero it means that the work item has no limit you can add any labor by labor you mean that if you fill the time sheets and all you can add any number of hours to it okay there is no limit on that but if you adding a limit of five hours five thing or a 10 hours then it will only be taking 10 no no more not more than 10 it will be taking under this column okay under this column let me just leave it to zero now split column into doing and done okay fine so i have created a div open and the other thing is split column into doing and done let me just save and close now i have a div open this is a new column and it has doing and done state two things deeper level of customization now you may ask that um, like when we should use that like doing and then like see it's a very now it's board has become very big big under this column i am having a uh, like the uh, cascading you can say or you can say nested um, nested states these are the nested states which is presented under this column in my board you do you do these kind of customization when your product is very mature okay we don't do these customization we don't add the uh, complexity if you don't have the um, if your project is not mature enough okay so let me show you some other stuff okay so we added a column new column we added but if if you look at this div open and if i remove this split column doing and done and save it then this should go away this doing and done is gone now it's under one because i removed that from the settings okay then go to the columns again i'll just add it div and uh, the doing and done okay okay the next part is swim lane so consider swim lane as a lane or you can say it's kind of a in, in a uh, visualize a pool in the pool you have a different lanes right that is known as a swim lanes likewise consider that it's um it's kind of same thing let me just add it high like high priority okay and then add me a low priority that's all save and close now if you see i have the work item created as in high priority and low priority right so if you see these are my lanes which i have created these are my lanes let me add let me add the work items over here okay so so the and i you can see that if you have any high priority tasks then you will have a more attention to it let me add it here so then you will have a more attention to this uh, thing right because it's in high priority thing and you will do that thing in a much faster pace now if you see that it is showing that two work items in a div open state and one item is an active state so when you click on drop down you can see one is active and two in dev open so it's customization these kind of customization you can do that's the swim lane so swim lanes are a uh, lanes different different lanes for your better visualization see everything is here for your visualization for your ease okay there is no logic written behind that that um, if uh, if uh, like if if it's in a low priority state then you should receive an email or that kind of stuff it will not happen it's only for your visualization okay that's all board is only meant for visualization so you won't get that thing any any kind of uh, the customization at, the, at that level so car reordering it means that how you would like to reorder your card 
if you are putting your card like this it will always go in the middle okay i'm i have selected that let me just show you what i mean here if if i add my work item here okay if i i can add the work item in the below in the in the middle of it in the sandwich right i can add it so let me just add one more so i can add the work item in here but if you do a reordering if you are changing the reordering from this type to the other one there are other thing then it will always end up adding in the top or in the below okay so it's up to you that which recard ordering you would like to use so if i now move my work item let me see that so it is not allowing me to see in the middle it, it will only go in the end or or in the up right so if you try try to add it uh, let's say here let me just show you again if you try to add it in the middle right it is not moving up it is not moving up it will always go down right so that's how it works the re reordering of your work item so the default one is this fine um, status badge okay so the status badge is something okay uh, i'll show you okay status badge is like this kind of badge it will come under your azure repos i haven't covered that azure repos but let me just show you how it will look like okay just for having a view of it so let me just uh, okay go to here and let me just open the repos because everything is interlinked right so sometime i have to uh, jump into some other thing which you haven't uh, so so what are the repos and all i'm going to explain you but for this concept only i wanted to show you what badge means so badge means that this is a this is a badge okay what it means that in the div open i can see five work items in the active at zero in the resolved at zero i have copied this okay i have copied this uh, this some uh, this code or something markdown thing okay i just copied this and save and close so now now if you see i have four items or you can say five work items in my div open if you see in the div open i have five this is my column name in active i have zero in resolved i have zero you remember i just copied something right so let me just paste it and commit in my repository so now if you see this is my repository the badge is coming like this if you see my screen right so the badge will come like this this is how bigger companies make use of the things which will help help them to achieve better see if you are putting a badge like this and uh, when i when i click on this badge it will redirect me to that board the board which i was working on so this is how you can create a status badge under your repositories because in repositories also if you if you have a requirement then you can put that badge over there also okay now the uh, now the other part is the boards you remember we only have these two boards features and stories if i click on features you will find empty there is nothing in it if i go to the stories i will see many because i have this is my storyboard and i am doing the work in my storyboard only okay so let me go to the settings again and under the settings i will go to the backlogs and click on epic it so there are three boards you can have epics features and stories now i can see the epics also in my drop down so this is how you can do that like if you want to uh, add a board based on the epic or based on the features or you want to disable that you can do it from here okay you can do it from here under the backlogs now working days so the working days are very important while creating the charts okay the burn down charts and all that those charts we're going to discuss that uh, you mean uh, currently you, you say that all the reports the reports is very necessary 
and that reports is based on the working days so i'll give you an example so let's say an engineer works eight hours a day okay monday to friday eight into five is 40 hours so he has to work 40 hours uh, in in the time sheet and all in the work items right in the work items he has to burn 40 hours but let's suppose by mistake if you make it as saturday and sunday also a working day but if the engineer is working only a five days then your reports managers and all will only rely on the reports your report will completely give a bad impression because there is a 56 hours of work given and he is only doing a 40 hours so that is very important uh, the charts will be based on the working days okay the like uh, how many hours the engineer is working so it's a four day working company then you'll disable that okay now in the other thing is working with bugs so <clears throat> currently i am uh, i am having a bugs are managed with tasks so if you if you use bugs are not managed with boards then I'll show you. I'll show you what what I mean to say here. Okay, let me just show you here what I'm trying to say here. Uh, I'll clear, okay. The bug should be here. So okay. So so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, let me just show you. So, and now I go to the boards. Okay, and go to the settings. Working with bugs. Yeah. We have a question that um, uh, click user stories and click it so you can create uh, bugs for user stories. Okay. Okay, so here, um, when I go to the settings, Click on the working with bugs and when I uh, when I click on uh, bugs are managed with the requirement and if bugs are not managed with backlogs and boards if I click on that then the bugs which I am seeing like which which is presented in the board will not be coming up in the board but if you see if you if you select some other settings right working with bugs means that you want the bugs should be appearing up in the boards or not that it's what meant if you select bugs are managed with requirements and then save and close then like it only means that see now the bugs are coming up if you see on the left the bugs are now coming up i have two bugs but if you can um, it means it only means that you want the bugs to be coming up in your board or not currently you see two bugs right you see this bug and this bug now if i go to the settings and change some of the settings here working with bugs you don't want to work you don't want to work with bugs uh, okay you don't want to work with bugs so i'll select bugs are not managed so the bugs will go away from here once it is refreshed because you don't want the use you want you don't want the user story should be coming up with the bugs okay so this level of customization you can do on your project i'll show you how some uh, like bigger projects will look like i have some um, bigger thing uh, like one one project um, which is under this so if you are uh, like working in some bigger project so then if you do the customization so it will be very easy to visualize things right it will be very easy to visualize things and it will look like something like this it's a very big board right so many things are mentioned here so many things are mentioned in the medium priority high priority correct so all uh, these things will be lying up here uh, right so just a quick info guys test your knowledge of devops by answering this question which of the following are the popular tools for devops a jenkins b ansible C. Nagios. D. All of the above. Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to IntelliPack to know the right answer. Now let's continue with the session. If you are working like uh, in the bigger bigger thing, so it will be very helpful. This board, these boards, these things will be very helpful for you. 
to uh, to do things and move here and there easily fine so this this customization you can do now let me click on view as backlogs board part, part is completely done the customization part now i have a backlog as i told you backlogs is exactly the same thing as board it's only how you want to visualize things everything else is exactly same now if you see the boards likewise you see uh, we have epic uh, features and story likewise you see in the uh, boards we have these three things in the backlogs also we have these three things it will be empty as it's in the boards also we don't see any uh, board for the epic so the rest everything is similar uh, the uh, live updates and all okay so uh, it is all the, the you wanted to show the parents okay so parents will be listed like this by parent i mean that um, if you recall that we created a work item under that we created some some uh, the child of it so i'll show you what i'm trying to say here if you add a work item existing work item as a child and uh, bug and save it okay so this user story 18 18 user story is my parent and this six user story is a child so what i'm trying to say here is in this if you make it as a parent on right so it will if you make it as an on then parent hierarchy parent and child hierarchy will be showing up okay not here Parent and hierarchy will be showing up, right? Uh, parent and un, uh, these things will be showing up. It's a parent thing, and under that only it will be uh, there. These are all unparented things. Means there is no parent assigned for these stories. If there is a parent, then uh, it will be listing up here, right? Okay. Then filter and all. It's again the same thing. You can add the filter. Okay, not that important. Click on settings. So. You remember that I showed you these things. If you disable that epic and feature, then the backlogs for epic and features will be gone. Working days is similar than the previously, which I explained you, and working with works is also the similar. So, why everything is same in the boards and backlogs? Because boards and backlogs, it's the same concept. The only difference is how you would like to visualize things. That's all okay so uh, that's the backlogs now the sprint that sprint is a filtered view and one more thing sorry to I, okay the sprints sprints i told you that it's a filtered way filtered uh, filtered form of work items based on the dates right you can set the dates and you need to do the work based on that date sprints are that and uh, just give me a minute and one important concept I which we didn't discuss is area and iteration bar. Okay, so the sprint is you should be knowing that. Okay, the sprint is the filtered way, filtered view, filtered view of, of listing work items. This is again a board, but this board will be based on my date set. If you set 1st January to 15th January, then all the work items which is created or like uh, which is created in these times will be showing up if, if i click on here so all the work items will which which is created in this period of time and all which i have to do work on this period of time this two weeks then only this board will be uh, showing up only those things okay now i wanted to show you area and iteration part okay it's a very confusing and important thing too what area and iteration path meant is uh, it, it's again it's again a filtered filter it's again a putting a filter with your work items so what uh, what we mean by that is if you see my project name is agile project and if you see the area is agile project also so so by this what i meant is area is something which work item is assigned to it's kind of a path 
um do not do not confuse with some kind of uh, c drive path or some some that kind of path it's just a way of saying that uh, it's just a way of filtering things i'll show you what i'm trying to say here okay okay in the queries i just move to the queries just to show you an example okay add a new clause area path under agile project and then run the query so see if you are working in a team where you have thousands of work items even ten thousands of work items so it will be very difficult to have a filtered view of those work items so due to this reason we have a concept called area and iteration path generally area path is that path which is based on this complete project okay and iteration path you can say it's a sub area path you can say it's it's um, under that area path under that area path there will be an iteration path and iteration path is that part um, like okay I'll, I'll just explain you here so if you see iteration 1 iteration 2 iteration 3 now let me go back to my sprints again um, for this um, agile project i'll go to the sprints okay so under this sprint i have these dates uh, january 1 to this so let me just refresh this so you can understand like this area is your parent path and iteration is your child path which is again after the like if you see the area path is agile project and the iteration is agile project slash iteration one it means that uh, iteration is under the agile uh, is under this path area path okay so if you see i have set the dates for iteration one that is first to 15th of jan so i'm selecting this here if you select some other iteration path uh, uh, other iteration path let me just add that to okay in the iteration 2 i will set the dates from uh, 16th to yeah 30 okay now let me just refresh this page yeah so here if I, if I scroll down so if you see if i assign this iteration one it means that i have to complete this work under this period of time if you select this it means that you need to complete this thing under this uh, like 16th to 30th period of time so what it will have what i am achieving i am achieving the uh, the filtered view of my work items in the queries so now i'll go to the query if I am setting an area path is this and my iteration path iteration path is let's suppose um, iteration 2 and then let, let, let me just run the query okay so if you see this work item number 18 is listed up why because in the in this I have set this iteration path 2 if I set an iteration path 1 then it will not list that it will not list that now it will go away so very good question and it's a very valid question that what is the difference between iteration and sprint it's exactly the same thing there is only one minute difference between area and iteration path so you the difference is you cannot query the work items based on the sprint okay with the iteration path see sprints is also the filtered view like um, the weeks filtered by weeks it's sprint and same as iteration iteration is also the filtered view like uh, you can say uh, separated by the weeks uh, you can set the dates for the work items it's the definition is same for sprints and iteration but the thing is you cannot filter the you cannot filter the work items based on the sprints sprints is just a terminology which is uh, having uh, which is presented in here and you'll have 
boards the sprint is like kind of a board and the sprint is not just a board okay I, i'm defining in here in the azure boards sprints is basically a filtered view based on the dates okay let's say in a two weeks i'm setting the work items this iteration path is also the same meaning but you cannot query the work items things based on the sprints but you can query based on the iteration path okay so that's the only difference nothing is there nothing more thing is there now if you want to set some custom iteration and custom area paths then how to do that i'm going to show you now so now what i'm showing here is the um, okay uh, what i'm show i wanted to show is the uh, how to set the area and iteration path okay go I will now go to the project settings. Okay, not organization. I will go to the project settings. Then I will go to the. I will go to the boards. Okay, so I click on project configuration. So in that configuration, I can add a new child under my um, uh, under my area path. See, if I add a new, let me uh, name it as new sprint. See, sprint cannot be queried. But iteration can be okay, so that's the only difference. Definition-wise, it's exactly the same thing. Okay, we have one question that then why we need to use sprint if that thing we can do in iteration? Any real example? So, see, sprint is something which we adopted from agile methodology. In bigger companies, we I'll give you a real example that in bigger companies we when a project comes, okay. we have a psi planning that is in this we will be discussing the complete whole bigger project i'll give you an example of my previous organization in the psi planning what we used to do when very big project comes which is of 2.5 months that in that psi planning we have 2.5 months now for that 2.5 months we used to break that things based on the sprints like 2 to 2 weeks after 2 weeks we will give demos to our clients after 2 weeks then 2 weeks then 2 weeks then 2 weeks then 2 weeks this is how it will work and one after one psi is over we'll give a bigger demo combining all the sprints so why we are using sprint share here why we cannot survive with iteration because sprint is a term defined under the agile methodology which we cannot just simply uh, don't use we just cannot avoid that because sprint is uh, is in the industry for so long and we have to use iteration paths why in order to have the filter because sprint is something different little very little different thing because you cannot filter the work items based on the iterate uh, based on the uh, sprints because sprint is just a you can say uh, the 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 number of weeks and in the two weeks you have to do but iteration is something which you are explicitly defining in your team um yeah, like i'll just show you here okay this is my sprint uh, this is my work item under that you see i am tagging or you can say i am assigning this work item under this period of time that is in this two weeks i have to do this is again a similar thing to the sprints but you cannot simply query with the sprints and sprint is being used uh, in the agile methodology correct right? so yeah sprint is just a way of saying okay uh, sprint we don't say that i have an iteration path we don't say that if 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 you are talking verbally like in your team if you don't say that okay i have to complete this work item in this iteration path we don't say that we only say that i have to complete this work item in this sprint sprint is a two week thing but i we don't say that i i will complete this bug or this issue in this in this iteration path iteration path is just a way of telling the way of defining or you can say way of telling the work item that uh, i am tagging this particular area path or, or iteration path to this work item 
that's all it meant so sprint is just a way of saying and it's it's taken up from previously from the agile methodology so due to this reason okay so i was uh, doing here so if you see this i added a new iteration bar and if you if you if we refresh this i can see this new sprint right new sprint i can see that okay so if if you want to add a uh, okay this is we did this we did and if you click on the areas see i cannot i cannot uh, like um, add or edit the area path because area path is based on this particular project it's area path can only be one but iteration is a like um, thank you rajesh and uh, and iteration path is we can add any number of time but area path is only one because you are working on this project under this project you have this area path okay by area path means that why we are setting simple in a layman terms why we set area and iteration path just to have a filtered things see we are just working in 500 uh, 10 20 work items in bigger companies you see there are tens of thousands of work items so it's not easy to um like it's not easy to just have a filter like on this period of dates i need to do so many work items so due to that area and iteration is very necessary thing so you can you can you can add a child one under this area path okay my i'll just show you my new area save and close now if i go here and just refresh this see i added a new area path but that is again under the um let me just show you that is again under the uh, main area path that is main under this you have this child my new area path you if you want to add a new area path that can only be added under this complete area path okay so under this agile project you may have a different different teams right team 1 team 2 team 3 so to put a filter you can add you can show the team 1 team 2 team 3 and then under this team 1 you can you can set the multiple iteration paths you you are getting what i'm saying so how they how companies work is under this this will always be same the first one will always be same and the second will be team 1 team 2 team 3 team 4 okay in the iteration will mention that um, under this agile project what is the sprint sprint 1 sprint 2 sprint 3 or iteration 1 iteration 2 iteration 3 that's how it works in the companies okay so now let me just go to the team configuration and um, because azure board is exactly the similar with jira or you can say trello trello is again similar to this azure board so mostly it's similar okay some new tune things will be there for uh, different different products right team configuration so these things okay it's again the similar thing backlogs working days working with bugs all th these three things are same i'm not going to explain that because it's exactly the same iteration uh, you can you can add um, you can add a new iteration okay new iteration part which we did that sometime back here so there are multiple places to add the iteration this is again a same uh, like uh, you see that we saw that how to add the uh, iteration under the sprints right under the sprints also we can add the sprint under this uh, page i can add a new sprint right it's nothing but a new iteration only i can add the new iteration from here also right so it's a multiple multiple ways to add that the in the end the end goal is same area again it's the same thing we we see that how to add the area under the project configuration same thing they have given in the team configuration also like if you want to do that you can add the same thing okay same thing now templates so these are the work item templates which i how to create a template for a work item so this template can be used again and again and this is the same thing i'll just show you quickly
the template of the work item here if you see yeah templates capture okay if you see here this is the same template which we okay 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 i will team and then save it so there's the same process template which we have and i copy the i can copy the url okay so this is the same uh, same place for um, seeing the templates for the uh, like like work work item okay like if i create a new template it's again the same thing i can select the new template okay and save it so this will be again i got a same uh, copy url right so it's a same template and if you see in the task um, user story i just now created the ldm uh, template so it's the same uh, template thing and you can use this template again and again if uh, if you you just need to like uh, copy link and just open this thing here and a new a new template will be open for this work item to work to create a new work item like that okay see uh, yeah so i go to the project settings discard changes yeah i'll go to the project settings so under this project configuration we have this area path okay so this is particularly uh, you can say you can say this is absolutely a similar thing if you want to add a new child i can add a new child i can save and close under the area if you go to the team configuration we again have the area we again have the areas let it refresh okay so uh, this is again the same thing but the only difference is you can only like yeah we, we can only create the child or no doubt for that but this is explicitly for um uh, like for um, the particular team okay this team particular this team we are working for for this team okay so um fine so if you see there is no team here correct because i am working at the project level but if you would like to have the area path for some particular team don't confuse both meant the same thing it's just a way of saying okay both area path if you are creating a new area path then also you can see this area path under your work items okay if you are creating the uh, new area path under this project then also you will be able to see the only difference is you can here you are creating for the project okay so but here you are creating for some particular team this area path right uh, yeah you are creating for some particular team that's the only difference okay so uh, uh like i'm gonna show you trello only okay so for that um that how to integrate azure dev devops or you can say azure boat with the trello so what is trello why it is used you don't need to uh, worry about that so just you need to understand that trello is a tool which is exactly similar as your boards as is your words that's all you don't you need to understand that this thing so previously companies uh, were using the trello a lot okay bigger companies are using a trello a lot when azure devops is not in uh, like released so companies were using trello to store the work items to view the boards and all those stuff now see azure azure devops has all the functionalities pipelines and all these stuff it's integrated with each and everything so now when the integration happens with the trello and azure devops then all the work items which is present in, in trello or in azure devops can be interlinked what i mean by interlinked is if i create a work item in azure devops then it will be created automatically in trello if we make us connections okay as i said trello is similar as azure boards we'll see a work item over there we'll see boards over there everything area and iteration path everything is we can see so now the scenario is simple let's say if companies were previously is on trello they have thousands tens of thousands of work item will not be easy for them to migrate to azure devops and they not they may not be willing to so if we integrate with azure devops in trello 
or Azure DevOps and Jira if you if you're working on Jira then you don't need to move that okay you do not need to move that everything is synced between these two platforms so now I'm going to show you that how to do that for that we'll go click on the project settings and uh, then I will be opening up service books so if you don't in the um, github we have a term called webhooks if you don't know i'll explain you what service hooks and what webhooks is means both mean the same thing it means that whenever you perform a action a trigger should like a trigger should be uh, uh, like whenever well, sorry whenever a trigger is performed whenever a thing is performed a uh, action anything anything should be uh, implemented okay so i'm going to show you now how to do that i click on plus icon so these all many web uh, service hooks you can create but service hooks i mean that whenever i do some changes in my azure devops the same thing the trigger is being triggered on the third party platform too okay for now i'm using trello so if if I go to the Trello, where is that? Yeah, this is a Trello. Okay, I'll click on next. When a work item is created, when a work item is created, area path any any fine. Next. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here, like whenever oh uh, here see in Trello we call it as a card. Okay, in here we call it a work item. That's all. So whenever a work item is being created in azure boards it will automatically be created in trello so that's the lab for this i i need to set up the i need to set up the connections for that you should have a trello account okay for this thing so it's free only okay it's free only if you don't have no worries you can just look at it so i'll first uh, click on get it now because you need a token a authentication between these two things okay so I'll click on get it now and it should redirect me to the Trello website. So it is asking me to authenticate. So once you do all the authentication, will, um, it will ask you like in the end, it will ask you that uh, to allow or deny. I will say an allow. So this is my token generated. Okay. So you just need to have a Trello account. Once you have that Trello account, okay, uh, what you need to do? Uh, it is oh sorry it is there only so once you you just need to click on get it now provide the credential and it will generate a token for you automatically you don't need to do anything i'll just paste this token over there okay i'll paste this token over there and side by side i'll open my trello account also my trello account is opening so once it is open i'll show you how it will look so if you look at it so it's exactly the same thing right the cards and all trello it's exactly the same thing correct it's exactly the same so previously companies are using this trello a lot so it's not easy for them to move in a single day so just a quick info guys if you want to make a career in azure devops then intellipad provides a microsoft azure devops engineer certification training which is taught by industry experts with more than 10 years of experience this course is designed to upskill and land your dream job now let's continue with the session that's why we like like uh, you can integrate okay you can integrate it um, with uh, this okay so Fine. So what I was trying to sh uh, show you here that I am I did authentication. I provide the authentication. This is my board. Like I showed you, there are different different kind of boards. Just a quick info, guys. Test your knowledge of Azure by answering this question. What are the different cloud deployment models in Azure? A. Private cloud. B. Public cloud. C. Hybrid cloud. D all the above. Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to Intellipad to know the right answer. Now let's continue with the session. So I am making changes like if I do anything um, in my Azure DevOps, uh, like uh, Azure boards, I create a work item or anything that work item should be created in the Trello thing. That is my main goal, right? So 
I I was working. I'm I'll work with this demo one board. If you see here, my board name is my board name is Dev DevOps. So I will select that Dev DevOps because I'm working with that. Okay, so let me just test the connections. It is testing and it is succeeded. Okay, let me just close that and finish this connection. So if you see this last one is added just now. Okay, it added just now. Um, so whenever I create a work item, then it should be created in the Trello. Fine. So that's my goal here. So I will go to my work items and I'll create one work item. Let me just create it. I make it as January 10th. That's all. Save it. So once I save it, I'll go to my this board. And if I go in the end, okay, if you see this one, this name is January 10th. It, it is just now I created, right? So this is how I can integrate with Trello and Azure boards. Or you can integrate with Jira like this way only. Okay, so this is a very easy way to do that. Uh, first, what I did, I first do an authentication using the web hooks or oh, sorry, service hooks. I'll go, I have go, I gone to the service hooks. I created a token. Okay, I created a new token and I'll mention the action that what action I need to do in the Trello. You click on next when, a, uh, when, a, like, uh, my name thing is when a new work item is created. Area path any any click on next. I provided the token, right? Like this is the action which it is performing. Create a card. You need to create a card. Like when a work item is created, a card or a work item should be created automatically under this board. The exact board I'm saying. Okay. And then um, like test and then finish. Okay, finish. That's all I did. Once I do that, you will see one more entry over here. And when you create a new work item, when you create a new work item over here, okay, then it should be reflecting over there. Like, let me just name it as uh, Jan 11th, something like that. Okay, Jan 11th. So Jan 11th should now be reflecting over here in the end. So if not, let me just refresh this. So this is how easy it is to integrate DevOps to the any third party tools. OK, so I create some January 11 thing. So it should be there. See January 11. If you see here this is January 11, right? So this is how easy it is integration with Trello and Azure DevOps. So this is a concept of web hooks or uh, service hooks also that whenever you are saying anything to perform some action. Then that action will be implemented or performed in the next third party tool. So if you click see there are a lot of things a lot of things if you would like to use any of that stuff right if you like anything there are a lot of slack my get office it is jenkins so whenever a build completed you want that build to be reflected in the jenkins too all those stuffs can be uh, can be completed okay fine so now let me move to the repos part so First, we're going to discuss what is Azure Repos. Azure Repos is a set of version control tool that where you are like where your code will lie in. This is a place where you will check in your code. This is a place where you upload your code. This is a place where you commit your code. Okay. And it will maintain a version control. As we said, Azure Repos is like um, Azure Repos has two version control, either Git or TFVC team foundation version control. You can choose any of it. Okay, version control is a system or software that help you track the changes that you make in your code over time. Okay, like to have to track the codes which we are checking in in your code. We discussed an example that today if I do a check in one tomorrow, I'll do a check in two after day after that. I'll do a check in number three and if that check in number three uh, break my build then I will roll back to check in number two, uh, right? So uh, like the same way you have Android apps, like sometimes some of the companies may release a buggy version. So you may encounter some issues. So they will roll back to the previous version. So 
that's how version control important for us so so version control help you stay organized as you fix the bugs and develop new features version control helps you to keep history and track of each and everything which you are uh, doing and helps you to roll back things so fine so this azure azure repo is the place your code repository lives in with multiple branches this is a thing which you will see when you open the azure repos file commit pushes branches tags and pull requests out of these pull request is a very important thing uh, other than that above things it's like okay okay like you will be able to digest easily but pull request is a thing which we need to make pay much more attention what are the version control we already discussed the version control and the differences between git and tfvc i have already told that git is a distributed version control and tfvc is a um, uh, centralized version control in git uh, like in git um, like uh, by uh, by centralized okay by by uh, by by distributed i mean that every developer has their own version control system and tfvc it's a centralized repository meaning that tfs systems have their own sql and that sql will store all the check-ins developer will not have their own version control system on their environments that's the difference between that git is an open source tfvc is an paid one okay so that's the like basic difference between git and tfvc will directly switch to the lab because that's the place where you will be gaining more knowledge okay so this is my organization okay this is your organization let me open any of the project now we learned about azure boards now i'm going to dig into the repos this is how your repos will look like if you open in your environment it will look like this right so if now if you would like to import the repository from github or anywhere okay where your code resides then we need to import our repository to import the repository just click on this drop down and click on import repository once you do that you will have a two option tfvc and git git like i need to provide a github url and after the authentication it will be um, taking it will be importing my repository but if you select tfvc you need to define your local path something like this dollar uh, your path okay this path you need to define and then it will be uh, taking from your local from your laptop for now i'm just showing you a git repository how to import that okay so i'll be providing my github url okay let me just open that my github um, repository okay and i will be cloning it um any of it uh, uh let me just do it uh, this one okay so this is my repository new repo fine this is my very simple and basic repository i'll just put it this name i'll say yes it requires authentication I will provide my credentials. Okay, I just provided that and click on import. First, it will authenticate. Okay, after authentication, it will be uh, uh, it will be just uh, rem uh, like doing that. So it says that either my uh, like uh, like uh, this uh, URL is incorrect or the clone URL requires the authentication. Okay. So I will provide my then G I'll let, uh, I'm just so i'll show you again so this is how importing will work and import is successful and now all the files which is presented in my github is showing here i haven't choose very bigger like the longer um, longer files because uh, then it will be um, like uh, it will take some time so due to this reason i have taken very small repository i'll show you again how i did that i'll go here click on import repository then I will just provide the URL and this URL don't require an authentication. Okay, click on import and okay, it says that it's already there. No worries. We'll, uh, we'll just 
make it a new name and then we'll do that new repository and git repo import um fine i'll just use some different repository okay okay here i will select some this demo one and i will go there and put the url and import it that's all you need to do once it is imported you will have all the repository from github to this page to this azure repos and then you can you are free to do the check-ins you are free to do come like anything you want to do okay test it uh, build the code anything you want to do you can do it you're free to use that okay so all the things which is presented over there all automatically came up here okay so this is how easy and simple it is to import that repository and if you want to create a new repository just click on new and uh, like new like new repo and then click on create the, the repository the new repository will be created like this fine so this is how we can create a new repository and this is how we can import the repository so this is my repository if i click on history so if you see all the changes which i've done in the past will be listed up so it means that it it is cloning with the history and it's not like that that only the code is coming up history is all coming up with the um with the repository okay so everything is coming up so we don't need to worry about that history is not coming up everything is coming up from there okay so this is how we can import the repositories okay so we will learn that how to import that now now it is it should be clear right how to import that uh, repository so so these the thing which you saw is these are the files okay these are the files okay uh, we have one question that is an any option that we don't want in history yes there is an option that if you don't want in history then also it will be possible i think yeah it will be possible it's not a big task but yeah it should be possible that if you don't want in history currently in here i'm not seeing it but i'm 100 percent sure there will be an op uh, there, there is a there should be some way if you don't want the history then also it will be possible fine so i was showing that okay so yeah I, so these are the files okay under which you uh, like these, these are if you can do the commits and all like i'll open this thing edit this and just added those changes and do a commit okay so let me do the commit so uh, the question from Rafiq is that how we can integrate Visual Studio to Azure DevOps in order to work with repository? Yes, that is all also included in this Azure repos. How to link the Visual Studio with the Azure repos later? Not today, but later it is already there. Okay, because first we'll understand all the concepts. Then we're gonna see that. Uh, okay, so I'll show you that uh, demo also. Okay, uh, we have I have in the PPT also because that's an important thing. So if you see Rafiq that this is uh, the demo, okay? So I showed you that how we can commit that. Now in this in this thing, I'm just showing you how to do a commit to from the Visual Studio, okay? I'll just play this small clip. If you see that how we can uh, do that commit. So first we will stage it and then we will do a check-in, like we'll just add it into the stage area and then we'll do the, uh, we'll do a, commit to that stage in that stage fine i'll show you again in the visual studio what i'm doing here i'm staging it and then adding it to some stage providing the command and then doing it stage okay so this is how i will do it the commit in the visual studio so this, this is how we do it from the visual studio but from here it's very easy right like just edit this and uh, do that and it is checked in that's all that's all we need to do but in the visual studio we need to just uh, add into the staging area and then do the commit that's all okay so commits is nothing but uh, the check-ins which we are doing in the uh, code okay okay so now we have a concept named as branches so branches we're going to discuss why we create branches okay see if you see this master branch 
remember don't confuse with master and main branch both is the same thing some companies use master some companies use main branch so both is the same so that main and master branches that main and master branches are the branch where your life code from from where your life code will be deploying in okay from where your production uh, like the deployment will happen from the production to the production environment from the main branch only or a master branch so i will create a different different branch from here you can create a different different branch new branch dev branch okay and it is based on a master my dev branch is based on a master so the concept says that i now have a dev branch that is i will check in the code in the dev and dev branch deploy the changes to my dev environment if everything is fine then i will merge it to then i will merge this dev branch to the master branch so i i will not take a risk to test in my master branch i will cut a branch here what i did i cut a branch right i cut a branch new branch which will is based on a master okay which is based on a master and i name it as let's suppose i'll name it as this time uat branch or a qa branch then i will test that thing okay then i will test test that thing uh, my qa branch and everything is fine then i will merge that thing to my master branch merging and all that comes under pr pull request we will alert that thing later so this is not at all this this is not the uh, only thing in the branch we have lot of other things i just explained you a very basic thing branching strategies for now i am just giving you an explanation briefings okay this this is the branch right you understand what branches are now the next thing is branch policies so branch policies will help your teams to protect the branches see why we create policies if you work on azure we have azure policies if you work on any of the environment uh, in your organization we create some policies or set of rules based on that uh, team has to work on i can create some branch policies by branch policies i mean to say that you cannot do a check in without a approval okay you can set those kind of branch policies based on your needs that you know look but branch policies is like you can protect your branch by adding some policies okay put some reviewers or like then only you can do the check ins or um let's say um, like three three uh, three managers should approve your check in then only you will check in or a code review should happen something like a lot of stuffs so branches we have like hotfix branch by hotfix branch i mean that um, let's suppose um you develop a code and everything went fine and some bug is some bug is there so we have to fix that thing what developer used to do they will create a hotfix branch in the in your repo they will they will just create quickly they will just quickly create a they will just quickly create a new branch name it as hotfix they will just test that thing uh, they will just test that uh, uh, branch okay they will just test that code and then check in or you can say merge it the other branch is feature branch we can create a feature branch okay um, uh, like feature branch when you are developing new things so these are the couple of branches we have you can have uh, some um, like feature branch uh, hotfix branches or uh, early release branches so these are all the branches we have um, which we can have okay managing a devops project using azure devops so first thing you can see here creating an azure devops organization azure devops project integrating github with azure devops project and azure boards and then creating a ci cd pipeline for an ang angular application so build staging and production i'll be having three stages one will be build and after build 
it will be stored in an artifact i'll be using that artifact to create two stages one will be qa first i'll deploy it on a qa server so i'll be able to view the website how it looks before i change anything else so once it is successful in the qa server uh, then it moves on to production server but in the production server only after approving uh, it it will start the deployment in the production server so you can set it up like that and also you can use uh, azure test and feedback tool to identify create workbook and also we'll be doing manual testing using azure test plans okay uh, after that so i'll be creating a dashboard using multiple widgets to monitor our devops project so let us begin with the demo and before beginning with the demo i'll show how uh, the architecture will look so this is that so i'll have my angular application in my local machine i'll be editing my code in visual studio code so whenever i push it to the github repo and my build should start and it should deploy in the qa server after that i'll check and my i'll check my qa server i'll do some testing on the qa server i'll be doing some exploratory tests and do some manual tests and after doing that if everything is all right i'll be approving the deployment and uh, the production uh, deployment starts and also i'll be uh, connecting github with my azure boards so whenever i do some changes and i create a pull request the active uh, work item will go to closed so automatic that happens automatically so when you resolve something it will automatically move to closed without doing anything coming back to this slide what we are going to do is we'll be starting with logging into the azure devops account after logging into the azure devops account we'll be creating an organization and then we'll create a project inside that so first let us do that and come back to the next step. so first i'll go to my uh, browser so normally if i'm logged in when i type this i'll be taken directly to my azure devops console but right now as i'm not logged in uh, so I'm logged into my Microsoft account, so I'm signing out. Now, if I type the same again, I'm not logged in right now. So let me show you the process of how to log in to Azure DevOps. So you can start free, or you can go with GitHub. You can give your GitHub credentials and move on. Or if you already have an account, you can just sign in over here. So let me start free. So as I started free, I was already in my account, so I came inside. So if you're not signed into your Azure DevOps uh, account, if you want to create a new Azure DevOps account, you don't need to do anything. It will ask for your Microsoft uh, credentials. You just have to enter the email address and the password. Then you will be uh, taken to your Azure DevOps account. So inside Azure DevOps account, then you can create an organization and you can start off with your work. So that is simple sign in process. So I think you'll be able to take care of that. So right now let us start off with the basic. So the first thing is creating an organization. So what is an organization? For example, you work in a company who has mobile applications and web applications. So what do you want in your organization? You want to manage all the applications in a single place. You don't want multiple places. Uh, you just want one single console on which you can see all the projects which our company is doing or done or it is under execution, whatever it is, it has to be in the same place and you you should be able to click on them, uh, view their uh, statistics, uh, view the work items, view what are the pipelines available, everything. So for that, we can create an organization. So I'll be creating my organization. When I clicked on your organization, I got this page. So it's pretty simple. Just click on it, check it out and then continue. So after that, you will have to provide your DevOps organization a name. So I, this DevOps organization name should be unique. So if it's not unique, it will show an error. So it should be unique. So I'll give it as uh, IntelliPad Organi. So this is going to be my name now. So dev.azure.com slash IntelliPad Organization. If I type this, I'll be able to redirect to my Azure DevOps console and I'll be in this URL. So also you can host your projects in multiple regions. Uh, as I'm in South India, I'm choosing South India. So continue. Now it takes me to my Azure DevOps console. So after the organization creates, it will automatically prompt you a project creation dashboard. It's not a dashboard, it's embedded with the website. But once I'm in, you can see create a project to get started because after creating an organization, you need a project to work on. So you can create a project. 
so there are two options either private or public i know what that means for example a github public repository or a private repository private will be only available for people who you give access to public is available for anyone uh, for example open source projects so i'm going to give a name here first i'll make it private i want it to be private and i want to give it a name so i'm going to give it a name as intel fat angular project so as i told you i'm going to just uh, launch my angular application over here my angular application is nothing when i when we create a new angular uh, app so it will give you a default web page so that is going to be my application for now but i wanted to show how to use that and create a devops life cycle for that so yeah so i'm creating this project so that is uh, that simple so i'll just give a brief about this console overview this is the summary when a few activities have been happened you can check them over here and then you can create dashboards there are so many widgets available this is used for monitoring uh, for example you have hundreds of tasks so you can see how many has been completed how many is uh, going on how many has been done so you can add uh, accordingly you can add widgets accordingly and then comes boards boards is nothing but a place to schedule your work and you can track your work you can see uh, what work is being done which is uh, under execution which is under which is completed also you can i'll show this so you can come over here in columns and you can add columns for example to do doing and done so instead new uh, uh, active resolved closed so you can give anything you want and then these are some other stuff which i explained to you backlog sprints and queries i am not going to explain them again and repos repos is the same uh, we all know that microsoft bought github so they built azure repos using the same infrastructure as github so it is this same but uh, you can use it in a single console that is the benefit and then pipelines it's a ci cd pipeline and then test plans and artifacts test plans you can see right now you will not be able to use it uh, you can install actually a test and feedback tool which is in chrome extension which i have installed already and i have done some work with it so so that is okay that i'll explain later that is an exploratory test tool and then when we create tests test cases in boards it will be available over here and we can do manual testing using that and then artifacts artifacts is mainly like a package manager you can store your private packages from your uh, local system over here and use these packages instead of going to the public source but right now i'm going to use the public source i'm not going to use artifacts so you can create a new feed and you can use this for example i am just giving uh, my new feed and only for the people in my organization and it takes from public sources only use public uh, packages published to this feed but if you use this artifact it will only use uh, packages which are applied to this feed so if i upload a few only few packages to this and in my pipeline i want to use another package but i'm using this feed then it will not work you will have to uh, add all the packages to this particular artifact in order to it to work in your pipeline so i'll just use packages from public sources to through this feed and i'm creating it and that's it uh, you don't need to do anything so this connect to feed you can check over here you can use these uh, stuff you can use this and push your local packages into this particular feed and you can do it for nuget npm maven gradle python and also they have universal also so you can publish all the packages related to your project you can upload it over here and that's it so right now what i'm going to do is the second thing was integrate github to azure devops so first we'll integrate github to azure devops and then i'll show how to import a repository from github to azure repos because we are going to use azure repos so the first it's actually simple you have project settings over here click on that and you will be seeing uh, so many options over here and one more thing i wanted to show you is so you can change private and public over here and also you can cancel out services which you don't use for example you don't use azure repos you are using github so you can just remove it 
that's it if i reload it you won't see it you'll just be using four services and if you want it back you can just switch it on back uh, it's that simple so now how to integrate github so i guess uh, integrating github with devops project and azure boards so we can see over here yes so uh, in boards github connections click on it my azure uh, organization or my project is not connected to any github account so i'm going to connect it to my github account so it's asking for my password and username so i'm providing it so now i'm signed in and it's showing all of the github repositories which are in my account over here it's that simple and right now i want this repository i don't want actually you can add all of this and use one of the repositories in your pipeline but i just want this so i'm just going to save it yeah so it got connected right now you can use this github repository in your pipeline but i'm not going to use github directly i'm going to use azure repos so you can import it over here but before doing that i want to show the connection between azure boards and github so let me open github and this is the one this is the repository so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a work item a work item a work item is nothing but a task a task which you want uh, any of your uh, team members to do so i'm going to say uh, update read me so this is going to be my uh, task so i'll just hit enter so a new task has been created and it is in state to do that is i'm not going to do so what uh, i'm going to do is i'm just going to put it over here and i will assign it to someone so right now i'm the only member of this so i'm assigning it to myself for example if there are hundreds of people you can assign it to one of them if you are a manager you can assign it to one of your teammates so it has been assigned over here and the task number is one so how to connect this with github so this is not connected with this but we can connect them uh, using this uh, particular number so how to do that i'll show you before that how 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 does these two connect because there is a tool which you have to first install in github so if i hit azure you can see over here azure pipelines and azure boards so if you want to use azure pipelines directly from github or azure boards directly from github then you will have to install both of these i've installed it already so it's not showing for me and if you want to use then you'll have to install it once you install you can do so they asked me to uh, update readme for example i'm another teammate i'm checking this okay i have to update the readme uh, so i'm going over there i'm clicking on readme i'm going to edit it i'm giving uh, so just updated it for fun and so now to commit changes i'm not going to commit it to the master branch now i'm going to create another branch to commit so if i do this it won't affect the master branch there won't be a change in the master branch only when uh, we merge it then the changes will be applied so for now there won't be any change so that is what i'm going to do i'm going to propose this file change once they accept it it will work and now you have to open a pull request so while you open a pull request what you're going to do is you'll have to leave a comment like this fixes or fixed or fix so this is i'm going to give fixes ab is for azure boards and hashtag number one so number one indicates number one indicates the task number so one is the task number so it indicates it so if i create a pull request right now it will automatically uh, consider this one so for example i click on pull request yeah so it is checking for ability to merge if there are no conflicts it is right now ready for uh, a merge just a quick info guys intellipad provides microsoft azure devops certification course in partnership with microsoft and mentored by industry experts the course link of which is given in the description below now let's continue with the session so right now i can click on this and just merge them so but right now you see here there has been a change you can see a github uh 
commit or github pull request actually it's a github pull request has been registered over here and it is in a, uh, this update read me so if i click on this it takes me to the pull request page so same goes with this if i click on this it takes me to the azure boards where this particular work task is so you can see it took me over here and it is connected with this so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to go back and i'm going to merge this and i'll show you what happens just a quick info guys test your knowledge of azure by answering this question what are the different cloud deployment models in azure a private cloud b public cloud c hybrid cloud d all the above comment your answer in the comment section below subscribe to intellipad to know the right answer now let's continue with the session i'm going to hit and yeah i just confirm merge and now if the merge is confirmed it will automatically go to done so you don't need to come over here and check whether it is done or not and push it over there it automatically happens and this saves a lot of time so this is what i wanted to show you guys about github and uh, azure boards so the next thing we'll be doing is we'll be importing this particular Azure repository, sorry, GitHub repository to my Azure repos. So I'm going to go to Azure repos. If you have a local repository, you can just exactly do the same things you do for GitHub. You can uh, initialize it. You can uh, create a remote origin using this uh, your URL, and then you can just push all the contents to this Azure repo. Or instead, you can import an existing uh, GitHub repository. So I'm going to do that. So git and this is my so this is going to be my URL. I'm going to paste it over here and I'll have to provide authorization. So I'll have to provide my username and password. So I click on import. Sorry, my user password. I think the password I gave was wrong. So yeah. So it is importing, it's on its way, processing the request. So it's showing we'll send you a notification when it's ready. Uh, why is uh, that showing because my repository is very small uh, an organization's repository will be so huge it will be like uh, for example if it is one gigabyte it will take a lot of time to import so that's what so it notifies you and you can just see here it is the exact same as this you have everything over here so you can use right now you can use Azure repos instead of your github so that's why they developed Azure Repo. So now if I go to branches, I can see the branches which were created. You can see there were two branches created and you can see the pushes. So this was the only push which happened and then commits. You can see the number of commits happened. These were my old ones. These were the old commits and these are the new ones. So here also there, there was an update readme happened. And here also there is an update treatment. So this one was with another uh, Azure organization before. And right now you can you can actually see all the history here. You can see all the merge history. You can see the number of times uh, you created a pull request. Every detail is over here. You can add tags. Yeah, you can see everything basically. You can see the number of commits and the files. And also you can upload files over here. You can just click here and you are done. You can just uh, give a command, browse, choose a file, and upload. That's it's that simple. Or, or what you can do is, uh, you can actually push files over here. So you will have to initialize this first. So to do that, what I'm going to do is, I'm, I'm going to clone this now. We can also clone this to our local repo. We can clone it to Visual Studio Code. Or we can just clone it normally using git bash after cloning it what we can do is uh, we can push our changes made in the local system and we can just push it over here that's it it's pretty simple so I'm cloning it and what I'm going to do is I'm going to clone right now I'll open git bash if I go so let me just check so there's a lot of stuff here so I think the name would be uh, angular app one yeah it is angular app one so I'm in master right now. So that's good. So or just a second. 
So uh, that was not the file, guys. Actually, it was IntelliPad Angular project. Yeah. So right now, yes. So this was the cloned Azure repository. So we are going to use this. For example, I'll propose a change over here. So I'll open my readme. You can see I updated it for fun. So I'm going to update it. That's it. I'm just going to save this. Okay. So now I'll page it and I'm committing it. Updated readme. So it has been changed. So now I just have to push it. Just git push and my work is done. It has been uploaded. And right now, if I open readme, it won't be there. Uh, sorry, it will be there. Yeah, so the change has been made. So it is that simple to use Azure Repos and to connect the local system to your Azure Repos. It's the same as GitHub. So guys, now what we're going to do next, let me switch back to the slides and check what we'll have to do next. So now we are going to create a CICD pipeline for the Angular application and with Azure pipelines in Repos. So we've created Repos. We're going to use this repository to create an Azure pipeline. So I've already built my application. So there would be a dist folder. So you can see over here, I already built it locally and just pushed it. So there is a dist folder. So right now, if I uh, run my application, the Angular page should be shown. And before doing this guys, uh, make sure you have two app services created in your Azure account. So in your Azure account, make sure that you have two app services. So the app services will have their own URL. You can use that where, where you will launch your website. Okay. So right now let us start off with pipelines. So new pipeline, you can either go directly over here or you can use the classic editor. I prefer the classic editor. So I'll just show this once I'm choosing a zero repo. Yeah, that repo. So now it shows me Node.js uh, because it will read what is under my uh, code so it, it read my code so it knows that it is node.js so it is showing me to use node.js with npm so i can just use this so i can install npm and I, I can run build i can just add it over here so i can do this over here or i can do this manually so that process shows everything which happens so let me go over there i don't want this so i'll just go back and I'll use the classic editor. It's the same, but it shows more information. So I'm going to use zero repos. Yeah, this repo master branch. No, I'm going to use master branch only. Continue. So now it shows you can just, uh, you can do configuration of code. You can type your entire YAML file as a code, or you can choose one of these templates. So these, for example, your uh, application is a .NET desktop application. You can just click on this. You'll have multiple jobs you can execute them or android but mine but mine is a, a angular application which requires npm so just a quick info guys if you want to make a career in azure devops then intellipad provides a microsoft azure devops engineer certification training which is taught by industry experts with more than 10 years of experience this course is designed to upskill and land your dream job now let's continue with the session First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to configure this pipeline. I want it to run on Windows. Yeah, so I'll tell what I need. I need to install NPM, then I need to build my project and then store it to a zip file. After storing it, it should be ready for publishing into a release. That is, I want to push it to a QA server or a production server. It should be ready. So we'll have to do four, four jobs. Uh, sorry, four tasks. So our first task would be installing npm. If I type in npm, I can see over here. So the default process would be install npm. Yeah. So you can choose a registry uh, directly from .npmrc. That is, it takes from the public source, or you can choose an Azure artifact one. So I'm just going to choose which I created right now. It takes from the public uh, resources, but I'm going to choose it. Yeah. So next. I'm going to build my project to build my project. I cannot use install. I cannot use publish or I cannot use this also. I have to use custom and provide my command over here. My command is run build prod because build prod is what I mentioned in my package.json file. And so that's what I have to run. And again, I'm going to 
uh, choose uh, so let it be this i'm not going to choose public over here let's see what happens then i'll have to archive my files into a zip file so i'm going to choose archive so i'm going to change this name as archive files and also you will have to change this so what you will have to change this to is you will have to change this to the dist path so that is going to be dist and angular app okay so this will be my path because it will take the html file or the contents from this so this is the folder which has to be archived so it has to be zip yeah so you can see over here build dot artifact staging directory and build dot build id so this will take the build id so that that's what we are creating we are creating a build so that it will take so right now i'll show uh i'll have, we'll have to create an, another job I, I told you we'll have to publish it so to publish i'm going to use publish build artifacts so the artifact which we build has to be published so you can see here build dot artifact staging directory so the directory which was taken here will be taken here also this is like a variable so you can go to variables and also add variables over here you can just hit here and add uh, your own variables or you can uh, also you will have to enable this trigger let me tell you so why do we do this because we want a ci cd pipeline we want continuous integration and continuous deployment so the build is for continuous integration so i'm just going to choose and whenever there is a change in master branch it should uh, the continuous integration process should occur so this will be useful when there is a pipe a release pipeline so right now there is not going to be any continuous integration because this will just build and keep the artifact uh, as it is and then there are a few other options uh, retention period then the history which you did with this build so right now there is no build i did not do anything so there is no history okay so that's it for the build we don't need to configure anything else so let us save this first and then run it you can save and queue it directly or you can save and queue it over here so now you can see number one this is my first build on this azure repository and the commit was updated readme which i did and then it will start with the first job so these are the jobs which will be done before starting with to install and then to build and then it will archive public publish artifact and then it will be completed and then we can create a release using this so let us wait until this completes so guys uh the execution has been completed you can see over here everything has been succeeded npm install succeeded you can check over here you can just click on them and see what uh, happened in them so you can see my build has been completed it has been archived and it is right now ready for a release so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to release this and i'm going to create a cd that is a, this build will create a ci and this will be CD. So I'll be creating a CI CD pipeline. So I'll release. I'm going to use this build. It will automatically take the build. Or if you want to create a release separately, for example, you will be having 10, 15 builds. You can choose any one of that build. And you can you can click on this and you can choose any one of that build. Or you can add multiple builds. So as I told you, I'll have to launch it to my app service. I already have uh, two app services in my account, but they are not running first. Let me create this then I'll just switch them on and after that I'll show whether uh, my CI CD pipeline works or not So I am clicking here clicking on apply my first stage would be QA. Yeah, so this is for quality assurance for in a in, For example in an organization, obviously they'll have a lot of stages uh, I'm just going to sh show two stages. That's it I'm going to show a QA stage and I'm going to show a production stage. So QA stage, you'll have to configure something. You'll have to provide your Azure subscription. And so right now, my I, I usually use this subscription and it's not showing. It will show once I choose that subscription, then it will show the app services running in my account. So once uh, it loads, before that, I'll just go to my a portal and let me switch it on so this is my account sign in so i'll just go to my uh, app services i'll check whether they are running or not 
I think oh they are still running so no problem okay let them be running so right now let me refresh it once now I don't need to refresh I'll check over here so it's still not showing for example uh, because that this is not authorizing for me if you have an account and you have multiple subscriptions the first time you do you will have to authorize it over here when you click on authorize it will load if it gets authorized it will show nothing there won't be any error if it is not authorized it will show an error it will throw you an error so i think this will throw me an error because i know this won't get authorized but when i use this it won't get so you can see over here if i use this it's not authorizing because uh, i don't know why but this subscription has uh, it is authorizing for me so cool so now you can see there are two running over here so this is the subscription for my azure account and if i see now i can see kodi1 and kodi prod over here so let us take kodi1 as my uh, qa server so let it be there and you can see over here deploy app service you can see it has been auto filled for me my app service name and my subscriptions so we don't need to do any other change over here this is going to run uh, cool so now there are no nothing else you'll have to change one more thing you have to do here that is you can do it manually that is you can just uh, run it there won't be any connection between the build and the stages that is the artifact which has been stored and the stages or after the build has been completed this when the build completes the release automatically triggers so that triggers this okay so that's it i want for my qa and and another thing in qa you can uh, so okay i'll add one test over here i'll add i'll add this test but right now i think i'll have to so if you don't find anything over here you can just click on them you can get it for free you can actually install them i'll show that too so that i cover all of the concepts here so if you want any uh, ta task which is not available you can just search for them they will be available in the marketplace and then you can just install them once you install them then you can uh, search them over here and you will find uh, use them add so you can then add it so okay proceed to my organization i'll go over here i'll go to my releases so here nothing is there so i'll just refresh it and then i'll search for smoke web test so right now you can see there is add so what i'm going to do is i'll have to add the url of my azure app service so this is that service and it will be kodi one dot azure websites dot net so that would be the url i'm going to copy it and paste there it does nothing it just checks uh whether it sends back a 200 that is whether the website is running properly or not it is okay or not so that's it i want for qa and now for example you have 200 tasks running if you want to create a production server and you will you will have to emulate the same thing for the end users you don't need to create the task again one by one you can just click here clone that's it all the tasks will be copied over here and then i'm going to name this as prod this is going to be my production server and then i don't need this because i would have already tested it's okay so right now i just want this but you will you cannot host your QA and prod in the same uh, URL you'll have to change the URL because this is for public use so this is going to be, be my URL for public use this is going to be my uh, app service so I'm choosing that and done so now I'm saving it and also one more thing I wanted to show you so this is after the release if I click on this it will come here this is after stage it will come here manual it will be separate so I'm just keeping it after stage. So after QA prod will be automatically triggered. But what if uh, QA succeeded, but there is some error or some typo there, but you wanted to change it, but it went automatic. It went to production and it starts executing. You cannot stop it, right? So you can do this. You can create a pre-deployment approval that makes sure that, for example, I'm adding myself. So after the QA is completed, and it's ready for production so you can check whether everything is right once and after that you can approve so that only then the production starts 
so then only this stage starts running and for example you can give any number of approvals you can give 10 approvals and only if all those approvals uh, click approve then it starts otherwise it doesn't start so it's done so i'll just save this so i'm creating a release and if you build so it'll automatically release right now i'll have to create the release manually and then i'm just creating release one has been created so now we've created a ci cd pipeline guys it's that simple in azure devops so we've created a ci cd pipeline let me show this once it uh, is running and once the QA server is completed, I'll show you how to use Azure test and feedback tool and also how to do manual testing on that particular URL. So let me go back. You can see over here, you can just click on them. You can see uh, all the tasks running over here. Uh, there are no tests. You can see come over here again. So now you can see initialize job. Yeah, done. It has been deployed successfully so right now if i go over here my website should be running if it is not running then there is a fault in my website but yeah so my website is running and it's successful so this is my app it is running successfully so my task has been succeeded and this is code one dot websites.net and it has been succeeded so if I click this, it went to my website and it showed that it's running. Yeah. So now if I go to the pipeline, now you should see, now you will be seeing an approve button over here. So this saves you. When there is a pro, uh, server, a QA server running, for example, 10 people checked it, tested it and thought it is okay, but they left out a minute mistake, which will affect uh, for end users. So then when you check it, you find it out, then you can uh, tell them to change it and rebuild it once again. So then you can approve it and start. So right now only this will be running. My the, uh, There won't be anything here. And right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some exploratory tests on this and I want to change my title over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the exploratory test first, then I'll do a manual test. So first exploratory test, I'll have to connect my test feed and feedback tool over here so but how to download this if you ask you can just go to test plans when you are a new user you will be shown this you can click on this it will take you to this marketplace you can just click on this and you will be taken to the chrome web store and you can just install it like a normal extension it's pretty simple so that's how so right now i'm going to do an exploratory test over here to do that, I'll need to connect to my uh, URL. So this was, I, this is the project which I connected earlier. So right now, this would be my organization. I'll have to connect it. So I'm thinking next. So it is asking, yeah. So this would be my uh, IntelliPad Angular project team saving it. So now I can run tests on any website, which I have, but right now I only have this. So I'm going to start the session and now you can see multiple options over here capture browser tab you can add notes you can record the screen this will be to create a bug which will be shown in azure boards and then this will show the entire process you've done in your session and this is to explore work items which are linked and this is to connect to a device and this is the setting so right now i want for example i've checked my website i don't like my title and i want to change it so i'll click on browser and you will be seeing this tool so you can just click on this save and now if i go here you can see it has been added what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a bug i don't like it so i'm creating a bug so now you can see the observation has been added here if you don't want it you can remove it but i want it my bug is going to be change angular app one to uh, hello so I want to show it as hello app is running so this will be the source this is what I wanted to add so just do it now priority so th I'll just give it simply and if I save this you can see the entire process in the session so what I did the session started I took a screenshot and I created an issue so you can just click on this and it will take you 
to the issue page. So this is my issue and you can see the observations, do it now a priority. Okay, so now what I do, you can do that here also, you can change it to uh, doing. So you can basically change it, you can click on this and change it to doing or you can just go to boards and let it change. So now it will be in uh, doing. So now what I'm going to do is, uh, so I did a spelling mistake there, so let's ignore that. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to change this in my local system and I'm going to upload it. So now when I upload it, automatically my build should run, then my release should run. So if it happens, then I'm going to approve it once again because there will be a release too happening. And I found an error over there. And before doing that, what I wanted to do is I wanted to add some tests over here. So to add tests, what you can do. So for example, for uh, to check it, I'm going to add a test. So open the website, check the name. If hello, then pass all tests. So this is my manual test. So now if I go to test plants, these tests will be available there. But these will be manual tests, you'll have to do them one by one manually and just pass them one by one. So this was still loading. So I just opened it in the same window. Okay, so now it's showing it over here. I, if I click on this test, you can see open the website, check the name, if hello, then pass all tests. So how to run this, you can just select all of them and run them, run them for a web application and you will be shown a prompt over here. It'll uh, So you will have to do this manually and then you will have to just pass them one by one. So you can see a runner test plans and it's showing open the website and if I go to next, it will show check the name. If you go to next, if hello, then pass all tests. So I'm not going to do it right now. So what I'm going to do right now is I'll uh, update my name, then I'll push it. And then I'll do this test and then uh, everything will run. So a release two will be created and then I'll approve it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to cancel this. I'm not going to approve this. I don't want this to run. I want it to change. And then only, so I'm going to just cancel this. Didn't like it. Bye. So I canceled it. So right now you can see it is not deployed. So this release did not deploy. Okay. So now I'm going to my local system. I'm going to open my readme. Sorry, not my readme. I'll have to open my uh, index.html file. So I'll just see here. I'll have to go into SRC, I'll have to go into app, I'll have to go into app.component.ts. Sorry, I, I cannot go into it, it's a file. I'll have to open it. Yeah, so I'm going to change my name. I'm going to change my name. So I think I changed it. Yes. So now I'm going to stage it and then commit it. I'm going to commit it as changed the website title and then I'm going to push it. But I think before pushing, let's just pull it once if we did it. So there is no changes. Okay, so I pushed it. Now the change would have happened. Now there should a, a build should have started. So you can see here changed the website title. So a build is running. So this, I did not do anything. It automatically did itself. A con continuous integration was on. If continuous integration is on, whenever there is a code change on the master branch, then this will automatically happen. So now it's in installing NPM. So once that is uh, done, then this will happen because we have enabled after release. Sorry, after uh, this. So this will be enabled. We enabled continuous deployment trigger. Once we enable this, so it will automatically happen. So now let me go to releases. Let us wait until that completes. So I'll open build over here, releases over there. So it is still installing. Let us wait. So guys, the build has been completed. So once the build completes, as I told you, the release has to start. 
so let me open release yeah so there is a release 2 running it is on the build 2 if i click on this right now it has been queued it is waiting so it will it will start running now yeah so the deployment is in progress so after this gets deployed this name should be changed to hello if it is uh, if it did not change to hello then i did something wrong or uh, there is some error in my pipeline but it should happen if not i don't know what will happen but it will happen so let us wait until this deployment is completed yeah the deployment has been com uh, is completed so i'll try to refresh it so the change has been made my website didn't go down i didn't do anything to my website i didn't uh, it did not go down even for a second it changed so this is how you do a CI CD pipeline but right now we are still one step missing that I didn't do the tests. So my build is running, my test has been completed. So if I go to my pipeline you can see yeah the prod is pending approval. So yeah I liked it but I want to do a test. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this test on my website so I'll just run them and yeah, so this is my runner so i'm checking open the website yeah i opened the website it's running check check the name check the name i don't know what name but yeah it was mentioned as hello yeah checked if hello then pass all tests yeah so done then i save it and close so now what happens if i go to my uh azure boards if i go here every test would have been passed yeah so you can see the tests have been passed so the test is done so it's good so what i'm going to do i'm going to approve this you can add a comment over there if you want so i approved it so right now my production server will run once my production server it's not exactly a server i'm just deploying it it is a job it is a task i'm just saying it for uh, the understanding purpose so after this runs my website will be launched in this uh, particular URL also so let us wait until this completes so in progress redeployment approvals has been done and now it's running on agent yeah it succeeded so now if I go over here this had my old website we, uh, this was I already hosted a website over there so right now it has to host this website over here so it has to have hello in it. it is, see guys it's a different URL. So you can see uh, it is running so my production server worked. So I have created a complete CI CD pipeline which enabled me to do a QA uh, server. I ran it there I tested it and then I approved for my prod server also. So now what I am going to do is uh, so this was good this happened good. I'll go over here and I go so I'll go to my boards so there is nothing here I don't know why okay so I think if everything is completed there won't be uh, they won't be showing so this is over here yeah so it is showing now so what you can do is it's completed so I'll just push it over there done that's it so this is how you use Azure boards and this is how you create a CI CD pipeline and the next thing i wanted to show you was so this artifacts so i use the public feed guys you remember that right so i use the public feed for my build so when i use the public feed what happens is all of the packages which i used all of the packages which got installed will be stored over here so you can see there was one download and uh, one user used it and the few things had many downloads also so right now if i use this feed it won't go to the public source it will directly take from my feed and that will reduce time it won't go to the public source because there will be a lot of people accessing that site uh, there won't there would be traffic or sometimes there would be a ddos account and the service would have been denied but if i move all of the packages to my feed when i run the build right now it will directly take it from here it won't go to the public source now it will be available here so everything will be done properly so this is artifacts you can also upload your own feed 
uh, you don't need to upload anything uh, any public feed so this happened when i run uh, the build so it automatically pushed so you can see guys you can see 28 minutes ago so that is when we ran the build so that's what that is about artifacts it's pretty simple it holds all the packages you can use it whenever you so you can see there are so many packages which got installed and all of the packages you can see it over here and if your company only uses four packages you can just use those put those four packages upload them over here and keep on using them instead of going to public or your local system anymore so that's it guys and i find after i've shown all of these uh, topics i've shown boards i showed repos i showed pipelines test plans and artifacts and i think artifacts if you are not sure where did we do that i'll show where did we do it once more i'll click on edit so here you can see in custom registries i used a registry i select here and i choose gentilipad organization which we created and here i just used the uh, what is that the public source i did not use my registry if i choose this again uh, so it will take the packages from here so that's it that is about artifacts so i just wanted to make sure that where i used it i wanted to show that to you guys that's it and finally how to monitor all of this for example there will be a lot of processes running a lot of builds running a lot of deployments going on so how to manage all of this is you can add multiple widgets so this shows the number of uh, work items which has been assigned to you so if i add this so right now there won't be anything but let me add one work one work item so let me add a work item so this is a task and it is okay it is assigned to me and save so this is my task my task is okay so if i go over here so right now nothing will be seen uh, i'll have to complete it so right now you can see one task has been added it is in to do state and it has been assigned to this user which is me and then i can add my build history I can add chart for test plans. I can add chart for work items. I can add an embedded web page. You can add all of this. If anything is not over here, you can go to the extension gallery and find them. So let's consider. So I'll just, you can just drag and drop them actually. You can just move them wherever you want. So I'll just, I want it here. So let it be like this. So uh, done editing. Chart for test plans. You can choose which test plan. So this was my test plan. Test suit. Uh, this was my test suit. Group by. Let's say area ID. Or let's say you can choose anything actually. So work item type or whatever. So right now, according to test cases, there were three. There were three tests running on a particular test case. And then I can configure my build history. This was my build. So it was successful here once, here twice. And then I can add a URL over here. So my URL, for example, if I add this over here. Before launching the website, I can see my embedded web page over here itself, for example. Okay, so if this is not working, I'll just enter Google's so copy. I'll just configure this and enter Google's. So it is not showing. Or I can use anything. So, for example, I'll use IntelliPad.com and save it. So, you can now see the IntelliPad's website over here. This would be a static website. You cannot do anything over here. So, you can just see all of these stuff and all. And now, for chart for work items, you can choose the query which has been created. Right now, there is no query. So, you cannot do that. So, this is how you monitor your uh, Azure DevOps application. So guys, I've explained all of the concepts over here and I've explained boards, how to connect it to GitHub, how to create work items, how to link between GitHub and uh, work items. Same thing goes with Azure repos. We saw how to import it, how to pull it, how to push it. It's the exact same thing as GitHub. You don't need to learn anything else apart from that. And then pipelines we learned, builds, we created a CI CD pipeline and then we created test plans and also we did exploratory testing using this tool 
so i'll just stop this yeah i stopped it then we learned artifacts by uploading all of the public source content over here that is the packages so if you see the summary page you can see everything so nine work items got created two work items got completed zero pull requests were made and 11 commits by two authors so if you think two authors, one was my GitHub account and one was this uh, the person, uh, sorry, the local systems author. So the local systems author is different over here and the author over here is different. So you can see a uh, build succeeded 100%, deployment succeeded 100%. So this is the basic Azure DevOps uh, CI CD pipeline and Azure repos guys. Just a quick info guys. Test your knowledge of Azure by answering this question. What are the different cloud deployment models in Azure? A. Private cloud B. Public cloud C. Hybrid cloud D. All the above Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to IntelliPad to know the right answer. Now let's continue with the session. Active Directory is used to store and organize information about various elements of an organization's network such as computers, users, resources like printers, shared files or folders. To understand this better, let's consider a scenario. Let's say that you work for an organization of about 100 people, right? So there are like total 100 employees in your organization and there are 150 computer systems. So, and let's say that there are five printers. So the organization needs to keep Obviously, the organization would have to keep the track of all the computer systems that are currently in use and all the computer systems that are just sitting idle and the, the systems that are spare and they will have to keep a track of which employee is using which computer system or which computer system is connected to the five printers, right? And they will also need to keep a track of what kind of user credential to log into their computers and all of the... all. And all of the information related to this so that means organizations need somewhere need a database that where they can actually store and organize this information right so that database is actually called active directory so usually on-premise organizations when they store and organize this kind of information they call it the active directory so this is what active directory is now that now, act, since Active Directory contains all kinds of information about the organization, it contains information about information about users, computers, and resources that are part of the organization. It can actually be used to authenticate and authorize the users, right? Because it contains the credentials of the users, it contains the names and all other kinds of information about the user. So you can actually use uh, the Active Directory to, to authenticate and authorize the user. So this is what, what Active Directory is all about. Now let's understand what is an Azure Active Directory. Like I've already said that Azure Active Directory is basically inspired from this on-premise Active Directory service. But it's so much more than that. Azure Active Directory is the identity management solution for Azure. It's a live directory or a database that stores user accounts and their passwords, computers, file shares, security groups, permissions, and so much more. Uh, let's again take an example to understand this a little better. Now let's say that you again work for an organization, but this now this organization uses Azure Cloud for all of its workloads, right? So let's say that there are multiple departments in your organization and each and every department needs access to some different kinds of services from Azure Cloud. So again, your organization, because you don't want, your organization doesn't want employees to be using their own personal accounts, personal Azure accounts in order to be able to access Azure services, they have gone and created one parent account, Azure account, so that their employees, all of their employees can use that one single account to access and use Azure services. Now, like I've already said that different departments may need access to different kinds of services. That means, let's say that the production environment doesn't need access to any machine learning services, let's say. So if you give out the credential for the whole parent account, then they will actually have the access to those services as well, right? Along with the services that they actually need. So this is not very a smart decision when it comes to the security terms, right? Because if everyone has access to every service that comes in your Azure subscription, then how would you know that who is using what service, right? So 
to keep a track of that what you can do you can you know you can easily create users and you can give them their own passwords and own user accounts so that and then you can uh, go ahead and give them a role so that they can only access the services that they actually need that way you will know that production department is only accessing virtual machines and databases and uh, you know uh, cloud function and these kind of services and other departments are only accessing the services that they actually need this way your azure subscription or your azure organizations azure account will stay safe right because there won't be any unauthorized access and you can also keep a track of all, all of the billing right so Till here, everything seems fine. But now if you think about the number of employees, how would that work? I mean, there were, there are going to be so many employees. There are going to be more than 100 employees with their own user accounts and their own passwords to access some specific service. And then if they want access to some other service, then they will have to, you know, they will have to be given another user account and another pair of passwords so that they can access that other service as well. So there are going to be multiple usernames and multiple passwords for all of the employees. Now to keep a track of all of those things, of course your IT admin, your organization's IT admin would need Active Directory. Now instead of just using an on-premise Active Directory, he can directly go ahead and use Azure Active Directory because Azure offers this service, right? So IT admin will go ahead and you know, store all kinds of information about user accounts, their passwords, the computers, file shares, security groups, permissions that they have given to every user account and so much more in that Azure Active Directory. Now again, like I said that Azure Active Directory is an identity management solution, right? That means now since it contains so much information about users, we can actually go ahead and use Azure Active Directory for identity management purpose. Now that we understand what is an Azure Active Directory in layman terms, Let's see how Azure defines Azure Active Directory. So Azure Active Directory is Microsoft's multi-tenant identity solution for Azure. Azure AD is one-stop solution for core directory services for cloud, application access management, and identity authentication solutions. That means, like I said, that it is inspired from the on-premise directory services. That means that for cloud, it is one-stop solution for core directory services, right? And for application access management, well, of course, like I said, that it's an identity management solution. That means you can actually use a Azure Active Directory to configure who can access your application and not. And then, of course, identity authentication solutions, like I've already told you, Azure Active Directory is the solution, is the solution offered by Azure for identity authentications, right? Now, moving on. Why exactly Azure Active Directory came into the picture? Like what was the need that Azure felt so that it provided this service, right? Let's first consider the scenario before Azure Active Directory. That means the case scenario where Azure Active Directory does not exist. So for any service that you might want to use, you are given a set of username and password, using which you can access that particular service for which the username and password is created. Now let's say that you as an employee of your organization wanted to use database services offered by Azure. So IT admin goes and creates a username and password for you and now you can use your organization's parent or tenant account, Azure account to access database service. But you can only access database service using this username and password. Now let's say if you wanted a cloud function service, right? You wanted to access the cloud function service. So for that, Again, IT admin had to create one more username and password for you and now you can use this particular username and password to access cloud function. You cannot use the previous set of username password to access cloud function because that password is that username and password is specifically created for database service, right? Now let's say that you want one more service, you want to access Azure virtual machines. Now for that also, IT admin had to go and create one more username and password and then now you can access Azure Virtual Machine using this particular username and password. That means if you want to access three different services from Azure, then you will be given three different sets of username and password. Now, of course, it's a hassle for you to remember all these different username and passwords, but it's not just you. It's also a very big problem for the IT admin of your organization. Because of course he has to manage all of the passwords, all of the usernames, because he needs to keep a track of what username he has already created or what password he has already given to what username and what a set of username and password goes to which employee and what are the permissions connected or related to that set of username and password. So he, he has to keep track of all of this. 
so of course if only one imp if one employee needs access to three services and there are three different sets of username and passwords of course there are going to be so many other employees as well and they are also going to have multiple username and passwords because of course they are going to need to access multiple services right so this all of this becomes hassle for employees as well as the IT admin who has to keep track of or who has to manage all of these username and passwords. So this is where Azure Active Directory comes in. Now that we have seen what was the case scenario before Azure Active Directory, now let's move ahead and see how when Azure offered its service, identity management service, Azure Active Directory, all of these problems got solved, right? So after Azure Active Directory was introduced in your organization, Azure Active Directory your organization can actually use Azure Active Directory to just create a single set of username and password using which an employee of your organization or you can access any service that you want as long as the admin has given you the permission. Which means that now instead of creating multiple sets of username and password for all of your different services, now IT admin just has to create one username and password that belongs to you and the IT admin can actually go ahead and add permissions in that same username and password for different services. That means, let's say that first of all you want a database service and your password and username was created, right? Now when you wanted cloud function service, then instead of creating a new username and password, your IT admin just has to uh, add the permission for cloud function service in your existing username and password. That is all he has to do. So that means, there will only be a single username and password for every single employee, right? He just has to keep track of all the username and password for every single employee and now he can see, he can use Active Directory to track or store or organize the permissions that he has given to all of the username and passwords. So now your, your task has become simple because you only have to remember one set of username and password as well as your IT admin's task has become simple because he doesn't have to track all of the different username and password that belong to only one employee, right? Because now there is only one username and password for one employee. So this feature is actually called a single sign-on. That means a single set of username and password to sign in and access any service that you want as long as you're given the permission, right? So Azure Active Directory provides this feature, which is called single sign-on. So as we all know that Microsoft isn't just providing or offering you know, web-based services through its cloud platform that is Azure. But it is also, it has been actually also providing on-premise services as well. So before it uh, Microsoft provided Azure Active Directory, it had already provided an on-premise Active Directory service, which was known as Windows Active Directory. So Windows Active Directory was designed, was not actually designed to handle web-based services or information related to web-based services, right? So that was one major drawback which led Microsoft to come up with this another Active Directory service which is called Azure Active Directory now for all the users that were now using cloud platform, right? So even though Windows Active Directory and Azure Active Directory come from the same root that is Microsoft, they still have many significant differences. One of the very obvious difference is that obviously Windows Active Directory, like I've already told you, was designed for on-premise purpose while Azure Active Directory was designed for cloud, right? So it is basically cloud located. So apart from this major difference, there are many other differences which we will see in this Windows AD versus Azure AD topic. But before that, let us just see what is Windows AD in official definition terms, right? So Windows Active Directory is a Windows operating system directory service that offers a single interface for organizing and maintaining information about the organization's network. Now, I've already told you one major drawback because of which uh, Microsoft had to come up with this another Active Directory service, but there is so much more than that. To learn how Windows Active Directory works differently or how Azure Active Directory works differently from Windows Active Directory, we will first have to see how Windows Active Directory works, right? So basically, Windows Active Directory works on different layers, each layer to perform different tasks. So as you can see on your screen, I have listed five layers. So the first layer is called ADDS, which is acronym for Windows Active Directory Domain Service. 
and then next we have ADLS which stands for Azure Data Lake Storage Services and then third layer is ADFC which is Active Directory Federation Services and then fourth layer is ADCS which is Active Directory and Certification Services and then finally we have the fifth layer which is ADRMS which stands for Active Directory Rights Management Services. So like I said all of these different layers perform different kinds of tasks right so let's discuss all of these different tasks one by one starting with AD DS. So ADDS, like I've already told you, stands for Windows Active Directory Domain Services, right? So this layer actually allows admin to manage information related to user logins and other information such as when the user signed up or logged in or when did he log out and how much of services are they using and stuff like that. And the next layer we have ADLS which stands for Azure Data Lake Storage Service. This layer lets admin store any amount of data and data of any type and any site, right? And the next layer ADFC provides the single sign-on feature which lets user access systems and applications with a single password and username. Now, like I've already told you about little bit about single sign-on feature, right? So since this is the Windows Active Directory, which means that it's working on the on-premise work locations, that means that this layer provides single sign-on feature using which users will be able to access systems or application not the web-based services right with a single password or credential so this is what adfc is for and then the next layer that we have that is adcs this layer allows admin to customize services and manage or issue public certificates and then the last layer that we have is adrms which is basically used for data protection. So when we use Windows Active Directory, the admin will have to take care of five different layers that perform different tasks. Now that is also very big of a hassle. So this was one of the other drawbacks which led Microsoft to come up with this Azure Active Directory, another Active Directory solution, which is Azure Active Directory, right? So when Azure Active Directory came into the picture, what happened was Azure Active Directory actually merged all these layers into just two layers and these two layers performed all of the tasks that were all previous five layers were doing. So these two layers were WAAD that is Windows Azure Active Directory and then the second layer was WAAC that is Windows Azure Access Control Service. So just a quick info guys, if you want to make a career in Azure DevOps, then IntelliPad provides a Microsoft Azure DevOps Engineer Certification Training which is taught by industry experts with more than 10 years of experience. This course is designed to upskill and land your dream job. Now let's continue with the session. WAAD layer combines all the five layers of Windows Active Directory. That means that it does all the tasks that were previously done by five different layers in windows active directory so and it is the ultimate identification management layer and the second layer that is waac enables federation for all of the services of an organization now since it's azure active directory that means we are using single sign-on to access different azure services right so for that waac layer was introduced in active directory in Azure Active Directory. So these are the two layers. So this is how Azure Active Directory is much evolved and better version of Windows Active Directory as it has combined all of the five layers into just two layers and it has performed all of the tasks that were previously done by five different layers. And it also lets users access web-based services using single sign-on, right? So this is how Azure Active Directory is different from Windows Active Directory. Now, let's see what is service audience. That means who is using the service offered by Azure. So there's basically three kinds of audience when it comes to Azure Active Directory. First is IT administrator. Second is application developer. And then we have online customers. So IT admins basically ensure that every employee has relevant credential to access Azure services with relevant permissions. So they basically take care of all the sign-in procedure and they also resolve issues related to authentication. Now coming to application developers, well, they are the ones who want to use the services for which they have been given the permission, right? So with Azure Active Directory in the picture, application developer only have to remember one set of username and password to access any service that they want 
to use for their application development purpose, right? And also with Azure Active Directory, the services are made easily available so their development becomes significantly hassle-free. Now the next service audience that we have here is online customers. So online customers can access services such as Office 365 and other CRM services offered by Azure with their Azure Active Directory credentials. So these are the three major service audience of Azure Active Directory service, right? Now moving on, we will learn about the terminologies in Azure Active Directory. Well, of course, in order to be able to understand Azure Active Directory in depth, you must first get familiar with the major terminology that you will most likely come across when you're dealing with Azure Active Directory, right? So that is why we are going to cover the terminology section first. Okay, so in terminologies, we have tenants, domains, user, and groups. So first of all, let's discuss tenants. Now you must have come across this term a lot. You must have heard tenant term in context of tenant accounts or that Microsoft is a multi-tenant cloud platform or something like that, right? So what does it actually mean? Well, as for tenant, you can think of it as an organization. Now there are a lot of organizations that are, that are using Microsoft Azure cloud platform, right? They're using the services and so all of these organizations can be referred to as separate tenants to which Microsoft Azure has been providing or offering their cloud services. So what Microsoft Azure does, it makes sure that all of these tenants stay isolated and separated so that they can maintain the services that they are separately providing to all of these organizations. So basically, when people use the term tenant account, they're usually referring to the parent Azure account that an organization has created using which they are making use of Azure resources and Azure services, right? So that is what tenant is in Active Directory. Now moving on, next. Just a quick info guys. IntelliPath provides Microsoft Azure DevOps certification course in partnership with Microsoft and mentored by industry experts. The course link of which is given in the description below. Now let's continue with the session. Terminology that we have here is domains. So what is a domain? A domain is a DNS zone for which the tenant has proven ownership, which means that it's the public domain of the organization or maybe a subdomain of the organization or even an alternative domain that the organization isn't using publicly but has ownership for it, which means that no one else can use this particular domain but the organization itself because it has, it is the lone owner of that domain, right? So in most cases, organizations use this domain for their own websites or applications so that, so that the user base of those organizations can access their websites or applications using these domains. When you create an Azure Active Directory, you get a default domain with your Azure Active Directory. It's usually in the format as shown on your screen that is on Microsoft.com. The prefix of this domain depends on the name of the Azure Active Directory. That means the organization gets to decide what would be the prefix of this domain. And this domain that including that prefix, this domain becomes their unique domain for which the tenant or the organization has the loan ownership, right? Now, you might be thinking, like I said, that in most cases, organizations use this domain to for their own websites and applications, right? Now, if they used this default domain that they're getting with their Azure Active Directory, which has a suffix of uh, on Microsoft.com, then their user base might think that this uh, URL might take them to some Microsoft page, right? Because it has Microsoft.com in the end. But that doesn't happen because in, in most cases, what happens is that the organizations or the tenant usually add their custom domains in Azure Active Directory. And then they use, and then they verify that custom domain. That means they prove their ownership for that custom domain. And then they use that custom domain for any of their personal purposes, right? But how do they add their custom domain in the Azure Active Directory? So let's understand that. Let's add a custom domain in our, our Azure Active Directory using our Azure portal, right? So for that, I'll go to my Azure portal. So this is my Azure portal. And basically this is the homepage of my Azure portal. So before we begin adding a custom domain name in our Azure Active Directory, let me first tell you how you can get a custom domain name. It has to be a valid domain name. That is the only way it will work. Now, 
for a valid domain name since it's just a demo you don't have to go and buy or purchase a valid domain name you can use one of the uh, websites online websites that provide you free domain names for a certain period period of time right so i'm going to be using one such websites for this demo which is called freenorm.com right so this is what i'm going to use i will pick domain name from here a free domain name and then i will add that custom domain name in my azure di directory azure active directory here so first of all let's go ahead and select a custom domain name all right so this is how freenorm.com looks i have already created an account and logged in all you have to do is create an account and then sign in and then this page will open up for you now what you have to do is you have to go to service and you have to register a new domain right now what you have to do is you have to search for a domain name of your choice so i'll search for any domain name that uh, will start with hello cloud all right so this is here's the result of my search as you can see hello.tk is here hello cloud .ml is here, hellocloud.ga is here, and all of them are free. We also have some other domain names, hellocloud.com, which is not actually free. So we are going to be using a free domain name for today's demo, right? So I will select this hellocloud.ga domain name, right? So to get this domain name, I just have to click on this button here that says get it now. All right, once I do it, I'll go to my checkout. Don't worry, you won't be charged if you go to checkout because this is a free domain name, so you won't be charged anything, right? And I'm getting this free domain name for three months. All right, so I'll click on continue. All right, and then final step, I just have to check mark this and then click on this complete order button. And then this domain will be given to me and I can use it however I wish for the next three months right so I will go to my client area all right so now that I have a domain let me show you guys where it is the domains that you have purchased or the domains that you have got for free from this phenom.com you can find them here in my domains section all right so the domain that I just bought from them for free was hellocloud.ga now let's go ahead and add this domain name in my azure directory azure active directory right so in my Azure portal, what I will have to do is I have to search for Azure Active Directory, right? All right. So this is my Azure Active Directory. And like I told you that you will get a custom domain name with every time you create an Azure Active Directory. So with every account, you get one Azure Active Directory already created for you, right? And this is my Azure Active Directory default directory, which is a default directory, right? And for this default directory, I already have a custom, I already have a default domain name as well. Let me show you how you can find that. In this search bar here, you just have to type custom domain and custom domain names is the option that you have to select. All right. So now, as you can see that there is already a domain name here with the suffix of on microsoft.com. So this is the default domain name that I got with my default Azure Active Directory, right? But now we want to add a custom domain name and we have already bought a free domain name and now we can start adding that custom domain name. Now to add a custom domain name, we just have to click on this button right here. So I click on it and here we have to provide the custom domain name which is in our case is hello cloud dot ga right all right ga so this is the custom domain name that we want to use let's again make sure it's right hello cloud dot ga hello cloud dot ga right so now i'll go ahead and click on this add button here all right so now it says that to use hello cloud dot ga with your azure ad create a new txt record with your domain name registrar using the info below so we have to create a txt record in our domain registrar which is for us is freenom all right so now what you have to do is you have to navigate to your freenom and you have to click on this manage domain button in front of the domain that you want to use so for us it's hello cloud.ga so i'll click here all right from here you have to Click on manage freenom DNS. All right, so now here we will create a record using the information given to us by Microsoft Azure, right? 
So what you have to do is first of all you have to change the type to txt because that is the kind of regard that we are trying to create here. So I'll select txt here. All right. So next thing we have to do is we have to copy this destination field and then we have to paste the value here in the target field. All right. And for TDL, it's already same. So we don't have to do anything. And we have to keep the name field here blank, right? Now I'll just click on save changes. All right. So it says my record added successfully. So I'll go back to my Azure portal. Now I can go ahead and click on this verify button. But before that, let me tell you that verifying a domain name could take up to 72 hours. That means once you have bought or purchased custom domain name and that once you have added that custom domain name here in Azure Active Directory and even when you have created a record successfully, it if you go ahead and uh, try to verify it right at that second, it might not happen for you at that moment because it usually takes up to 72 hours. So if an error comes up, then you don't have to worry about that because it will eventually get verified. You can just come up again and you can try it in another 10 or 15 minutes. It'll happen for you eventually. But for the first time when you try to verify it, it might give you an error saying that it can take up to 72 hours for registering or verifying the domain name that you're trying to create, right? So let me show you what this error is actually that I'm talking about, right? So if I click on verify right now, it's going to give me an error like, I al like I've already said. So let's see. All right, so it says that it could not find DNS record for this domain because DNS changes may take up to 72 hours to propagate. That means that the changes that I've made, that the record that I've successfully added here may take up to 72 hours to actually get acknowledged, right? So uh, we are going to wait for a few um, more minutes and then we're going to try again to verify it. It's going to get verified after some time. Let me tell you, once you have added this custom domain name, even if it's not verified, it's going to show in your custom domain names page. It's going to be shown like this. The status is going to be specified as unverified. So it's only going to get verified after, you know, after some time. So when you are uh, adding a custom domain name, once you have added your custom domain name, you can just leave it like that. You can just leave it for an, an hour or a two and then you can come back to it and then just click on it and then click on verify. So we will do it after some time. All right, guys. So now let's try to verify this added custom domain name, right? So I'm going to, as like I've already told you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on it and I'm going to click on verify. So since I have already created a, a txt record and I have already saved it, it shouldn't give me any problem now because I have waited for a few hours. And before, when I tried to verify it, as soon as I created these, uh, this record, it gave me an error saying that it could take up to 72 hours for a created record to, be, to propagate, right? So now that I have waited for us for some time, it shouldn't give me that error anymore and it should get verified easily. So for that, I'm going to click on this button and let's see what happens. All right. So like I told you, it should get verified easily and it has. It says that verification has succeeded. And now if I go back to my custom domain names page, you can see that now the status here is not saying unverified, it, say, it says verified. That means custom domain that I wanted to add here in my active directory, my default active directory has been added and it has been verified as well. Now I can go ahead and start using this custom domain name that I have added. All right guys, so this is how you can create and add a custom domain name in your directory, in your Azure Active Directory. Now let's go on and move ahead with our further topics in this module. All right, guys, so the next terminology that you're most likely to come across when you're dealing with Azure Active Directory is a user. So by now, I know you already understand the meaning of a user, right? And we have also used this terminology before in this module only when we were understanding what is an Azure Active Directory. But let's just once go through the definition. So users are the individuals that are given permission and set of username and a password to access and use certain services, right? So you definitely understand what is a user, but what you don't know is how to create a user in Azure Active Directory, how to create or how to add a user. So moving on, let's understand that. Let's add or delete users using Azure Active Directory. 
Now for that, I'll have to move to my portal, right? So let me do that. All right, guys. So now I'm in my portal and I have to add a user in my Azure Active Directory. To do that, I will first have to navigate to my Azure Active Directory, right? So I'll do that using the search bar over here. I'll just search for Azure Active Directory and here it is. So this is my default Active Directory. Now I have to add a user in my Active Directory, right? So for that, I'll select this users option right here. All right. So as you can see that there are already some users that I've added in my Azure Active Directory. You can see their names over here. So that means that whenever you create a user, they will all be listed down here for you to navigate or explore from, right? So let's go ahead now and create our own user. Now, as you can see that there are two options right here. First is new user. And the second option is new guest user. So let me tell you a brief difference between these two options. The functionality is basically same. You're basically adding a user in your Azure Active Directory and you will be eventually giving them some roles so that they can access uh, your Azure services, but within some specified permissions or access controls, right? But eventually you'll be doing that for both of these. So let's say that you work for an organization and you have been asked to add some users within your organization so that you can provide them access to their relevant service, right? So for that, you will use this new user option. So basically this option is used whenever you want to create a user that is considered as the internal part of your organization, right? And as for this guest user option, you use this option, let's say, uh, when your organization wants to collaborate with some external partners so that they can give them access to some of their resources, right? That is when you use this new guest user option. So apart from the fact that this new user option is only has to be used when the user is your internal member of the uh, organization and this new guest user option has to be used when your organization wants to give access to some external party that is not a part of the organization but that external party needs access to the organization services there's not much difference between these two because eventually they will be given a username and a password and they will be signing in and then they will be given some roles according to which they will be accessing your services so all of these procedure remain same the only fact that differs is that the new user will have a user type that says member here and for new guest user, the user type will be guest. It's just a very neat way of organizing all the users that you have created so that you instantly know which user is the part of the internal organization and which user is the external party as soon as you have a look at this list of users, right? It's just a neat way. It's just a way of keeping everything neat as Azure likes it, right? So also there is one more difference, uh, which is since the new user, when you use this new user option, the user is expected to be a part of your organization, right? That means that when, when you create this new user, the username that you will use will have, should have a domain name that is verified with the directory in which you're trying to create the user right as for guest user because they are guests i mean they are external partners they are not a part of your organization that means they will have their own they can have their own domain and that domain does not have to be verified in the directory where you are trying to create a user right because all the domains that you will verify in your directory uh, will belong to that organization only and the external partners they might not have that domain because that domain is not of their ownership right so that is why the domain name that you can use in the username of guest user can does not have to be verified in the default directory where you're trying to add this guest user so let's start by creating a guest user first so for that i'll obviously click on this new guest user button all right so now this create user will give me an option to create a user which is a part of my organization but right now i don't want to create a user i want to invite a user that means i want to invite a guest from some external party so that i can provide him access to my services right so i will use this option only all right now i have to provide a name to my guest user so let's say the name of my guest user is shikha thakur right and the email address now this is what i was talking about let's say that the email address is just a quick info guys 
Test your knowledge of Azure by answering this question. What are the different cloud deployment models in Azure? A. Private cloud B. Public cloud C. Hybrid cloud D. All the above Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to IntelliPad to know the right answer. Now let's continue with the session. Now this email address is not verified in my default directory so but still i am able to use this email address because right now i'm not actually creating a user i'm just inviting a user right so i have provided the name i have provided the email address the rest of the things are not mandatory so i'll leave that out and yes so that's all i have to do right now for now the role will be user and i there are also options for me to decide whether i want to block sign in for them and other things i don't want to do that now i'm just going to click on invite and as you can see inviting user and here you go my user has been invited that means the invitation has gone through and now that user can decide whether they want to accept the invitation or not as you can see the user type of the user that i just invited says guest that means is it's a guest user and not not an internal member of my organization which would have the user type of member so now that you know how to create a guest user let's let's go ahead and actually create a user using this new user option all right so for this also, I'm again going to click on this add button. And now out of these two options, I'm going to choose this option here that says create user. All right. So now I have to provide, first of all, I have to provide a username. Like I said, the username should have the domain name that is verified in my default directory. So the first domain name option that I get here is obviously the domain default domain name that I get with my active directory, right? Because uh, since this is the default domain name, that means that it has already been verified by my directory. So it's there. And I will also get option for any other domain name that I might have gone ahead and added myself. That means the custom domain name. If I have verified any custom domain name in my directory, then I can choose that domain here as well, right? So let me show you. The domain name that we had, uh, the custom domain name that we have previously added in my directory should show here if I click on this drop down option here. All right, so here it is. As you can see, hellocloud.ga, the custom domain name that I had added is also here. Since it has been verified in my Azure account, I get the option of using this domain name as well. So let's do one thing. Let's first give a name in the username, right? So that name would be, let's say Jordan. All right, now for as for the domain that I want to use, I will use the custom domain name that I had just verified and added in my directory, right? So this is the domain name. Now I can provide the name. So for name, again, I'll go ahead with Jordan. Right, so the rest of the things again are not mandatory. So I'm just going to leave. I can block the person or I can give job info. I can provide the title here. I can give the department if i want to so that everything uh, stays organized for me so that i know this user it belongs to this department right so for this demo i'll just going i'm just going to go ahead and skip that part and now we can just go ahead and click on create right so as you can see that the user that we have just created is added the name of the user is jordan and the user type is member and the username of that username says hello dot cloud Hello, hello cloud.ga right so this is the custom domain name that i had added and verified in my active directory also one more thing that i would like to point out is this is the username for the user right so where is the password let me tell you so when you are creating a user let's say that we are again in this create user page right so if i give a name here let's say sarah and the name would be sarah and domain name i'm going to keep the default domain here now as you can see that there is a password option here if i click on this show password then it will show me the password so just copy this password and keep it somewhere safe because when you are giving the credentials to that particular user you will have to give this username and this password to that username user so that for the first time it can log in using this credentials right so this is where you can get the password so just copy it and keep it somewhere safe and then you can go ahead and create the user so for sarah i have the username i have the password that i that i, that I had copied and i'll go to sarah and i'll give her these credentials so that she can access uh, the resources using 
or she can log in using the credentials that I have created, right? All right, so this is how you can create a user or you can invite a user in your Azure Active Directory so that you can provide them access to some of your services from the subscription, right? So this is, so this is how you create a user, but how about deleting a user? Well, that's easy. There's a delete user option here. You just have to select the user, select any user that you want, and then you can just click on this delete user button and then just click on yes. All right, so as you can see, I have received a notification saying that the user Sarah has been successfully deleted. So this is how you can delete users. Now let's move on and understand our last terminology that is groups, right? So uh, what are groups? Well, when we talk about groups in Azure Active Directory, so as you can already imag imagine or guess from the name itself, a group is a logical collection of users, right? So groups in Azure Active Directory are different than the resource groups because they are the logical collection of resources while these groups are logical collections of users, right? So groups are created uh, to organize the users or devices on the basis of geographic location, department, types of services or hardware characteristics. For example, let's say that you are an IT admin in your, in your organization and you have a department where the employees uh, usually need access to same services, right? So now what you can do is you can create them users and then you can act, give them access or you can create them user and then you can put them in a group and then giving access to separate users one by user one by one. What you can do is you can just give access to the whole group and that same access or same permissions will be inherited by any member that is added in the group. That means the users of the group, right? So that, that is how you uh, groups work. Now let's see how we can actually go ahead and create groups and add members using Azure Active Directory, right? So again, for that, I'll have to move to my portal. So the first option that I get here is the group type. So you can select group type on the basis of what is convenient for you. I'm just going to keep the default value here. The next is group name. Now we have to provide a name to our group. Now remember that the name of your group should be relevant because it should be easy for you to understand or to remember what that group involves or what kind of services are involved with that group as soon as you look at the name. So remember to keep the name of the group relevant, right? So I'm going to name my group as development here, right? All right, so the next option that we have is group description. It's not mandatory, but you can add a description for the group. You can add what kind of services are involved in that group or how many members are there in the group and things like that. So it basically uh, gives us a neat organized way of, uh, you know, having a track on the group, right? And the next option that we have here is membership type. So this mem in this membership type, you basically get three options, assigned dynamic user and dynamic device. So you basically use this assigned membership type whenever you want to create a very basic group and add some members in it. You know, you can add those members in this group manually and you can remove those members manually right and the next option that we have here is dynamic user which actually lets you define some rules for this group on the basis of which new users can be added automatically or existing users can be removed automatically that means you won't be you won't have to do anything manually the users that meet the requirement of the rules that are set by you for this group are, will be added automatically to this group and the users, users that don't meet requirement of the rules that have been set by you for this group will be removed automatically from this group if you use this dynamic user option, right? And the next option that we have here is dynamic device. Now this option is similar to the previous option. The only difference is that it automatically adds or removes a device in a group instead of a user. So for this demo, we will use assigned only. All right, so the next thing that we have to do is add a member in our group, right? So for that, I'll click here. And out of all of these entities, you can select the members that you want. So we had created a user named Jordan, right? So I'll go ahead and select Jordan and add Jordan as a member in my group, right? All right, I'll go ahead and select one more user here. I already had a user named Amrit. So Amrit, I'm going to add Amrit also in my group, right? All right, so now I have two members. I'll just go ahead and click on select and then I will click on create. All right, so as you can see, I have received the notification saying that the group has been created, created successfully. That means my group is here. 
and available for me to use. As you can see that the membership type is assigned and this group type is security and the name of the group is development. If I go inside that group, I will be able to see that there are two members in my group that I that are users actually, right? And if you want to delete this group, you can just go ahead and click on this delete option here. The group will be deleted easily. So this is how you create a group and add members in it in Azure Active Directory. Understand what exactly is an Azure certification? So this certification is a level of Microsoft Azure Cloud expertise that an IT professional obtains after passing one or more exams that Microsoft offers. Basically, it is to demonstrate and validate the technical cloud knowledge and skills one has obtained. Now, what are those certifications that we shall discuss as we move forward? Here, I'm going to discuss some of the major Azure certifications and after that, we will quickly discuss about them. Now, moving forward, First one is Microsoft Certified Azure Administrator Associate that is AZ-103. Next one, the Azure Developer Associate that is AZ-203. Third one, the Microsoft Certified Azure Solutions Architect that comes under the expert level that is AZ-300 and 301. Last one is the Data Lake and Data Factory. So it is usually to perform big data engineering on Microsoft Cloud services and commonly known as 70776. Now let's have a quick glance at these certifications. So now for the AZ-103 certification, this falls under the associate level. With this certification, Microsoft aims to help the candidates learn and acquire a wide range of skills that are required to be a cloud administrator, such as managing various cloud services, security, networking, storage, and many more. Previously, a candidate had to pass AZ-100 and AZ-101 certification exams in order to achieve this certification. But after receiving constant feedbacks from learners about the exam being difficult and with too much syllabus, Microsoft Learning decided to merge these two certification exams and name it as AZ-103 certification exam. With 70% of the syllabus from AZ-100 and 30% of the syllabus from AZ-101 exam. Next we have the AZ-203. So guys, this is another associate level role-based certification exam by Microsoft Azure. With this certification, Microsoft aims to help the candidates learn all the skills required in the development domains such as designing and building cloud applications, services, and many more. Before AZ-203 certification exam was introduced, AZ-200 and 201 were in the picture in order to get certified as an Azure Associate Developer. But both of these exams got retired and AZ-203 took their place. Right. Again, after receiving constant feedback from learners about the exam being difficult and with too much syllabus, Microsoft Learning decided to take the similar step for this certification exam as well and the AZ-203 exam came into the picture. And this exam pulls in approximately 70% of its objectives from the AZ-200 exam and approximately 30% of its objectives from the AZ-201 exam. Now moving forward to the another exam that is the AZ-300 and 301 exam. This is the first role-based certification exam that is launched at the expert level. With this certification, Microsoft aims to help the candidates learn the most advanced Azure skills along with learning to design a secure, reliable and scalable solution for businesses. After this certification, a candidate is expected to have gained expertise in computer, networking, security and storage. Even though the certification also covers the skills of the Azure Administrator and Azure Developer Associate level certifications, but they are not a mandatory prerequisite for the certification. In order to achieve the certification, you will have to pass the following exams which are AZ-300 that is Microsoft Azure Architect Technologies and AZ-301 that is Microsoft Azure Architect Design. So again, these two above exams are the replacement for the old 70535 exam that is Architecting Microsoft Azure Solutions. Now moving forward, that is the 70776 certification exam. So the certification requires candidates to get accustomed with implementing big data engineering on Azure. So the learners must have skills on Microsoft Azure SQL Data Warehouse, Azure Data Lake Analytics, Azure Data Factory, and Azure Stream Analytics, and subsequently perform big data best practices using the same. As informed by the Microsoft Learning, the certification name 70776 is about to be expired, and no replacement exam name is being given to it yet. However, the replacement exam would consist of all the topics from the current curriculum with a few topics removed or merged with a different topic. Right, so let's move forward. Now let's move forward. So guys, there is a huge amount of vagueness when it comes to choosing who should go for which certification, right? So moving forward with the video, let us discuss which certification is for whom. So for AZ-103 exam, candidate taking this exam are expected to have sufficient knowledge of various 
services across full IT lifecycle, applications, and their environments. At least one year of experience in an IT administration and in hands-on with server provisioning, monitoring, resource management is recommended. Now for AZ203 exam, in order to pass this exam, the candidate must have at least one year of experience of developing scalable solutions indulging in all phases of software development. And the candidate must be skilled in at least one cloud supported programming language. So this exam requires a candidate to be proficient in software development phases such as solution designing, development, deployment, testing and maintenance. Now we have AZ300 and 301 exam. If we first talk about AZ300 exam, then a candidate must have expert level skills in at least one of the expert level domains. This exam requires a candidate to have sound knowledge of various concepts in IT operations such as networking, virtualization, business continuity, data management and disaster recovery. And for AZ301, in order to pass this exam, the candidate must be skilled in Azure administration and Azure development. So skills in DevOps are also recommended. So the candidates taking this exam are expected to be able to build Azure solutions according to the business requirements, such as making decisions that help the business become secure, solutions making the business more scalable. Now moving forward to 70776. So this certification is for the candidates who design analytic solutions and build operationalized solutions on Azure. Candidates who are familiar with the features and capabilities of batch data processing, real-time processing and operationalization technologies and of course the data engineers. Now let's move forward. So guys in order to be well prepared for Azure certification exams you must know what are the objectives of the exam right. So following the same order as before let us first discuss the curriculum for AZ103 exam. Due to constant feedbacks about the exam being difficult Microsoft has divided the entire exam syllabus into five modules. So in order to ease the exam preparation let us discuss each of these modules below. Manage Azure subscriptions and resources. So guys, this percentage figure that you see here basically indicates the relative weightage of the questions from each of the modules. If the percentage is higher, then you should expect more questions from that module and vice versa. So in this module, you need to be thoroughly prepared with the managing Azure subscriptions, resource groups, analyzing resource utilization and consumption and managing role-based access control, that is RBAC. Second, we have implement and manage storage, where it holds the weightage of 15 to 20% in the exam, covering the topics like creation and configuration of storage accounts, Azure files, importing and exporting data to Azure and implementing Azure backups. Third, Deploying and managing virtual machines, holding a weightage from 15 to 20 percent, covering topics in creation and configuration of virtual machines for Windows and Linux, managing Azure VMs and automating their deployments and managing their backups. Third, we have deploying and managing virtual machines, holding a weightage from 15 to 20 percent, covering topics in creation and configuration of virtual machines for Windows and Linux. Managing Azure VMs and automating their deployments and managing their backup. Fourth one is configure and manage virtual networks, which holds a majority of weightage of around 30 to 35 percent and covering topics in create connectivity between virtual networks, implementing and managing virtual networking, network security groups, Azure load balancer, monitoring and troubleshooting virtual networks, integrating on premises network with Azure virtual network. And the fifth one and the last one is manage identities, holding a weightage from 15 to 20 percent in the exam, managing Azure active directory and AD objects, users, groups and devices, implementing and managing hybrid identities and multi-factor authentication are being covered in this module. So now for AZ203 exam. So guys, the entire exam syllabus has been divided into six modules based on the feedbacks again. So developing Azure infrastructure as a service compute solutions, which holds a relative weightage of 10 to 15 percent in the module. So in this modules, you need to be thoroughly prepared with creating containerized solutions, implementing bad jobs by using Azure bad services and implementing solutions that use virtual machines. Just a quick info guys, if you want to make a career in Azure DevOps, then IntelliPad provides a Microsoft Azure DevOps Engineer Certification Training which is taught by industry experts with more than 10 years of experience. This course is designed to upskill and land your dream job. Now let's continue with the session. Second, we have developed Azure Platform as a Service Compute Solutions where it holds a weightage of 20 to 25 percent in the exam, covering topics like creating Azure App Services, Web Apps and ABI apps, Azure app service, mobile apps and implementing Azure functions. And the third one is the developing for Azure storage, holding a weightage from 15 to 20 percent, covering the topics and developing solutions that use blob storage, 
relational database, Cosmos DB storage, and storage tables. And the fourth one is the implementing Azure security, holding a weightage from 15 to 20% and covering topics in implementing access control, authentication, and secure data solutions. Now the fifth one is monitoring, troubleshooting, and optimizing Azure solutions, holding a weightage from 15 to 20% in the exam, instrumenting solutions to support monitoring and logging, integrating caching and content delivery with the solutions, and developing code to support scalability of apps and services are being covered in this module. And the last one is connect to and expand Azure services and third party services, which holds a weightage of 20 to 25% in the exam and covering topics in establishing API gateways, integrating Azure search within solutions and developing an app service logic app. And similarly for AZ300 and 301 exam, it covers topics in deploy and configure infrastructure, implement workloads and security, create and deploy apps, implement authentication and secure data, develop for the cloud and Azure storage, determine workload requirements. Then after this comes the designing part. That is design for identity and security, design a data platform solution, design a business continuity strategy, design for deployment, migration and integration, design an infrastructure strategy. Now at last for 70776. Though the certification is on the verge of retirement, but its labels is not going to be any different than the current version. However, few transition will be there like the removal of few topics or just merge them with any topics, right? So if we talk about its objectives, then design and implement complex event processing by using Azure Stream Analytics, holding a weightage from 15 to 20%, which includes the topics like ingest data for real-time processing, design and implement Azure Stream Analytics, implement and manage the streaming pipeline, query real-time data by using the Azure Stream Analytics query language. So the next one is design and implement Azure SQL data warehouse solutions. Again, holding a weightage from 15 to 20%, including the topics like design tables in Azure SQL data warehouse, query data in Azure SQL data warehouse, integrate Azure SQL data warehouse with the other services. Then design and implement cloud-based integration by using Azure Data Factory. To implement data sets and linked services, move, transform and analyze data by using Azure Data Factory activities, orchestrate data processing by using Azure Data Factory pipelines, monitor and manage Azure Data Factory, other topics included in this. Now the last one is manage and maintain Azure SQL Data Warehouse, Azure Data Lake, Azure Data Factory and Azure Stream Analytics, holding a majority of weightage in the exam that is 20 to 25%. So this module covers the topics and provision Azure SQL Data Warehouse, Azure Data Lake, Azure Data Factory, Stream Analytics, implement authentication, authorization, auditing, manage data recovery for Azure SQL Data Warehouse, Azure Data Lake. So this module covers the topics and provision Azure SQL Data Warehouse, Data Lake, Data Factory, Stream Analytics, implement authentication, authorization, auditing, design and implement storage solution for big data implementations. So that's all for the objective part. So now let's move forward and discuss about the exam pattern followed by how you should prepare for this exam. No doubt, the Microsoft Azure certification exams are one of the most challenging exams in the ad industry. Although the number of questions in this exam are subject to change over time, you can expect around 40 to 60 questions in this exam. And also, you can expect different questions formats and tie-ups in this exam, including review screen, marked review, multiple choices, short answer, hot area, repeated answer choices, drag and drop, case studies, the best answer and active screen. All the questions in this exam can follow any of these question types. You will get around 150 minutes to complete the examination with an additional 30 minutes of sitting time. For the good results in the exam, it is required to follow the weight associated with each exam module during your Azure exam preparation. The pricing depends on which location you are taking your exam from. For example, if you are taking your exam in USA, then it is going to cost you around 160. But if you are taking it in India, then you will have to pay an amount of 4800 INR. And the pricing is subject to change without a notice from country to country. As the pricing does not include applicable taxes, you need to confirm with your examination provider for an exact fee. If you are a student, then you can get a free reduction in the exam if you can submit your valid education credentials. Moreover, Microsoft Partner Network Program member, Microsoft Trainers and Academic Program members are also eligible for the reduced pricing. Most of the Microsoft technical questions require a passing score of 700. Any score greater or equal to 700 will be marked as passed. Otherwise, it will be marked as failed. Most of the short questions in this exam are one point. If any question is worth more than that, then it will be indicated in the question part itself. Also note that there are no penalty for an incorrect answer. The exam is available only in English language. 
Now we know of the examination pattern. Let us discuss few of the tips for the exam preparation. How to prepare for this exam? The first tip is to plan the module structure and study accordingly. For an example, if you are going to start with app services and containers, then make sure you have already covered the topics of creating the app services, containers, container images and docker files so that you know the basics of implementing app services in the container. Or if you are going to implement the Azure backup, then you must know about how to create and configure the storage accounts along with the configuration of Azure files so that you know the basics of implementing the configurations and storage account. You would require a lot of portions and verified study materials on Azure in order to earn good passing scores. You can refer to the official curriculum and study guide to plan your module study and get the right information. After that, practice simple test online. Once gained enough knowledge with this, then you should be able to step up into the next part of practicing hands-on. And this is the most crucial part in your learning journey. So guys, you can easily perform hands-on in Azure services since Azure provides a free tier option for newbies and you get a $300 of credit in your Azure account. Once you are So in addition to that, check for the online training so that in case you have queries related to the subject, then you can clear them right away and experts help is always recommended. Last but not the least, join the forums related to Microsoft Azure and search for questions related to your subject and check out the questions asked by the other people and go through the answers posted by audiences. It will always be helpful for you. Last suggestion from my end is that go for dumps only when you are thoroughly prepared with the subject. You might be able to clear the exam and get certification from it. But believe me guys, you won't be job ready. As during the interview, without the practical approach, you won't be able to crack it or be able to answer the questions by interviewer because you took the shortcut to get certified, right? So be aware of the shortcuts, do a thorough study with the proper implementations in Azure and rise up in your career path. All right, so now you might be wondering how to take time for all this research and study. That is where we at IntelliPath are here for you. We understand that US professionals face problems to take out time for upskilling from your personal life, right? So that is why we have done all the hard work for you and have come up with the comprehensive courses on AZ-103, AZ-203, AZ-300 and 301 and Azure Data Lake and Data Factory. And each course is curated by the industry experts which includes the different case studies and assignments based on the each module along with the industry oriented projects. If you are interested then you can go through the course details with the link provided in the description box. First, let's look into what this Azure Cloud serves. So, what is Azure Cloud Service? Microsoft Azure is an ever-expanding set of cloud services to help your organization meet your business challenges. Azure offers services on a pay-as-you-go pricing model in computing, web services, data storage, analytics, etc. Et so, there are so many different domains in which Azure is providing services. So, to be very simple, Azure is a cloud provider, a public cloud provider, as well as you can get private cloud services and hybrid cloud services from them. So first of all, Azure is Microsoft owned. Azure is a cloud provider. So after AWS, Azure is the most popular cloud service in the world. So when an interview asks this, you can be basic as well as advanced. I would suggest you just give the apt answer what exactly it is. Microsoft Azure is a cloud service which provides you various different services in various domains like computing, web services, data, data storage. And you can access those services via an internet device. So you can access them through a laptop or a desktop or your mobile device, anything with an internet connectivity, you will be able to access Microsoft Azure. Okay, so we've seen what is Azure Cloud Service. Okay guys, now let's look into the second question, which is how does Azure compare with AWS? So first of all, AWS owns 32.3% of the market share in the public cloud industry, but Azure owns only 16.2%, which is just half of what AWS owns. But Azure is currently the fastest growing cloud network and also it has 54 different regions in which it has availability zones but AWS has 69 availability zones across only 24 regions. So regions in the sense are geographically located regions for example Azure has uh, regions like South India, North India, East US, West US, Central US, Europe, Central Europe. So there are so many different regions like that. So like that, there are 24 different regions, but within those regions, AWS has 69 availability zones, but Azure has uh, 54 regions. It has, in 54 regions, it has 54 availability zones and it's currently growing. So this basically shows Azure is better in availability zones, that is data centers, because it has a wide range of data centers in various regions. 
Next, comparing the services. Uh, if you already know about cloud, AWS, and Azure, then this would be easy. EC2, S3, RDS are AWS services. The same exact service. EC2 is equal to virtual machine, Azure virtual machines. S3 is equal to storage, blob storage. RDS is equal to SQL databases in Azure. So EC2 is used to launch and create servers, same as VM does. And then S3 and blob storage are for storing objects. RDS and SQL databases can create relational databases running on the cloud. So you can distinguish between different services. And then finally, the paper uh, hour model and paper minute model. So this is one of the important difference you'll have to note down. Because AWS does not have a pay per minute model yet, it charges you for the hour which you used, but Azure will charge you only for the minute. For example, if you're running a service, uh, let's say you are running the same server, Linux server in AWS and Azure for five minutes, in AWS will be charged the uh, hour. For example, if the hour charged in both AWS and Azure is $5, so it would be $5 for, for 60 minutes if it's $5. So you will be charged for the whole $5 in AWS, but in Azure, that would be not the same because you will be charged per minute. So if it is $5 for the hour, that is 60 minutes. So that will be reduced to one minute. So that would be multiplied into five. So you will be charged very, very, very less in Azure compared to AWS if you are using services for a very less period of time. So if you're using some service for two to uh, 10, 15 minutes, then go with Azure because that will not charge you as much as AWS. Okay, so we've seen the second question. So I think you can coagulate into an answer and give it, uh, I'm just explaining you the differences, but you'll have to provide it more of a answer. And then comes the roles implemented in Microsoft Azure. So there are three main roles, the web role, the worker role, and the virtual machine role. First, the web role, this gives a web solution that is the front end. Uh, this is like an ASP.NET application while under facilitating. Azure provides IIS, which is basically a web server uh, and required services. So web role provides a web solution. Basically, it's a front end. It can be a website's front end. The worker, load is a worker role is a solution for background service. It can run long activities. For example, if you have a a log activity if you want to monitor the log activity you can use a worker role and then finally a virtual machine role so this can act both as a web and a worker role and this is executed by virtual machines the virtual machine role gives the client the capacity to modify the virtual machine on which the web and worker roles are running so for example Web role only uh, contradicts to the website, the front end. Worker role only contradicts to the business logic, which is the background or the back end part. So in virtual machines, you can run both a web role and a worker role, which means you can have a website running as well as a background process running. So these are the three main roles which are implemented in Microsoft Azure. So I think you get the point of this. So basically in Azure, Mostly it is used to launch applications. So for an application, obviously there will be a web role, which would be the application itself hosted. And then the worker role, which is background processes. For example, if a person wants to uh, retrieve an image from the website, so they'll uh, enter the information, click a button and a background code will run. So that code would be your worker role. And these both can be run on a virtual machine, which makes it a virtual machine role. So these are the three most basic roles. And the next question is, so this might be a question which may be asked, but this does not have a certain answer. I'm just giving you the three most popular and commonly used services. So talk about the three principal segments of Microsoft Azure platform. Okay, so first of all, compute and storage comes by default because they are the most used. Compute services and storage services are the most used services in any cloud platform. And then you can choose one as per your need. For example, you can choose databases or you can choose uh, monitoring, managing, governance. You can choose anything. So here I've chosen databases. For example, you can uh, tell the answer like this. So the principal segments of Microsoft Azure platform are, it can be basically anything, but here 
the most commonly used services comes under the compute and storage platform and i also would say databases because every single application needs a compute needs storage and also database so for example in compute there is virtual machines app services and function apps which can be used to develop an application and also host that application with the backend code and then there is microsoft azure storage where we have blob storage table storage where we have the, uh, file storage we have azure queues so we can use all of them to store objects we can use them to store images videos audio files we can use them to store no sql data and finally comes databases where we can store record or structured information and also there is a cosmos db which is for no sql and also if your application needs a Uh, analytical database we have sql data warehouses for that purpose too so compute storage and databases i would say they are the most uh, they are the three principal segments of microsoft azure platform because they provide so many different services pretty sure even azure uses them for their own benefit okay so this is the fourth question so we have seen four questions up till now so the fifth question is what is the distinction between azure queues and azure service bus queues okay first of all storage queues and service bus queues are different so first what are storage queues uh, storage queues featuring a simple rest based uh, get put peek interface providing reliable persistent messaging system within and between services service bus queues are part of a broader azure messaging infrastructure that supports queuing as well as publish or subscribe and more advanced integration patterns Okay so the simplest thing you'll have to know is if your application needs to store more than 80 GB of messages go with storage queues but if it needs only lesser than that and it won't exceed 80 GB you can go with a service bus queue so the thing is storage queues are mainly used to move messages between services or to a end user so you can see it is a rest based get put peek interface basically you can get a message from it you can upload or send a message through it and in service bus you can do the same but also you can integrate advanced patterns for example you can integrate a queuing system which basically filters multiple messages according to their priority and that does not come with storage queues also storage queues are very easy to use you can use it between services you can create a queue within minutes Service bus is has a broader usage in Azure itself. So these are the main two differences. That if you want to use an application for your own personal use, go with storage queues. If it is a bigger application which needs shorter message uh, storing, go with service bus queues. So the dis- the main distinction between them is storage queues are simple, uh, rest based g- get put peek interface, but service bus queues is involved with the azure messaging infrastructure itself and this supports queuing as well as normal publish and subscribe which comes with storage queues as well also you can integrate advanced integration patterns by which cannot be done in storage queues where you can filter different messages according to their priority and various other features and factors okay so the next question is what is stable storage in microsoft azure so Azure Table Storage Service stores a lot of organized information. Azure Tables are perfect for putting away organized non-relational data. It is a NoSQL data store which acknowledges verified calls from inside and outside the Azure cloud. So, uh, basically Table Storage is a NoSQL data store where you can store non-relational data. That's basically NoSQL non-relational database. Okay. So now what exactly is table storage first let's look into what exactly it is first of all a table is a collection of entities a record can contain numerous tables basically when you create a table you can have uh, multiple tables or a single table and it ha- it is a collection of entities so what are entities entities is an arrangement of properties like a database row an entity can be up to 1 mb in size so basically an entity is an item within the table for example if it is a table for shoes and inside that every single shoe name would be a entity next comes properties a property is a name value pair every entity can incorporate up to 252 properties to store data for example uh, let's say in entity we have three different shoe types one is 
uh, Adidas, one is Reebok, one is Nike. And inside Adidas, you can have 252 properties like color, type, shoe, model number, and so many different properties under that entity, which defines that particular entity. So inside a table, there can be any number of entities. And inside those entities, there can be 252 different types of properties to store data. So that's what Azure Table Storage is used for. It is a service used to store a lot of organized information in which you, uh, you can store non-relational data. It is a NoSQL data store which acknowledges verified calls from inside and outside the Azure cloud. That is, you can integrate it with Azure services inside the cloud as well as third-party services from outside the cloud. And table is a collection of entities. Entities is basically the uh, main item inside a table and properties are the sub Basically, a property explains what an entity is and the entities completely uh, explain what a table is. So that's it. That's what that is what table storage is. Just a quick info guys. Test your knowledge of DevOps by answering this question. Which of the following are the popular tools for DevOps? A. Jenkins B. Ansible C. Nagios D. All of the above Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to IntelliPack to know the right answer. Now, let's continue with the session. The next question is what is auto scaling in Azure? So what is auto scaling in Azure? Scaling by including extra instance instances is frequently referred to as scaling out. So this is a commonly used term which is called scaling out. So Azure likewise supports scaling up by utilizing bigger role rather than more role instances. An auto-scaling solution reduces the amount of manual work engaged in dynamically scaling an application. So this is pretty simple guys. So let's say you have a virtual machine which has a, let's say it has a website running on it. Now there are a lot of users using it right now, but that one particular virtual machine is able to handle them. So let's say there are 20 users. Now, right now, this particular virtual machine is able to handle all the 20 users and the website is not crashing, but suddenly your website has gone viral and there are 200 users. Now your virtual machine will not be able to handle because there are more users and the CPU utilization will go high. The traffic, the overload of your server will go high because of that, the usage also will increase and then your website might crash. So. What you'll have to do, you'll have to again uh, start up a virtual machine or another server. Once you've done that, you will have to configure your website and make it run again. So this will take some time until then you would have lost a lot of users. So instead you can start off with using auto scaling. So for example, you can see the image in the right corner below in which the, in, to the left, there are two virtual machines, which is written as minimum two. That basically means, uh, let's say you have a website and right now your website has two virtual machines and that is the minimum number of virtual machines and it'll never go below that. Even a virtual mission is, uh, let's say even a virtual mission has been terminated accidentally, it'll launch one more virtual machine within a span of a minute and that will be ready for your website. So now to the right side, you can see virtual machines as needed and maximum is equal to five. So the maximum number of virtual machines you will get is five. The minimum number of virtual machines running will be two. And there you can add or subtract three virtual machines. For example, if you have two virtual machines right now, you can add three more or two more or one more or you don't need to add at all, but you cannot go below number two or you cannot go above number five. You can use auto scaling solution to do this. For example, right now you have two virtual machines and the work overload goes very, very high. So right now you want one virtual machine. So it will launch one virtual machine. Now it will monitor all of the three virtual machines. Again, if the user count is completely increasing, it will launch one more. And again, if the users are increasing, the traffic uh, is overloading. Then again, it will launch one more virtual machine. So here the maximum is number five. So it will launch up to five virtual machines. After that, even though the user base is increasing, it won't go above that. You will have to change that in the configuration. For example, max is equal to 10. So it can launch up to 10 different virtual machines. Okay, so got it. 
So I think you understood what exactly auto scaling is. So you can explain it simply. For example, you can tell auto scaling solution reduces the manual work engaged in dynamically scaling an application. Instead, we can set up an auto scaling solution in Azure where it gives you the number of required instances as such as whenever the traffic increases, it will give you more instances. When the traffic decreases, it will reduce the number of resources being used, which is also cost optimized. And this will reduce your billing cost. So now let's look into the next question, which would be what are the features of Microsoft Azure? So what are the features of Microsoft Azure? So there are so many different features. So let's just look into uh, three features. So first Azure App Services enables designers to assemble the sites utilizing various different programming languages. You can use ASP.NET, PHP, you can use Java, Python, and send these websites utilizing FTP or Git. Basically, you can use GitHub to have this code and you can integrate it with Azure App Services so that uh, Azure itself will launch your website for you. It will maintain your website for you. You just have to uh, work on your code. Next comes SQL databases, formerly known as Azure database, makes, broadens and scales the application into the cloud utilizing Microsoft SQL Server. So in SQL databases provided by Azure, you don't need to scale out anything. For example, if you have set up a maximum size, whenever the size of the database increases, it will automatically scale the storage and also you can manually scale the compute. And finally, this is Microsoft's platform as a service that supports multi-level applications and automated deployment. That is Azure is Microsoft's platform as a service because they're giving you a platform to work on various different services. Even though services like virtual machines are infrastructure as a service, it comes under IaaS, but Microsoft Azure as a whole is a platform as a service because they are giving you a platform which you can work on different uh, cloud services. So these are some features about Microsoft Azure. You can talk about them. So the next question is what are the difference between a public cloud and a private cloud? This is one of the most basic questions. You can easily answer them. So look at the image at the top. So first of all, public cloud, elasticity, utility pricing, leverage, expertise, and then private cloud, total control, regulation, flexibility. So let's compare this. First of all, elasticity. That is, you can launch any number of services. It can go up, it can go down. You can have any number of users. You can provide the access to users. You can cut off the access whenever you want. So it's more elastic. And then coming to write its total control. You can mention the administrator and only they will have control over the private cloud. So this basically increases security in private cloud, but public cloud is widely used and also you can see leverage expertise. That means if you're using Microsoft Azure as a public cloud, then you will be able to leverage expertise because they have so many different security professionals working for Microsoft and they will be guarding your virtual machines because you have taken a virtual machine from Azure itself. And coming to private cloud, you'll have to maintain, monitor all of that. And then comes utility pricing and regulation. So utility pricing in the sense you only pay for what you use. In private cloud, you will pay for everything you have taken up and also regulation in the sense you can stop someone to access something. You can uh, stop a service overall. You don't need to use a service. So in private cloud, you have the whole control. In public cloud, you have partial control. Okay, so now let's look into the most basics of them. A public cloud is utilized as a service through the internet by users. So anyone can use it while a private cloud is deployed within specific limits like a firewall settings and is totally overseen and checked by users dealing with it in an organization. So a public cloud is used for launching applications for public use, that is uh, end user use. Private cloud is used, mostly used for deploying applications within a specified limit. For example, within an organization, you can launch applications. So you can do that using private cloud. So this is the basic differences between public and private cloud. So the next question would be hybrid cloud. What do you comprehend about hybrid cloud? So basically a company can use both public and private cloud. So a combination of them is a hybrid cloud. So hybrid cloud is a blend of internal and external cloud services. So internal in the sense within the organization, external in the sense for users, a mix of private cloud joined with the utilization of public cloud services. This kind of cloud is most appropriate when you need 
to keep the classified information at your vicinity private cloud and consume alternate services from a public cloud for example if you have mission critical data you can store that in the private cloud and the application itself can be running on the public cloud because the application does not have any important information and even though there is a security breach there can be nothing taken from that but your mission critical data and code is stored in a private cloud which only you can access so this is hybrid cloud and the next question is what is a storage key so your storage key access keys are similar to a root password for your storage account always be careful to protect your access keys use as your key vault to manage and rotate your keys securely you can view and copy your account access keys with the azure portal powershell or azure cli the azure portal also provides a connection string for your storage account that you can copy for example if you are logging into your storage account in azure portal it's pretty simple to log in you can just enter you can just enter as such but if you are trying to access your storage account from powershell or as your cli uh, you will have to use your storage keys so it's pretty it's basically uh, an entry point for your storage account so you can use that also azure portal provides a connection string for your storage account that you can copy and use it in your azure cli or powershell so to be simple it is a uh, it is similar to a root password for your storage account and it is a key which you can use to log in into your storage account to check out the uh, storage containers like blob storage table storage within the storage account itself so it's pretty simple storage account and then comes what is microsoft azure traffic manager so it enables users to control the distribution of user traffic of installed azure cloud services there are three distinctive load balancing strategies provided by azure uh the manager who uses on traffic applies a, a routing policy to the domain name servers questions on your domain names and maps the dns courses to the apt instances of your application so let me explain to you in simple words so first of all azure traffic manager is a dns based traffic load balancer that enables you to distribute traffic optimally to services across global azure regions while providing high availability and responsiveness so basically traffic manager uses a dns to direct client requests to the most appropriate endpoint on traffic routing method so basically let me explain to you this so let's say you are trying to access a website using a website's url name now when you type that your first point of uh, entry would be the traffic manager so once you hit that the traffic manager will use dns and it will check to which ip address should this particular url name is uh, should be redirected so once when it finds that it will redirect the client request to the most appropriate service for example in intellipad.com we have intellipad.com which is the main page and intellipad.com slash blog so for example i'm searching for intellipad.com slash blog now this will go to the traffic manager once it hits the traffic manager it will check out the ip address for this particular url once it gets the ip addresses it will transfer me to the blog page not the main intellipad.com page so that's what traffic manager does and it's pretty simple to use it so you can start off with traffic manager even now so you can combine traffic manager with auto scaling so that it is better to use so if you're using traffic manager with auto scaling basically what you do you will be able to launch and terminate multiple virtual machines as well as you'll be able to launch multiple applications in different virtual machines and connect two auto scaling groups together in which the traffic manager is the first entry point and for example in one auto scaling group there is app 1 in another auto scaling group there is app 2 so now it hits the traffic uh, manager if you are trying to access app 2 it will take you to app 2 if you are trying to access app 1 it will take you to the app 1 auto scaling group so this is how you can use traffic manager the next question is what is microsoft azure portal this is again a basic question so microsoft azure portal is the website which you are logging into when you are using azure so view and manage all of your applications in one unified hub you can view your web applications your databases your virtual machines your network storage and vst projects now it is easy to keep tabs on current and projected costs so microsoft azure is not just for managing all your all your applications and services 
it can also be used to manage your current and projected billing costs so azure portal automatically calculates your existing charges as well as it will forecast your future or monthly charge even if you are managing hundreds of resources across several applications for example if you are using only one service still it will give you the billed amount for right now and also the projected bill if you are also using hundreds of services again it will do the same thing for you regardless of the scale so microsoft azure a portal is the website which you are using to access microsoft azure services that is more than enough if you want to tell more you can tell it's a unified hub to manage all the azure services it also provides cost management uh, services uh, you can say it has a different web page for every single service you can access every single service directly from the portal itself and also manage monitor and do uh, everything else through azure portal itself and also you can access azure portal from any internet connected device okay so we've seen that the next question is what is elastic pool in sql azure so we already saw what exactly is an sql database so now azure sql database elastic pools are a simple cost effective solution for managing and scaling multiple databases that have varying and unpredictable usage demands Databases in an elastic pool are on a single server and share a set of resources at a set price. Okay, let me make it simple for you. So right now you have you want various databases for different applications, and all these databases uh, need to have a different set of specifications. Now what you can do is you can launch an elastic pool, which is basically a single server with different sets of resources within it. You can launch multiple databases. and you can specify the required set of resources for a particular database within the elastic pool itself you can launch any number of databases within that server uh, and how much that server can handle and all of the databases is shared will use shared resources and the price for that will be the same even though you are using uh, any number of databases so let's say you can have 10 databases within that elastic pool or you can have five databases or you can have only one database but you will be charged the same because you are sharing the same number of resources across all the databases so this is elastic pool next is what is is your sql database so an sql database is just an approach to get associated with cloud services where you can store your database into the cloud if you already know about sql databases for example mysql postgresql or ms sql database you will understand this easily because it is basically the same relational database on your local system hosted on a cloud system and given remote access to you so you can tell it pretty simply sql azure database is a database server running in the azure data center and to which you are given remote access to so that you can access that sql database microsoft sql azure has a similar component of sql server that is it provides high accessibility versatility and security in the core microsoft azure sql database has an element it makes backups of each active database automatically so this feature does not come with a local database because it does not take backup it has only one storage where the data is actually stored and if that is lost your data is lost but in microsoft azure sql databases it's not the case you can enable automatic uh, database backups so if your database is active and new data is coming in it will automatically back it up so even though your database has been terminated you can use the backup to launch a database with the same existing data set so this is azure sql databases now let's look into the next question which is what are the different types of storage areas in microsoft azure so there is blobs there is table storage there is queues and there are still more but you can uh, talk about three a uh, maximum so there is also file storage which is basically a shared access file storage so you can also talk about that if you want but right now i'll will be looking into blob table and queues so queues we already looked into now we'll just look into blobs and tables even table storage was a separate question so you can also answer that so first of all what is blob so blob is the most commonly used uh, storage type in azure so the full form of blob would be binary large objects so you can see that bl 
OB, which is basically binary large objects, blobs. So blobs are a component for storing a lot of content or binary data. You can store pictures, audio, visual documents. You can store video. You can store any type of data. They can scale up to 200 terabytes and can be acquired by utilizing REST APIs. Very, very simple to start off with blob storage. You can create a storage account and create a blob container in which you can upload images, videos, documents, anything you want. You can store any type of binary data within blob storage. So that is one of the main area in Microsoft Azure. Next comes table storage, which is a non-relational data store where you can store organized information and also you can store them using uh, a uh, format, which is table entity and with an entity you can have properties so that we saw next is queue the sole target of a queue is to empower communication among the web and worker role instances they help in storing messages that may be accessed by a customer so as told queues can be used to connect multiple services as well as services with the end user so these are three main storage areas one more is a file storage which is basically a shared storage access which you can use to connect the same storage to multiple virtual machines. So every single user in every single virtual machine will be able to access the same data store, which will save you a lot of storage as well as cost. Next question is what is the concept of blob storage? I explained to you what exactly is blob. So let me just go into that more. So blob as told again, it is binary large objects and includes text files, images, audios, and videos. Azure Blob is a service that stores massive unstructured data that can be accessed from any place via protocols like HTTP or HTTPS. So how does this work? How can you access these objects using HTTP or HTTPS? So it's pretty simple. Whenever you upload an object like image or audio into the blob storage, it will have a URL. So it will be provided a URL and you can use that URL to access that particular object. For example, if I'm uploading an image, that image will have a URL for that image itself. Now you can use that URL to access that particular image. So how will you access that? Using protocols like HTTP or HTTPS. So now what else you can use as your blobs for? Storing data for disaster recovery, backup and archiving, also storing files for shared access. Shared access in the sense, if you upload an object and you have a link for it, you can share that link with multiple users so that they all can use that particular blob storage as a star shared storage. So that can uh, happen. Also, you can use it for disaster recovery. That is, you can store data in different regions in blob storage itself and use it for backup and then also archiving data. So this is blob storage. Now let's look into the next question. So now this question is what is Azure DevOps in Microsoft Azure? So if you are already familiar with DevOps methodologies, then this would be easier to understand. If you're not, I'll explain to you what exactly is DevOps in a few sentences. So first of all, DevOps is not a tool. It is a methodology which companies uh, follow and implement in their software development lifecycle to automate the entire life cycle. So Azure DevOps is not a methodology, it is a service. You may be confused by the name, but DevOps is the methodology, but Azure DevOps is a DevOps service provided by Azure and it is developed by the Microsoft team. It was previously called as VSTS or Visual Studio Team Services. Azure DevOps provides easy automation by having predefined build options for the deployment of applications. For example, if you're trying to launch an Angular application, it already has build options for it. It has NPM packages in build. You can have a build. You can basically create a build in a matter of minutes. For example, if you're also uh, launching a Java application, it has a Maven build option. You can use that to build that application. So that's why they are saying it provides you easy automation and also free defined, predefined build options. And finally, it also monitors your tools and it uses monitor to monitoring tools to monitor your application or your project which you have launched within Microsoft Azure DevOps. Okay, so Azure DevOps has various different tools. So let me explain to you those tools. So one tool is Azure Repos, which is a repository like GitHub. 
so it's pretty similar it's basically the same and then comes your pipelines pipelines is the tool which you use to implement a ci cd pipeline a ci cd pipeline is the one which you use to automate the software lifecycle and then comes test plans which is basically used to test the application and then comes as your uh, boards which is a kanban board which is basically like jira where you can implement uh, work items you can implement sprints and then finally you have as your artifacts where you can store the packages like npm nuget in the same place so that it is easier to access them also finally you get an azure dashboard where you can access and also create and launch widgets where which will be helpful for your application for example you can see how many builds have been succeeded how many have failed how much time it is taking to build a particular project uh, how many times it has been deployed and how many users are using our application right now so all these widgets can be used in azure devops so you've seen that the next question is what is azure app service we already discussed this but still i'll explain it to you once again uh, so to be very simple azure app service is a completely a managed service provided by microsoft azure so within azure azure app service is a completely managed platform as a service not infrastructure as a service but a pass it is a pass offering for proficient developers that conveys a rich arrangement of abilities to web mobile and integration services so if a developer wants to just concentrate on the code which he is developing and doesn't want to manage the servers and the other side of it that is the uh, back end part of it so what he can do he can opt for azure app service where he can launch one and he can just upload his code into azure app service which will take care of provisioning servers uploading the code with the server and also serving that website and also provide you an url which you can use to look into the website so you can do all of this using azure app service and you don't need to manage anything azure will manage everything for you it will launch as told it will launch servers it will also monitor and manage them for you and if you want anything else if you want to scale it up again you have an option for that if you want to look into the server which it has launched again you have a shell option for that mobile applications in azure app service offer a very adaptable universally accessible mobile application development platform for enterprise developers and system integrators that conveys a rich set of capacities to mobile engineers so basically using azure app services you cannot just uh, launch websites you can also launch mobile applications and they are very adaptable and universally accessible just a quick info guys if you want to make a career in azure devops then intellipad provides a microsoft azure devops engineer certification training which is taught by industry experts with more than 10 years of experience this course is designed to upskill and land your dream job now let's continue with the session mobile application development platform for example you might be using android studio or xcode so in this you will be able to launch both of them and they will run successfully so next we'll look into cmd let in azure so it's it's a pretty simple answer so cmd let is a command basically it's a powershell command and this is utilized as a part of the powershell environment so cmd lets command lets are summoned by the windows powershell to automate the scripts which are in the command line for example you have created a script now you want to automate the script you can go with command let Windows PowerShell runtime additionally invokes them automatically through Windows PowerShell APIs. You can also automate CMD let commands which will automate other scripts using PowerShell APIs. So to be pretty simple, CMD let is a lightweight command which you can use in the PowerShell environment and it is used to automate scripts. For example, if you want to launch virtual machine at a particular uh, time or if you want to monitor a virtual machine at 5 p.m. in the evening every single day, you can launch that script and you can automate it using CMD let and it will run that script every uh, every day at 5 p.m. Okay so the next one is Microsoft Azure Scheduler so Azure Scheduler enables you to invoke activities for example calling https endpoints or presenting a message on a storage queue on any schedule 
With Scheduler, you make jobs in the cloud that dependably call services both inside and outside of Azure and execute jobs on demand on a routinely repeating schedule or assign them on a for a future date. So in the name itself, you can understand Microsoft Azure Scheduler. So it basically schedules certain things for you. But what does it schedule? It schedules jobs on the cloud. So it can be within Azure or outside of Azure and as mentioned, it will execute those jobs on demand and it can be done on a repeating scale that is, for example, every day or every week, or you can assign them for a future date to run only once so that you can do using Microsoft Azure scheduler. For example, it can call an HTTPS endpoints or it can present a message on a storage queue on any schedule. So you can use the scheduler for any service on Azure or outside of Azure. So it's pretty simple. It is uh, explainable by, by name itself. So to be simpler, you can tell this Microsoft Azure scheduler is a service which you can use to schedule a certain task in Microsoft Azure or outside of Microsoft Azure to execute a job on demand, which can be executed repeatedly, or it can be set to a future date for execution only once. So the next question is how can you create an HD insight cluster in Azure. So let me explain it to you in, uh, in, in a very simple way. So you can tell this because this is an interview, you will be asked questions, you will be able to answer them with words. So to make an HD inside cluster, first of all, you'll have to open Azure portal, then click on new, you can select data services and you can click on HD insight or you can just search HD insight and get into it. So once you get into it, you will have multiple options. You will have Hadoop, you will have HBase and Storm and more options as well. So Hadoop is the default and native execution of our Apache Hadoop and HD Insight provides you uh, Hadoop as the default option. And then comes HBase, which is an Apache open source NoSQL database based on Hadoop that gives random access and solid consistency for a lot of unstructured data. Storm as such, it is a distributed fault tolerant open source computation system that enables you to process data in real time. So the thing is, I'm not going to explain how to HBase and Storm right now. I'm just going to explain to you what is HD Insight. So HD Insight is an analytic service which you can use to launch Hadoop on the Azure cloud or other Hadoop ecosystem services like HBase, Storm or Spark on Azure cloud. So to launch HD Insights, it's pretty simple, but to work with it, it is a little tough. So to launch HD Insight, you will just have to go to the HD Insight uh, cluster and you can choose the service which you want and you can launch it. So HD Insight, again, it's an analytic service and you can launch the big data or analytic service which you want from it. Next question is what is text analytics API in Azure Machine? So let me put it simply, first of all, text analytics APIs comes under cognitive services. So API, the application program interface. So this particular uh, API is for text analytics, which can be used to uh, search a particular word or it can be used for keyword mining. Okay, now let me, let us just read this once. The API can be used or utilized to analyze unstructured content for tasks such as sentiment analysis and key phrase extraction. Sentiment, uh, sentiment analysis in the sense, let's say you have a complete page of content. Now you want to see the sentiment of that content, whether the statement is happy uh, or sad or neutral. So you can check out that using various keys and you can enter those words into the API so that when it runs, it will check whether it is positive or negative. So you can see it has a numeric score between zero and one. And when it comes near one, it is highly positive. And it, when it comes near zero, it is highly negative sentiment. So that you can see this for sentiment analysis and key phrase extraction in the sense, if you have a very huge document and if you want to check whether this particular key phrase comes inside it and you can use the text analytics API to check out the entire document. The upside of this API is that another new model need not be planned and prepared. The user just needs to bring the data and call the service to get the sentiment results. So they are telling that the best part of this API is that you don't need to call another service to run this API. Instead, you just have to bring the data set and call this API to run on the data set and get the sentiment results immediately. 
So I think you got it. It is a text analytics API mainly used for tasks like sentiment analysis and key phrase extraction. You have two numeric scores, zero and one. Near zero, it is negative and near one, it is highly positive. Uh, it's basically sentiment. And the upside is you don't need to call any other service. You can directly call this API and upload a data set and it will give you the sentiment results. Next question is what is migrate tool? So again, in the name itself, you can get this answer migration a migration from the on-premise setup to the cloud or from the cloud to the on-premise setup. This is a central hub of tools to discover assets and migrate workloads to Azure. So you can migrate any type of workload into Azure. So it provides support for key migration scenarios across servers, data, databases, web applications, and virtual desktops. It saves costs and migrate efficiently with free tooling and Azure Copt optimization. So you can use the Azure Migrate tool to migrate databases or servers or web applications from your on-premise setup to the Azure cloud seamlessly. So for example, if you want to migrate your database, you will have to provide the details like the endpoint, then you'll have to provide the username and password, and then the destination would be a Azure database. You can provide the details of the Azure database. And once you click start, it'll migrate the data from the on-premise database into the Azure database. And it's very, very simple to start with. So this is basically Azure Migrate tool. You can easily explain this with two or three sentences. And we've come to the final question, which is what is Azure service level agreement? First of all, the SLA ensures that when you send two or more role instances for each role, access to your cloud service will be maintained not less than 99.9% .9 of the time. Additionally, identification and recorrection activities will be started 99.9% .9 of the time when a role's instance procedure isn't running. So let me explain to you SLA in simple words. It's an agreement in which Azure tells you that this particular service will be running for this amount of time. So for example, if you are using a service for 10 minutes, Azure provides you a SLA stating that your application will run 99.9% .9 of the time in that 10 minute period. So your application can go down only for a 0.01%. That's very, very less. So like that Azure will provide you. If you are using a free trail service, uh, they don't mention an SLA because it's your free trail and they don't give you any benefit for you. But if you have a paid Azure account, if you're paying every single month, they will provide you an SLA for every single service, which will mention that this particular service will run for this amount of time. So for storage, it's basically high. For example, it would be 99.9999% of the time. It will be always up. It will never go down. So SLA is a statement which tells you this particular service will stay up for this amount of time and it will not go down. For example, if you're using it for one hour, it'll stay up for 99% of the time and it may go for 1% of the time. It's not that it will go, it may go. So this is Azure SLAs. I hope you understood all of the questions which we've taught. So our first question asks us, can we explain the Git architecture? Now, this is fairly an important question. Reason being only if you understand the underlying basics of how Git works, will you be able to troubleshoot a problem when you face it and when you are working in a company as a DevOps engineer, all right? So let us try to explain what Git basically is and how its architecture is. Now, most of you might know that Git is a distributed version control system. Now, what is a distributed version control system? Let us explain it using a diagram. In a distributed version control system, basically your repository it is distributed among the people who are contributing to that repository. And that is why it is called distributed. So that means that anyone who wants to make a change in the code that is present in this repository has to first copy this repository on his local system, commit the changes to the local file system of this repository and only then he can push this repository onto the or push the code changes or the feature additions and everything to the remote repository right nobody can work directly on the remote repository and this is 
the main principle of how git works and that is the reason it is called a distributed version control system right if you were to talk about the life cycle as to what are the steps to implement if somebody wants to uh, say upload or change some code present in our remote repository so the first thing that they have to do is pull the repository from the remote system once they have pulled the repository it becomes their local repository change whatever files they want to change and then once they have done with the changes they will have to do a git commit or they'll have to commit the files to the local repository just a quick info guys test your knowledge of azure by answering this question what are the different cloud deployment models in Azure? A. Private cloud B. Public cloud C. Hybrid cloud D. All the above Comment your answer in the comment section below. Subscribe to IntelliPath to know the right answer. Now, let's continue with the session. Once the files have been committed, they will have to be pushed to the remote repository so that it becomes visible to anyone and everyone who will pull this project the next time. All right. This is how the whole Git architecture works. Now, I hope you guys understand what is the working of Git and what exactly is the architecture of Git. Moving forward. Now, let's talk about the next question, which says in git how can you revert a commit that has already been pushed and made public right so basically you have done some changes in the code you committed those changes to your local repository and now you have also pushed the changes to the github repository now if you have a cid ci cd pipeline in place with which basically means that the moment you commit to git it automatically takes the code and deploys it on a server if that is the kind of configuration that you have done then probably the code that you have pushed has also been deployed on a server and that is when you you know you come 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 to sense that you know the code is wrong and you quickly have to change uh, the code so that everything becomes working again right now this is a very hot fix or this is a very quick fix that uh, probably every DevOps engineer employs when there, whenever there is a problem in the production server, right? So what is that quick fix? The quick fix basically says that whatever commit, whatever last commit was working perfectly, just roll back to that so that everything becomes normal until and unless you have fixed the new commit. That is the basically the intention behind the revert uh, procedure. Now, how can you implement the revert procedure? It can be implemented using the git revert command and let me show you a quick demo of the git revert command so you know how you can implement it in a computer all right so this is my terminal guys basically i will ssh into an aws server and i'm in so i have a github repository that i have created for demo purposes so like we discussed the first stage in the life cycle of git is to clone the repository so we'll just copy this address so we'll just copy this address one second. Yes. So we'll just copy this address and then we'll come here and we'll type git clone and then the address. Okay. Now this project is basically a website that I created. It's a small website that I created. Now in order to see that website, we will have to paste this code inside our Apache folder. So let us go inside our Apache folder, which is present in this directory. All right. Now I'll do a quick git clone along with the repository address, hit enter. And now if I do an LS, you can see that there's a folder called DevOps IQ, which has been created inside this folder. I will go inside DevOps IQ and do an LS. And you can see there's one more folder called DevOps IQ. All right, so let's go inside that. And now if I do an LS, these are the two files which are present inside my code base. Okay. Now, if you were to see what this website actually looks like right now, I can just go here and I can type in the IP address. So it's 18.222.123.58 slash DevOps IQ and slash DevOps IQ. All right. This is how the website looks like for now. Now I have to make some changes so that the background becomes a little more better. So what I can do, I'll just go back here. 
I'll go do a nano and change the code of the website and say I'll change it to I have an image in the images folder let me change it to one dot jpg all right let us save it and once you have saved it the next thing that you have to do is commit the changes to your local repository and let us do that so first i'll have to add the t uh, files to the repository now i'll have to commit the changes and the message should say changed background all right so the changes have been committed and now i'll push these changes to the remote repository so it's hshar and the password is this now before making these changes let me quickly show you the code that you are currently going to see before i push anything on this repository so can you see the code is images slash 2.jpeg i've changed the code to be 1.jpeg so let me hit enter and let's see if our code gets changed over here so now if i do a refresh let me do a refresh you can see the code has been changed just now so it says 44 seconds ago the code was changed awesome so now because my code has been changed if i go to this website now and hit enter you can see the background is now changed it is now a different background now what i want to do is i want to i realize that this change that i did is probably wrong and i want to revert to a particular commit to the older commit that was actually working all right so what i can do is i'll just come back to my terminal let me clear the screen first thing that you do is do a git log so now you get get a log of all the commits that you have made to this particular repository now this is the particular commit that you have particularly applied right now and this is causing you a problem so just copy the commit id for this and now just go ahead and do a git revert so git revert and then give this id which you just copied okay and hit enter so once you do that it will tell you the information about this particular commit id right so just review everything and then you can see that the commit has been reverted so now i have not pushed the changes but then if i come back here and if i hit enter you can see the older website comes back because the code has now been changed and if i want to make these changes to the remote repository as well all i have to do is git push origin master and it'll ask me the credentials and the changes have been pushed right now if i come here and i just see the code again if i do a refresh you can again see that the code has changed back to 2.jpeg which was our earlier code which we made changes to all right so guys this is how you can do a revert on a, on a basically a commit and a push that you have made to your remote repository as well right so if you encounter any problem during working uh, while working as a devops engineer you should remember this session where i taught you how to revert a particular commit all right so with that let's move on to our next question which says have you ever encountered failed deployments and how have you handled them now see uh, there any devops engineer in the world will have faced a problem in which you know probably the things that he had planned uh, the things didn't go according to his plan right that absolutely happens and if somebody is asking you in a devops interview have you committed mistakes so you should just to impress them probably never say yes right so if you have never committed mistakes that's awesome right but then i know that every engineer or every devops engineer who has worked in the industry would have faced a problem while working and would basically account to a mistake that he made uh, while deploying things all right now the important thing or the important key takeaway from this kind of a learning should be that whatever mistake you make you learn from it 
right and he never committed again and that is basically the intent behind this question as well the the interviewer would want to know if you made the mistakes what did you learn from those mistakes okay so if you if if an interviewer was supposed to ask me this question i'll say obviously i have encountered failed deployments and what have i learned from them i'll just give you the best practices that i think are viable for any devops engineer who is working in the industry so the first thing that every one should follow and should make it a thumb rule is that you should automate code testing not only does it save time because now uh, you know your tester does not have to wait for your developer to p- basically push the code and then check it the developer can check it in real time because you have written a script for his web uh, for his application and all the major tests which are to be done which are pretty common can be done using automated code testing right now like i said it's not only for time saving but also it removes the uh, the part where and humor a, a, a human error can occur right so if if you are working if you are now you know hum, when when you work with people people commit mistakes but if you can write a code which will basically test each and every functionality that code will never make a mistake and that is why you should always automate things as far as possible right so like in my example the w- what happened was that there was a basically a commit to the repository which was basically a feature addition right um and the tester did not see the all the functionalities or forgot to see some of the functionalities that could impact the other components of my product and because of that when it got pushed on to production basically disaster happened everything stopped working right and that was only because the testing did not happen properly right so for all the critical processes of your website or, or your product you can basically create a code which will test that website and basically that that would amount to that would basically close down most of the doors to mistakes all right the next thing is you should always use docker for same environment right and this is basically the ideology behind devops that these kind of problems where you know uh, a developer used to work and a tester could not uh, run his code on his computer but the developer said that everything is working fine on his system docker basically solves that problem right so use docker as much as you can for the same environment problem that you might face then we should always use microservices now when you are working in a company it could be that you know the the product is in the legacy phase and hence it's on a monolith kind of a thing but you should never encourage this kind of an architecture right reason being say you did a bad commit or you did a bad push on the production server but it should not uh, impact the other components of your product right if probably you have done something to search and if it's a bad commit or a bad push the only functionality that should be impacted should be your search functionality and not the other functionalities and there is that is the sole reason behind why we should use microservices that is we, we should divide our application into different small products which we would uh, deploy on servers and these products should be independent of each other when you talk about the monolithic architecture all these components are coinciding with each other they have the dependency upon each other but when you talk about a microservices kind of an architecture you remove that dependency so as to even if one component fails it does not impact the whole application fourth point being you should always overcome risks to avoid failures now this basically means that if there is a code uh, change or if, if there is a feature addition which works sometimes and sometimes it does not and you're not able to figure out why is exactly that thing happening it is better to wait and troubleshoot it than to push it just to meet your dates right because the latter can cause you a big problem in production uh, when you're in a company like uh, probably like airtel or in a company like samsung or ericsson where their products each second of their websites uptime brings in money right so if your website is down for 30 seconds that could amount to a huge loss and that would be on you right so to to for you to not face that kind of a situation always be 
हंड्रेड परसेंट श्योर बिफोर यू मेक अ चेंज और अ रिलीज ऑन टू द प्रोडक्शन सर्वर और राइट सो दिस इज द एंड टू द डोमेन ऑफ कंटिन्यूस डेवलपमेंट लेट्स गो हेड एंड नाउ टॉक अबाउट वर्चुअलाइजेशन एंड कंटिन्यूराइजेशन और राइट सो लेट्स स्टार्ट विद द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन ऑफ दिस डोमेन which says what is the difference between virtualization and containerization now this is a very important question guys because most of us get confused between virtualization and containerization so let's see what are the differences between these two things so virtualization is nothing but installing a new piece of operating system on top of a virtualized hardware what does that mean so basically there are softwares like hypervisor or any other software which specializes in virtualizing hardware so if you have a server which has around 64 gigs of ram and 1000 tb of hard disk space with a software like Hyper hypervisor what you can do is you can take that space and divide it among multiple operating systems right you can deploy multiple operating systems on the same hardware by virtualizing the hardware so as to the operating system will feel that say if you virtualize 1 gb of ram from this whole system and say around 100 gb of storage the operating system will think that you know it only has 1 gb and 100 uh, uh 1 gb of ram and 100 gb of storage space available to it it cannot go beyond that reason being uh, it does not know uh, of the hardware which is beyond or which is uh, which is ahead of the hypervisor software all right so uh, in virtualization basically you have an hypervisor which is on top of your which sits on top of your operating system and virtualizes the hardware beneath it right then you have a guest operating system so basically once you have virtualized the hardware you install guest operating systems on top of that for example the best example for this would be virtualbox right you install virtualbox and then you can install operating systems on the virtualbox with the given spec that you will decide right and once you have installed the guest operating systems on top of that there would be uh, the binaries or the libraries that you probably would be downloading or that came with the operating system and on top of that you have the applications which would be running right so the key take away from virtualization should be that it's uh, the whole operating system is installed uh, from the kernel level to the application level everything is fresh everything is new now let's talk about containerization so the thing in containerization is that uh, the host on top of host operating system you install a co software called the container engine now the container engine is just uh, like any other software uh, like you have an hypervisor you have a container engine now the container engine does not encourage installing a whole operating system For example if you want to run a container for Ubuntu on say a Mac machine you can do that right but it will basically in that container you will have basically the bare minimum libraries that amount to become the Ubuntu operating system minus the kernel right so in a container you do not have a kernel the kernel is always always used of the host operating system and this is the main difference between virtualization and containerization that in virtualization you have a separate kernel present of the virtual operating system but in containerization you do not have that and that is the reason the containers are very small they have the bare minimum libraries required for that container to behave as a, a particular operating system but the container itself does not contain any operating system it basically is based on the same kernel on which the host or host operating system resides all right and this is the basically the main difference between virtualization and containerization moving forward now the next question says without uh, using docker uh that is without using docker to get into a container can we see the processes that are running inside the container of uh, the docker container engine all right so this basically is relating to the same fact that if uh, if you want to see the processes of a container uh, which are running inside the docker container engine if you can see them from the outside basically that means that uh, you know the processes are running in the same kernel of the host operating system 
right? The processes that are running in the Docker container engine would be basically as an addition to whatever is running on the host operating system as well. And you can see that using the PS AUX command, right? So for the host operating system, it's just like any other software or any other process that it has to run. But uh, for the container, it, it basically thinks that it is running inside an operating system, which it actually is not. Right. So can you see the processes? So the answer is yes, you can see the processes which are running inside a Docker container. And how can you see that? How can you basically uh, see these processes? Let me demonstrate it to you. Okay, so we will we have come back to our AWS server. Let me clear the screen. All right. So as you, if I do a Docker PS right now, you can see that there are no containers which are running on this system as of now. Now what I'll do is I'll run a container for Ubuntu. So I'll do a docker run hyphen IT and then hyphen D and then Ubuntu. All right, so this ran a container for me. And if I do a docker PS now, you can see that there's a container running, which is basically of the Ubuntu image. So if I go inside this container now, so I'll do a docker exec hyphen it and then bash. Docker exec hyphen it and then the, sorry, I forgot the container ID. So the container ID and then bash. So if I do that, I'm inside the container, right? And there's no process running inside this container as of now. Now, if I were to duplicate this, let me quickly again do an SSH. So I'll do an SSH into the same server again, so that I'm on dollar. Okay, great. So if I do a PS AUX, these are all the processes which are running inside the operating system right now. Right. But let us make it a little simpler. What we can do is let me see all the processes which has the word watch in them. Right. So let me make it more clear for you. So these are the processes which have the watch keyword inside of them. OK, so there are basically four processes which are running and which have the keyword watch inside of them. Now what I'm going to do is inside this container, I'm going to launch a watch process. So what is that watch process? That watch process is basically going to watch um, a particular command in a set interval of time. And what is that command? I basically want to say, let's see the ls hyphen l command. Okay, so what is it doing? It is keeping a watch on the command ls hyphen l in every one second, right? You can see the time over here. It is incrementing every second. And basically it's keeping a watch on all these files, which are there inside the container continuously. Okay. Now again, so this is the dollar prompt that's, that we are outside the container right now. Now, if I again do the same command, that is again, I search for processes which have the word watch in it, I can actually see that there is a new process which is running over here. And this process is running inside the container, which I'm able to see from the host operating system level, right? So the host operating system is doing is basically treating this particular process as if it was running on its own system. That is it, the container and the host operating system, because they are sharing the same kernel, the host operating system is taking this process as if it was running inside of it, right? But if we, if we, if we look closely, this basically this watch command is running inside the container, right? Let, let me just quickly stop it. You can see we are still inside the container and we have stopped the watch command. And if I go here and if I do refresh, you can see that this watch command is again gone, which was being mentioned over here before. And this is exactly what we wanted. We basically wanted to see a process which was running inside a container from outside the container uh, that is from the host operating system. And that is exactly what we just did. All right. So 
the question that without using docker, docker can you see the processes that, in, that are running inside a container so the answer is yes you can do it all right so the next question is what is a docker file used for what do you basically use a docker file for so a docker file is nothing but it's a, it's, a, it's basically a text document to create a image using an older image and adding some files into it all right so uh, this it's basically like a script that you run in linux which can do all the things for you that are required for example i might need an apache image and i want my website to be put inside the var slash www slash html folder inside this particular apache container now in order to do that if i were to do it without a docker file i would have to first download the apache image so i would probably type docker run hyphen it hyphen id and then apache once i've done that i will exec into the container and then go to the directory called var www.html probably i'll do a git clone of the website that i want and then my website will be available in that container and hence i'll be able to use it right this is one way second way is i can create a docker file which will basically build this image for me without me having to do all these things all these manual things which i just told you all right so let's see how we can do that so let me just exit this container and let me uh, remove the container which are just running inside my system right now okay so if i do a docker ps now it's clean now what i want to do is i want to run this particular container docker run hyphen it hyphen p i want to basically expose the port 83 to this containers port 80 and i want to run it as a daemon so that it runs in the background and that is it okay so i have the container running which is this and what i want to do is i want to basically copy the website into this container so let me do a docker exec into this container hyphen it this is the container id and then container id and then bash so i want to go inside this particular folder so if i do an ls over here you can see that there is an index.html and an index.php which are running right so it's on exposed on port 83 which basically means if i go to a browser and if i go to the server's ip address on port 83 i should be able to see this apache page and this is basically the container which i just ran over here okay what i want to do is inside this particular directory i would be basically copying the code of my website now let's see how we can do that so let me just exit this container let me do a docker ps let me do a docker stop to this particular container so what would this do so basically if uh, my apache was running over here it should stop once i have stopped this container okay so it is stopped so if i do a refresh over here you can see the site can't be reached this is exactly what we want okay now let me do a git clone of my github and do a git clone all right Awesome. Now I'll go inside this folder and basically I want to copy this particular folder inside the container. 
all right so for doing that let's contain let's create a docker file and what i want to say is in the image shhar slash web app i want to add the folder devops iq and where do i want to add it inside the container i want to add it in this particular directory okay this is where i want to add it and inside devops iq okay fair enough and that is it that is all you have to do i'll just come out of this editor and i'll now do a docker build of this docker file with the name test so it says successfully built an image and it has been tagged as test great now if i run this image now docker run hyphen it hyphen p say i run it on port 84 run it as a daemon and run the image okay great so if i go to port 84 now let's see if the container is working first so yes the container is working now if i go inside devops iq what do i see great so i can see the web so basically my website is now available inside the container by simply writing a docker file to do that and this is exactly what we wanted awesome guys so what is the docker file used for it is basically used for creating an image without having to do all the manual stuff of adding your files and everything all right now once this image of yours is ready you can push it to docker hub and anybody in the world can download it and can basically use your website on their local system great now the next question is explain container orchestration okay so for so till now we have seen that you know we can deploy a container we can use it uh, we can probably deploy an application on it and we can use it on the web browser right but it is not that simple when we talk about uh, a, a website like amazon or a website like uh, google right it has a lot of components with it for example uh, on amazon you would see that you have a comment section uh, then on the home page you see that there are a lot of products which have the prices the ratings now each and every component the prices the ratings the name of the product the image of the product the comment section each and everything is basically a microservice it is a small part of an application which is running independently of all the other parts of the website right and all of this is possible using containers so basically what they would have done is they would have run each and every component inside a container now the problem over here is now when you have a website like amazon you would be dealing like uh, you will you would be dealing with minimum like 10 or 11 containers for one particular copy of that website or one particular instance of that website right now when you're dealing with 10 11 containers these containers have to be working in conjunction to each other they should be in sync with each other they should be able to communicate with each other right and they should also be able uh, we should also be able to scale a particular container in 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 case it goes down for example the comment section container it goes down for some reason now if it goes down we have to keep a watch on it and we have to redeploy it if it goes down and all of these activities which i just told you comes under co container orchestration right if you were to manually deploy these containers on docker you will have to keep a manual check on all these containers but imagine when you have thousands or ten thousands of containers that you're dealing with in those kind of scenarios you need container orchestration now container orchestration can be done using various softwares so you have a software called kubernetes and before that there was a software called docker swarm which was which basically made our life easier by doing all the manual work for us that is it will check the containers health it could scale them in case they become unhealthy they could always also notify uh, you know the administrators by an email 
in case something happens right they can also run a monitoring software for you or uh, which which basically gives you a report or the health status of all the containers which are running inside that software so this is what this is a very small part of what a container orchestration tool can do right and basically if you were to understand what container orchestration is like is like i said when you work with multiple containers you have to take uh, take uh, in note a lot of things and that is possible using the container orchestration tools like kubernetes and docker swarm okay so the next question is what is the difference between docker swarm and kubernetes now they're both container orchestration tools we just saw that but why do we have two or if i were to choose between kubernetes and docker swarm which should i choose all right so let's look at the differences between each one of them so the first uh, difference which is probably the most important difference or probably i'll say is is the deciding factor whether uh, you know uh, you should go ahead with this tool given that you have a short deadline and you have to deploy a project so installing docker swarm is very easy it comes pre-packaged with the docker software just a quick info guys test your knowledge of devops by answering this question which of the following are the popular tools for devops a jenkins b ansible c nagios d all of the above comment your answer in the comment section below subscribe to intellipack to know the right answer now let's continue with the session so if you have installed docker docker swarm is already installed on your system you don't have to worry about anything on the other hand installing kubernetes is a very tough job right there are a lot of dependencies for kubernetes you'll have to see the system you'll have to see the operating system on which it is running and a host of other things right it has a lot of dependencies and hence it is very tough to install but the moment you install it it becomes e very helpful that is kubernetes becomes very helpful because of the features that it offers which brings us to our second point uh, docker swarm is faster than kubernetes reason being that it has less features than kubernetes and therefore making it a very light software and hence faster than kubernetes so if you want to use docker swarm you should be uh, reading about what docker swarm does not offer and what kubernetes offers and if you feel you do not need all the features that kubernetes is offering you can go ahead with docker swarm and deploy your application in a faster manner but like i said kubernetes it is is a complex and it has a lot of services and features because of which it is a, it, it its deployments are a little slower when we compare it to docker swarm the third point which is the most important point is uh, docker swarm does not give you the functionality of auto scaling meaning if your containers go down or if your containers are basically uh, performing at their peak capacity there is no option in docker swarm to scale those containers on the other hand because of kubernetes monitoring services and the host of other features you have that option of providing auto scaling to your containers which basically means you can automatically scale your containers up and down as and when they are required and this is an amazing thing that kubernetes handles for us all right guys so these were the questions around the domain uh, virtualization and containerization so moving ahead now our next domain is continuous integration so let's shed a light on what continuous integration is so our quest first question itself is what is continuous integration so continuous integration is basically a development practice or i'll say it's a stage which basically connects all the other stages of the devops life cycle for example uh, you 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 push your code to git like we took an example when you push the code to git you might have provisions which might allow you that the the moment the code is pushed onto the remote repository it automatically gets deployed on the servers as well well if that is the case basically that would be possible using integration tools that would integrate your git repository with your remote server and that is exactly what jenkins runs it's a continuous integration tool which helps you which helps us integrate different li devops life cycle stages together so that they work like an organism right this is what continuous integration means so 
because we discussed about what continuous integration is our next question says create a ci cd pipeline using git and jenkins to deploy a website on every commit on the main branch so on every push that you make to the remote repository the code should automatically get deployed on a remote server all right so this is something that we're going to do just now all right but before going ahead let's see what is the architecture for this kind of a thing all right so this is how the whole thing is going to work basically the developer is going to commit uh, the code to his github the github basically once it sees a change in the branch that we mentioned it is going to trigger jenkins which in turn will integrate or will take the website from the github repository and push it on to the build server on which we want the website to be deployed all right sounds awesome great now let's go ahead and do this demo so for that uh, we will have to ssh into our server so let us do that okay so i'm in now let me clear the screen so first let's check if our jenkins is running on this server so let me check the status for jenkins so if i do a service jenkins status i can see that the jenkins service is active awesome so i'll just go here and i'll go to the jenkins website which is basically available on 8080 all right so i'll enter my credentials and this is how the dashboard for jenkins look like now our question is or our aim is to create a job which basically will push a website that we are uploading to github on a particular server all right so let's create a new job first so let's call our job as a demo job okay and let's name it as a freestyle project and click ok so this will create a job in jenkins for us all right so our job has now been created so what we want to do is i want to take code from my github so i'll have to specify the github repository over here okay and similarly i will have to say that i want to trigger uh, the build the moment uh, my anything is pushed on my remote repository all right and this should be it great so i mentioned that anything that i is pushed onto my master should trigger a build on jenkins okay and what should this build or what set of commands do i want to run uh, once a uh, build is triggered so first i want to remove all the containers which are running inside my system so i want to clean up right so for that i'll say sudo docker rm hyphen f then a dollar this basically is going to clean all the containers which are running currently in the system once this is done i want to build my website which is going or build my container which is going to have my website all right now how can we do that for that i'll have to push the code to my github which will have the docker file as well okay so we created a docker file inside okay so here it is so we have the our docker file created in the devops iq folder which was there in my home directory now what i want to do is i want to push so what is there inside this docker file we saw that we could create a docker file using uh, if, we, if we write something like this in our uh, docker file and this would basically create an image with our code which is there on github all right so what we'll do we'll just push this code to our remote repository
and let's add the message that we have ordered a talkifier great and now let's push it to our remote repo Just a quick info guys, if you want to make a career in Azure DevOps, then IntelliPad provides a Microsoft Azure DevOps Engineer Certification Training which is taught by industry experts with more than 10 years of experience. This course is designed to upskill and land your dream job. Now let's continue with the session. Great. So it has been pushed to my remote repo and now if I just go here and check if my changes have been done or not let me just quickly refresh it so yes i have a docker file in my git repository right now which was committed 42 seconds ago awesome great so now what i'll do is i'll come to my jenkins and i will say that build sudo docker build the docker file now where is that docker file the docker file will basically be downloaded in the jenkins wake workspace so that is in var lib jenkins workspace and then the name of the job which is demo job and that is it so inside this i will have my docker file and it will basically build it and name it as say Jenkins Jenkins it'll name it as Jenkins in the next step what I'll do I'll do a sudo docker run hyphen it and then hyphen p and say I want to deploy it on 84 or say 87 port okay and what do I want to deploy I want to deploy Jenkins Okay, so this should do these. The, uh, this should basically do all the stuff. So in the first command, basically, we are removing any container which is running on the system. In the second command, what we're going to do is we're going to build the Docker file which is available in this workspace, and this workspace will basically have my GitHub project uh, and the link I have specified over here. So it'll basically just copy or it'll pull the project and save it in the workspace of demo job. So in this demo job, there's a Docker file. So we are building this Docker file and we're naming this created image as Jenkins. And then we are running this image and exposing it to port 87. Okay, so let's save it. Awesome. Now what we have to do is I'll have to go inside. So if you want to configure a webhook, the way to do that, uh, when I say a webhook, basically you want your GitHub to interact with your Jenkins whenever there is a push to a particular uh, repository. So in your repository, go to settings and then go to webhooks. So this is a webhook that I created for my Jenkins, right? So let me create it again for you. So all you have to do is click on add webhook, right? And enter the uh, URL for your Jenkins over here. So in my case, it is this, I'll just enter it over here, followed by this keyword, which is GitHub hyphen webhook. And that is it. Once you specify that, just go down, click on add webhook. And this should basically send a request to Jenkins and if everything goes well, it will say last delivery was successful. Okay. So any changes that I make to my GitHub now should trigger a change over here. Now let me uh, delete this job because I think even this job gets triggered when my GitHub, any changes made to my GitHub, right? So let me delete this project okay great so i just have this job now awesome now let us see how it actually works 
So what I want to do is I come back to my terminal, do an ls, and let me go inside DevOps IQ, and let me do some changes in the code. So let's say I go into nano index dot html. So the first thing that I do is I change the title of the website. So I call it as Jenkins test website. Okay. And I change the image from two to one dot jpg. And that is it. Let us see if I just push or if I just push this website onto my server, what will happen? So I'll do a git push. Sorry, first I'll have to add these changed files into my repository, git push origin master, sorry, git commit. And let me label this commit as test push. Okay, done. Now let's push this to a remote repository. Hit push origin master. And let's give the credentials. Awesome. Now, if you wait here, it should basically start a job. So as you can see, there is a job queued, which is for demo job. And this got automatically triggered by my GitHub. Okay. So let me refresh this. Okay. So the moment it gives you a red, that basically means that your job has been failed. So let's see what had just happened. Why our job got failed. So if you go here, you can see the console output just like this. Okay. So basically we forgot to add a sudo here and that is causing us a problem. Okay, so we can fix this by just going down and adding a sudo here. Save it. And again, we'll have to change the code. Um, let's call it as Jenkins test to website. We'll do a control X, Y, and now let's add our files to our local repository. Hit add. Now let's commit it. Test push to. And now let's push this to our master. I'll enter the credentials. And this should be it. Okay, so let's see. So our second job got triggered automatically. And it gives us a blue. Now blue uh, means that your job was executed successfully. So let's check what happened. So we were deploying it on port 85. So let's check if it has been indeed deployed. So it was on port 85. And the folder was DevOps IQ. Okay, so let's check. I'm not sure if it was port 85. Let's check what are the ports that we have specified. So the port is 87. Okay, so let's go to port 87. Okay, so it's giving an error saying unsafe port. So for our troubleshooting let's check if the container is running so yes the container is running on port 87 but it says an unsafe port so what we can do is let us change it to say 82 and now let's just try to build the job from here we'll just click on build now job has been completed and the port was eighty two. 
um yes so apache is working now let's try going inside devops iq folder and there you go you have your website with this title which you pushed on github now for one more time for testing purposes let us push our code once more and see what happens so i'll say that this website is test three website and say the i'll change the image as well to 2.jpeg okay save it do a git add do a commit and say call it test push three and now let's hit push origin master enter the credentials great now let's check what will happen okay so our build has been started and it has been completed great so if i refresh this now it says jenkins test 3 website and the background also has been changed so congratulations guys we have successfully completed the demo so basically if you change anything in your github the website is automatically getting deployed on your build server right and on top of this just for making it more interesting what we can do is we can do a git log and we can revert on this commit that we saw earlier okay so let's do a git revert and then paste it agree to everything and then push to master enter the credentials everything has been pushed job is getting triggered job is completed and if i go here again my website got reverted to a particular previous version awesome guys so we have completed the demo which basically asked us to create a cd ci cd pipeline using git and jenkins to deploy a website on every commit on the main branch so you have done it successfully awesome let's move on to our next domain which talks about configuration management and continuous monitoring awesome so what is configuration management and what is continuous monitoring let's understand it so what is the difference between ansible chef and puppet now before understanding the difference between ansible chef and puppet these are basically configuration management tools what is configuration management if you have say around 200 servers and you want to uh, install a particular software on each of these servers what will you do one one way what you can do is you can basically go to each and every of these servers run a script and that basically will install a uh, software on that on on the, on these servers right the other way to do it is install a configuration management software using which you can deploy or you can install all these software or you can control the configuration of these all these servers from one central place and that is exactly what configuration management means right now in configuration management you have many tools like ansible chef puppet etc but these are the three top tools which are used in the industry now the question is what is the difference between ansible chef and puppet all right so let's go ahead and see the differences all right so let's first talk about ansible so ansible is very easy to learn because it is based on python so you don't have to sweat a lot or you don't have to sweat much on learning the commands for ansible because it is based on python so if you know python ansible is going to be a cakewalk for you um it is preferred for environments which are designed to scale rapidly uh, basically uh, with ansible the thing is that you don't have to install 
the Ansible client uh, software on the op on the on the systems on which you want to basically deploy the configuration. Ansible just has to be installed on the master. And that is it. No other configuration required. You can directly control the configuration of the client server given you have the access to it. So it offers simplified orchestration. Reason being, like I just told you, that you don't have to worry about installing softwares on the client machines. Uh, Ansible can standalone uh, uh, take care of all the uh, complications uh, that come forward when you are dealing with deploying configurations without installing a particular software on the client machines. But this is a, basically a disadvantage of Ansible that it has a very underdeveloped GUI that is you only get the CLI to work with, right? And it has very limited features when we compare it with Puppet and Chef. Now let's talk about Chef. What, uh, how, how is Chef different from Ansible? So it is Ruby based and hence it's difficult to learn. Now Ruby is a language that not many people are acquainted with and hence uh, people might find it difficult to get uh, versed with the commands of uh, Chef. Uh, the initial setup is complicated. When I compare it with Ansible, the setup was very easy because I just had to install Ansible on the host machine and on the client machine, I didn't have to install any software. So, but with Chef, you have to do that and hence it becomes a little complicated. Uh, but once all the setup and everything is done, Chef is very stable, right? Uh, it has, it, it has been, since it's a community product and it has been well contributed to, it's a very stable product and it offers you resiliency. So, so of course, if when you're working on production servers, probably working on Chef would be a better idea than Ansible because Ansible does not have that, has that great community when you compare it with Chef. And of course, Chef is the most flexible solutions for OS and uh, middleware management. Now middleware basically means uh, the software management part. Chef offers to be a great choice for configuration management, reason being it can it is very reliable and is very mature because it was probably among the first configuration management tools to come out. And because community has contributed a lot to this project, it is very mature in its development stages as well. Now let's talk about Puppet. So Puppet uh, can be tough for people who are beginners um, uh, in the uh, DevOps uh, world, right? Because uh, the, it uses its own language called Puppet DSL, right? The setup part is smooth when you compare it with Chef, uh, but it's a little harder than Ansible because when you're using Puppet, you use uh, we use a master and an agent as well. So you will have to install Puppet agent on the client machine and only then Puppet will be able to interact with the client software, right? Now it has a strong support for automation. So if you are planning to do some configuration management uh, that you want to automate, Puppet is very compliant in that part. You, you'll be, you can easily uh, do the automation part using Puppet and it is not suitable for scaling any deployment. So if you have uh, say around 50 or 60 servers and you plan to add more in the future, probably Puppet would not be the right choice for that kind of an architecture. It is good, uh, good to have when you have a stable uh, infrastructure where you're probably not adding servers now and then, but if you are working on cloud and uh, you do not know the capacity that you would be running, probably Puppet would not be the good would not be a good idea to manage your configuration on your clients. Okay, uh, our next question is: What is the difference between asset management and configuration management? So, asset management basically deals with resources. It deals with hardware which we'll have to plan so that our IT workforce can work with maximum efficiency right so uh, we'll have to plan the planning of your hardware of how many resources a particular uh, team might need giving the right resources to the right people is what asset management counts in when we talk about configuration management it basically employs not the hardware but the software component of what all softwares are required by a particular 
employee of a team or a particular person in the team what software is required by that person and for other person what software is required i mean rather than taking the radical approach of installing every software in every machine which should not be done because some softwares are licensed so configuration management basically means installing the right software on the right system on which a particular person or on which a particular workload is going to run so our next question is what are nrpe plugins in nagios okay so nrpe plugins are basically extensions to nagios which help you monitor the local resources of the client machines right so you don't have to ssh into the client machines to see how much of memory or how much of cpu is being used nagios being a monitoring tool you just have to install and the nrpe extension on the client machine and it will give you a real time uh, data of the resources that are being consumed on that particular client machine and obviously when you are working in production environment you will be monitoring multiple machines and with nrp plugins installed on each of those machines you can easily monitor the resources of them at one central place and that is exactly what nrp plugin is our next question is what is the difference between an active check and a passive check in nagios okay so in nagios if uh, the data the monitoring log that you're getting from your clients if it's being delivered by a nagios agent in that case it is called an active check reason being nagios is actively involved in taking all the data or in, or in collecting all the data from your clients but in case when you're dealing with systems wherein it does not allow you to install any other software or probably the software itself can generate monitoring logs in those cases what happens is uh, uh, rather than nagios the software component pushes the logs to the nagios master uh, where it can take the logs and probably create a graph or uh, create the metric for you in the dashboard so basically using those logs which are being published by some other software nagios will create a report of the uh, health monitoring part of your client systems right and that is why it is called a passive check reason being nagios is not involved on the client side at all it is basically the software's own services which are basically pushing the log to nagios master and hence it's called a passive check all right but if you talk about the architecture or the working or the life cycle of how this actually works um between on, on the master itself uh, the logs which are published are actually published to a queue right and wh whether it's an active check or a passive check the logs have to be published to that queue so that the nagios master can pick them up and create the monitoring metric which is required all right so in a passive check and in an act active check the queue is going to be there but it's the only difference between the agents that is in an active check the nagios agents are involved but in a passive check third party software tools are involved which publish the log to the nagios master all right so a next question says create an ansible playbook to deploy apache on a client server so basically we have to do configuration management so as to without i mean going inside the uh, the client system we'll have to install a particular piece of software inside it okay so let me quickly uh, do an ssh into my aws machine and what i'm going to do is i have a slave machine which i have already configured which can interact with my master that is if i do a ansible ping all you can see that there is a server one that has i have configured which has successfully responded to my master's request okay now let me show you the uh, server which is basically working so this is the server which is configured uh, with my master right this is my client machine and on this machine i'll have to install apache so if i right now go to the ip address of this machine it says connection refused 
reason being that there is nothing installed on this server or there is no apache software installed on this particular server right now all right so let's install apache now to do that you will have to write a playbook now what is a playbook a playbook looks something like this so it's basically a yaml file that you'll have to create so i have created one uh, for me so uh, where do you want to install the apache software is the part where you'll have to specify in hosts so basically my uh, my my client machine is a part of a group called servers that i've created right so the hosts are servers and where can you actually specify what part is your machine or what which group is your machine a part of so that you can specify over here so it's in slash etc slash ansible and slash hosts okay so as you can see over here this is the group name that is servers and inside servers i've specified a server one uh, a client machine which has the ip address this so this is the ip address of my slave so if you can compare it's 18.223.101.172 and if i compare it with my slave this is the ip address of my slave right and this has been configured over here so i can refer to my server one as servers or i can refer it to as server one right so if i do let me do a clear over here i can say ansible hyphen m ping and i can say server one as well it will reach out to my server one or i can say servers as well because it's part of the group servers okay so this is how it works now i want to install apache so for installing apache i'll have to write a playbook which looks like this basically it's a yaml file so you start with the three uh, dashed lines and then you specify hosts so hosts i've specified every server uh, every machine which is inside the servers group should install apache on it right and what is the task i want to install apache 2 this is basically a name you can specify anything over here then i've specified apt uh, basically i want to use the apt package uh, to install apache 2 the latest software okay now what i will do i will type in ansible hyphen playbook and i'll type in apache dot yaml i'll hit enter and now it has started to install everything so it has it, it is installing on the servers group it is gathering the facts and it saw that it is able to communicate with server one and now it is accomplishing the task of installing apache all right so it has been done successfully so if i go to my chrome browser now and if i refresh the address you can see that apache is installed on this server automatically so i didn't have to basically ssh into the server it all happened automatically and if i had like five six computers which were running on uh, uh which were running on aws and if i wanted to install the software on it using apache uh, using ansible this would have been the same way it's only that in the server group i would have specified more ip addresses which my ansible could talk to okay so this was our task of basically deploying an ansible playbook uh, uh, on a client server without ssh doing an ssh into that client server and doing it from a central location all right so this is done now let's move on to our next domain which is continuous testing now what is continuous testing so we talked about continuous development which is done using github we talked about continuous integration which is possible using jenkins we talked about continuous uh, configuration management which can be done using ansible and next online is we have continuous testing so once the code has been deployed it has been integrated with jenkins it, it has been deployed on a server the next thing is automated testing that we discussed in the best practices before right and it can be done using uh, a tool called selenium a software called selenium web driver right 
so the first question is list out the technical challenges with selenium so the selenium tool is used widely for automatic testing or automated testing but what are the problems that you get with selenium so if you're using selenium mobile testing cannot be done so if you have developed an application for your mobile you cannot test it using selenium the reporting uh, capabilities of selenium are very limited if there is if the your if your application or your web application deals with pop up windows or it gives pop up windows selenium would not be able to recognize those pop up windows and work on them web app, and again selenium is only limited to web applications so if you have an application uh, that uh, probably runs on desktop probably it's a software that you have designed you cannot test that software using selenium selenium is only for those applications which can run inside a browser and if you are if you have want to check whether uh, there is some image in your web page uh, and that image should have some particular content it is a little difficult to implement it in selenium All, although it is not imp it is possible uh, you'll have to import some libraries and other things like that but natively uh, selenium does not support image testing you'll have to uh, work around uh, you'll have to work around with selenium to import some libraries which could do it for you but like i said natively selenium does not support image testing so our next question is what is the difference between verify and assert commands so let us see the differences so if you're using assert in selenium uh, the, if the command fails the whole execution comes to a halt whereas in verify it does not come to a halt it keeps on continuing the rest of the lines which are written in the code now why how can it be helpful how is it helpful to basically put execution at halt whenever there is an error which occurs for a particular line it is helpful when you are dealing with critical cases like for example if if there are five cases and say if case 3 fails case 4 and 5 cannot execute because they have a dependency on case 3 in those cases i would say that you would have to use assert with the case 3 but in in the same example if you talk about case 1 and case 2 they do not have a dependency or or they do not create a dependency for any other test cases uh, that have to run right for for example case 3 case 4 case 5 are not dependent on case 1 and case 2 in those cases we can run the verify command which will not stop even if the uh, the test case fails right and this basically is done to basically see what all is working and what all is not in one shot in a testing program and for those cases you would use verify but in the cases where you are testing critical cases and you do not want to waste your time testing other things if one of your case fails in those cases you will use the assert test uh so like i said it is used to validate critical functionality assert command and verify is used to ver uh, validate uh, functionality which is of the normal uh, uh behavior kind uh, kind of scenario which which comes into the normal behavior that that is it does not create a dependency for other things to not work because it stopped working all right so a next question is what is the difference between set speed and sleep methods so set speed is basically used for executing tasks at a particular interval that we specify for example say i want to echo hello world at intervals of 5 seconds in that case i can specify it using set speed but sleep method basically suspends the execution of the whole program for a particular interval for example if you're doing a selenium web test and the web page takes around 3 seconds to load and you don't want testing to happen just after each line you can specify a sleep method of say around 3 seconds where it waits for 3 seconds for the website to load and only then it will start executing the tests which follow that particular line all right so this is the difference between set speed and sleep just a quick info guys if you want to make a career in azure devops then intellipad provides a microsoft azure devops engineer certification training which is taught by industry experts with more than 10 years of experience this course is designed to upskill and land your dream job now that we are done with the session don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon to get the latest updates on intellipad